Tantor Audio, a division of recorded books, presents Dr. Brooks by Raylan Marks Narrated by Jeremy York and Stephanie Rose Chapter 1. Colin Medical conferences usually intrigued me, but this one kicked my ass. Thank God it was finally over. This thing was as dull as they got. The only presentations that seemed to shed new light on the medical science industry were the lectures Jake and I had delivered. Everyone else's talks and presentations made it feel like we were back in freaking high school when the substitute teachers determined we'd watch videos from the 1970s in science class. I guess the most irritating part of this conference was the fact that my best friend, Jake, Chief Cardiovascular Surgeon and I were the only presenters who seemed to have done our goddamn jobs to share our research. Contrary to what I'd been bored to fucking tears by since this started three days ago, mine and Jake's presentations were current, not some rewind of known case studies from forty years ago. Thank God I was born with the gift of unwavering patience, or I'd have left this final lecture of the day. I was at my limit, and I needed a drink. Tonight, Jake and I would attend the after-party event, something we'd passed on the previous nights. Maybe one reason no one was complaining about the boring lectures was that they'd all probably been nursing hangovers since they got here, one of the many reasons not to hold business functions in Las Vegas. Vegas came to life at night. I knew that, and I'd lived that on numerous weekend trips before. This trip, however, I stayed off of the strip and stayed safely at my hotel's pool. Granted, it was the biggest party pool oasis I'd ever seen before in my fucking life, but it was still less trouble than I was used to. The pool was lit up to create the ambiance of the nightlife, transporting and treating guests to an enchanting evening in a tropical paradise. Acres of water, palms, and any other treat you'd expect to find while vacationing in your own tropical world were present. What wasn't present was the gin I needed in my hand right about now. That's when I spotted Jake, sitting at a spot that was designed to impress our sizable medical group, and further this experience by bringing us into an enchanting Tahitian resort. I stepped up to where Jake was already seated on a bar stool. Hey, sexy, looking for a date tonight? I gripped my best friend's shoulder as I slid onto a stool next to him. I'll have a Bombay Sapphire on the rocks. I motioned to the bartender who'd moved my direction. I don't date pretentious assholes who drink gin, Jake said with a laugh while drinking his scotch. Jesus, man. He rubbed his forehead and looked over at me. Am I ever glad this shitstorm finally blew the fuck out of here? I took a large gulp of my favorite liquor and let the drink bring my mind back to life again. Yeah, Obstetrics 101 was my favorite course. Obstetrics 101, Jake rose his glass to me. That's certainly one way of looking at these fucked up lectures. Well, this whole conference is easily compared to the nightmare of our college years. What the fuck was this damn thing for, anyway? Hell if I know anymore. Jake laughed. My guess is a lesson to teach each medical professional about what others do for a living. Jake leaned his elbows on the polished wooden bar. So, OB-101, eh? Did you learn how to deliver a baby today? I laughed, slowly unwinding with each sip of gin. Yes, and it's a good thing I did. I brought the rim of my glass to my lips. So when you knock up Ash for a second time, she can use me as her midwife, and I can help deliver your next child in your bathtub. Jake smiled. The only in-home delivery you'll be doing for Ash is when she calls for Chinese takeout. He sighed. Shit, this area is larger than I thought. Three fucking pools, waterfalls, palm trees? He frowned. Where are we, Tahiti? I was actually looking for the exit to the beach when I walked out here, I said. Though it's still not tempting enough to keep me here until morning. That's when my eye caught the image of a vivacious and attractive young woman. She strolled out with a group of individuals, her beaming smile and the liveliness in her step instantly caught my attention. But it wasn't a minute before she disappeared through the crowd that surrounded the multiple pools. 
I had no business letting my mind go in that direction with a woman while at a medical conference after party, but I couldn't help but be taken aback when I saw her. Excuse me, gentlemen. I was the first to look back and find a tall, hot blonde with bright red lips and a barely there bikini, heading up a pack of what I quickly concluded were single women. It didn't matter how fucking hot they were. Jake and I had drawn a hard line in the sand when it came to fucking around with women at medical conferences. That had nearly cost us everything while we were interns. Yes, I said, keeping the flirting at bay and smiling to be polite. We're from the Institute of Science Medical Internship, Red Lips started, and we're looking to enjoy the night after this long conference. Do either of you mind if we join you? Jake's eyes met mine in warning, and this week had been such a disaster that I figured I might as well spice it up a little. My happily married best friend was so in love with Ash that I didn't think he even noticed hot shakes anymore. His wild days were in the past, and so it was up to me to shake things up a little. The bastard had put me through hell enough times, and so I enjoyed repaying the favor now and then. Join us, I answered the blonde. I eyed her red bikini and red stilettos, and I figured that if there were a poolside Vegas Barbie doll, it would have looked exactly like this woman. I had to give her credit, though. She'd matched up her outfit, if you could call it that, to her lipstick. You must be complimented on how you've coordinated all this red. I waved my hand toward her, while the group of girls behind her giggled. You'd make those hot chicks on Baywatch a tad bit jealous. I assume that's what you were aiming for? She laughed, while Jake pointedly ignored the trap of women I'd been lured into. Red is my favorite color, she said. So, you guys are okay with us hanging? Son of a bitch. I ran my hand through my hair. I'm sorry, I almost forgot, and now I have to break your heart. You see, I'm married. Jake looked at me while I slid my left hand discreetly to him, and he quickly picked up on my need to borrow his wedding ring so I could get out of this. These were interns, young, hot, and trouble. Being best friends since childhood, Jake and I read each other as twins would, though he had no idea what I was really up to, which made this situation that much more enjoyable. I slid his ring on while using the distraction of ordering another gin. What the hell? Did they water the liquor down at this place? Cheap-ass medical group most likely asked to have it served up that way. I didn't see a wedding ring on your hand, the shorter redhead in the bunch said. Nice one. Oh, it's there. It just doesn't stand out so easily. Must be the onyx color of the band, but it's right here. I wiggled the fingers of my left hand and elbowed Jake. If you want a hot and single doctor, this is your man right here. You're fucking joking, right? Jake grumbled in a whisper. It didn't matter how quietly Jake responded. These girls were tuned in and hanging on to every word. Well, I smirked at Jake. I would be fucking joking if you weren't the best man at my wedding. Jake turned back to the women, and his eyes widened when he took in Barbie and the whole Vegas gang. Wow, you must like the color red. He stopped himself, and I smiled. Sorry, I thought my friend was fucking with you until now. You really did match up your lipstick to that bikini. You're awfully blunt, she snapped. It's why he's single, I chimed in. You see, he's most likely already determining which one of you he's going to take back to his room and fuck before he sends you on a walk of shame. I meet Jake's humored eyes. You know I'm 100% accurate on that one. There are plenty of women to back that up, he stated factually. I looked back at the woman in red. Does that lipstick rub off? I pinched my lips, trying not to laugh. The chick's face was now showing that she was fucking pissed at me and Jake for acting like dicks. Jake held his hands up in innocence. Hey, I'm just the single asshole. Jake gripped my shoulder. It's Mr. Forever Guy who loves to cheat on his wife while we're out. He eyed me as if to show he'd just kicked the ball back into my court. 
If you're into the brilliance of a sexy brain surgeon, he gulped his scotch, this is your boy right here. Then why would he wear a wedding ring? It's kinky, I said. I think chicks dig being homewreckers. Now, I'm curious as to how you'll look with those red lips and no matching bikini. Right? Jake feigned curiosity. Like, would it all work without the matchy-matchy? He shrugged. Exactly. I took a sip of gin. Do the lips complement the bikini? Does the bikini complement the lips? Heels, no heels, I answered him. Maybe I do want to find out for myself, too. You up for sharing after you find out? I held in my laughter. I'm shocked you're considering sloppy seconds this time. I looked at Jake, both of us being dumbasses like we were known to be when we weren't interested. You deserve first dibs. This conference was harder on you than it was me. Truer words have never been spoken. I'll text you when we're done. I glanced back to be confronted with deadly looks. You still up for it, Barbie? Let's get out of here, Kimmy, another girl said, but my attention was instantly diverted from the women on the prowl. They always say the hot ones are pricks. I think it was Barbie who said that. I didn't know or care. I was locked in on the gorgeous woman from earlier. I was fully absorbed as I watched her dance, swaying her hips fluidly in a flawless salsa style of dancing. Yeah, I said in a dismissive tone, while I glanced around Jake to keep my eye on the sexy woman. I gripped Jake's shoulder. Who the fuck is that on the dance floor? The entertainment, he answered, looking past the bar where we sat and out to the dance floor. The hell if I know. I'm about to go find out. Jake grabbed my arm. Bad idea, he said. She was in one of my seminars. She's off limits. The hell she is, I said. Call. Jake looked at me as if I were crazy. What the fuck are you doing? And give me my ring back, you jackass. I absently gave him the ring. Remember when we learned salsa years ago? I smiled at him. I'm about to cash in on that shit. That was a long-ass time ago, and in Florida, not Vegas. He sipped his drink. It was also to get us those two Cuban princesses in their thong swimsuits to dance with us, and, and into our beds. I finished his sentence. Well, it looks like that was for the greater good, because I'm about to put those skills to work. You still think you have those moves? I nodded. I'm about to find out if all that money and lessons paid off. You're a horny idiot. Pull your shit together and remember where the fuck we are. A medical conference shindig. Jesus, read the goddamn room or something. That's precisely what I'm doing, I said, watching every flawless dance step while she showed off her perfectly round ass in a fun and exuberant way. Unlike everyone else who was out here, either dressed to impress or wearing bikinis that match their stilettos, she was dressed simply and casually. Jesus H. Christ, I was smitten as fuck by this woman. She wore a plain white tank that enhanced the glow of her naturally tanned skin. Her super short, cut-off denim shorts were frayed at the hem, highlighting the strong muscles of her gorgeous legs. Her tight ass moved and played along to the rhythm of the music that the live band played, making me believe we were actually in Florida. Florida, Vegas, heaven. I didn't even know where I was anymore. I just knew where I wasn't, out there on the dance floor, joining this woman. Her smile was effervescent, and even though I couldn't hear her laugh, I could tell it was something I had to be close to. This wasn't about me wanting to fuck some hot chick I'd spotted who was shaking her ass out on the dance floor. This woman had fucking bewitched me with the way her hips moved to the music and the animated and cheerful way she lit up this whole place. I stayed back and admired her from a distance, but I wanted more. No way in hell could I sit here and hide behind my rules of never pursuing someone in the medical field. Not with this woman. The more I watched her, the more I needed to be in her presence. I couldn't explain any of my behavior or the way I felt. 
All I knew was I was wasting time sitting here and debating right versus reason. All sense left my mind, and Jake's warnings and reminders about staying away from females in our line of work? Gone. All that was on my mind was cutting into her dance, pulling her against me by the small of her back, and guiding her in a more challenging dance, and into my arms from there. Fuck it. Just go get it, Jake laughed. You're already consumed by this woman. Don't say I didn't warn your stupid ass. I walked toward the crowd she'd drawn in, easing myself to the side and slipping out to where she teased the musicians by following the music, her movements fluid and sexy as hell. I watched her feet, her style, focusing on her skill instead of that beautiful smile that I knew would trip my ass up. If I was going to interrupt her entertaining the group, I had to fall in perfectly. If she were the natural talent I was witnessing, she'd easily follow my lead. As if it were meant to be, I stepped in behind her slowly swaying hips and took the hand she held in the air and clasped it into mine. She reacted like someone who was expecting a dance partner, and she allowed me to clutch her hip with my other hand and spin her back to me. I dipped her for the hell of it, and that's when her golden brown eyes met mine. I pulled her up in one fluid motion, her hands molding into mine as if they were created to be held by them alone. She arched her eyebrow, her lashes emphasizing the chestnut irises I wanted to drown in. May I ask who you are, sir? She asked, moving her hips, complimenting each step I took to guide her in our dance that became more intimate with each moment. Your future husband, I grinned, spinning her away from me. Her long, flowing hair breezed through the air while I spun her back, and I took her other hand, turning her back to mold against me. You're confident? She laughed as I twirled her out and dipped her to add to our little routine while bringing her to face me in our dance again. God damn, you're beautiful, I said, almost missing a step as I let her eyes and that bright expression of hers that had lured me out here take me as her victim. I could say the same about you, she said, as we continued to move our dance into a more daring, after-dark routine. And what would you say about me, I asked, when I pulled her in close. I have no idea who you are. Colin. I gave her my real name. You dance well, Colin, she said, her lips full. My God, this woman's spark of delightful energy radiated from her. Where'd you learn to dance like this? Doesn't matter, I said, pulling my face down to her neck. She smelled like paradise. It was coconut and some floral scent mixed together, assaulting my senses in the best of ways. All that matters is that I'm out here with you. She laughed again, and I never wanted this dance to end. Did someone slip me a love potion? What was going on with me? Who the hell was this woman? After the dance was over, she thanked me, then tried to escape my grips. I believe I owe you a drink? I bit my bottom lip, watching her smooth her hair back into a ponytail. I believe you do. Her forehead creased in humor. So, she said, as I held her hand and guided her through the crowd as the music changed behind us to allow for more dancing. Are you a doctor or an intern? I grinned. What do you think? I don't think doctors are as handsome as you. She giggled and nudged my arm as if we were reunited friends from a past life. And I also don't think doctors dance as well as you. We arrived at the bar where Jake was in conversation with two older gentlemen and two younger women. He halted his conversation and eyed me and the woman I'd snatched up from the dance floor. You think I'm an intern then, I asked. What are you having? Water for now, she said, sitting on the stool next to where Jake sat. Hey, Mario, she smiled at the bartender. You look great out there, Elena, he said. It's going to suck around here after you leave tonight. I believe I have a question for you, I said, 
taking the stool to her left, Jake now fully facing the bar, listening in on us. Well, then ask away, dance partner, she said, holding up her bottle of water. Thanks, she said with a wink to the gentleman behind the bar. Seems like Mario knows you well enough. I kept my eyes locked on her. Are you part of the medical group or the entertainment? Jake laughed. Mario and I both think that she was doing well out there alone before your sneaky ass joined her. She turned and smiled at Jake. Well, if it isn't the famed Dr. Jacob Mitchell, she said with a laugh that could probably cure a lot of diseases in our industry. In the flesh, I see you've met my best friend and intern, Colin. She turned back to me, and her expression was a dead giveaway that she read Jake's face well enough to know he was bullshitting her. Wait. She delivered the sexiest and most dynamic expression I'd seen from her yet. You both are the two steamy and sexy docs from St. John's, correct? Don't tell me you know who I am from when the media followed my sorry ass around, documenting the lamest bullshit ever, Jake said. She giggled and tipped back her bottled water. My dick was joining in on the party now. Her full lips could have been viewed in so many better ways than wrapped around that water bottle. I didn't see that part, she laughed. I felt for you when my dad told me what had happened when your life was exploited. She shook her head. But no, I just watched you in that docu-series. You were fantastic in your presentation here, too. It makes me wish I looked more into becoming a heart surgeon now. She laughed, then looked at me. And you... Dr. Colin Brooks, the youngest neurosurgeon with a level of boldness and genius skill that is unmatched, yet you still find the time to be an arrogant asshole, or so your predecessor says. Her eyebrows shot up in humor while she and Jake laughed together. Are the rumors circling this conference about you accurate? I arched my eyebrow at the sexy way she teased me. Perhaps. It looks like Dr. Alvarez's parting words were sent in the invitations to everyone here at the conference. Not a very nice predecessor. Is that so? She hit me with a toying look. What exactly were Dr. Alvarez's parting words to you? Well, as he gladly passed the torch to me in taking his place on our ward, his final words were mostly that I was the only arrogant asshole he trusted to stand in his place as neuro chief. A laugh erupted from her in the most delightful way. Seems like you've already met my dad, then. He's Dr. Alvarez. That's when Jake nearly choked on his scotch, using the back of his hand to cover the fact he'd sucked the alcohol down the wrong pipe. Your dad? I questioned in disbelief. This should have ended my fascination instantly, but instead I couldn't give a shit who she was related to. I'd somehow mentally staked some claim on her and wasn't losing her over anything now. According to your introduction to me on the dance floor, he's your future father-in-law. I do hope you both get along. Life will suck if I have to pick between my beloved father and you, Dr. Brooks. I grinned and ordered a beer. The gin had handled my nerves from earlier, and now... All I wanted now was to nurse the beer and enjoy the company of the woman who made every cell in my body come alive. Dr. Alvarez was quite the brilliant neurosurgeon. We were sad to see him retire. And you? I questioned. You never thoroughly answered my question. And which question was that? She asked. Yeah, I think all questions are nailed into your coffin by now, Jake warned with a smile. Damn, it was so intriguing how she blended in with Jake and me, as if we were all old friends. You think my dad will kick his ass for hitting on me, Dr. Mitchell? She asked Jake while studying me. I think Alvarez will definitely kick his ass, Jake said with a laugh. So the question is, she said, ordering a beer herself, am I worth that ass kicking? Yes, and you're smartly avoiding my main question, I said taking another sip of my beer. What exactly is it that you do, and where the hell have you been all my life? Jake's eyes widened while he shook his head. 
I'm going to need water and a Heineken, Mario, he called out to the bartender, and then looked at me. This is going to be a long, entertaining night. Jake knew I'd already destroyed all our guidelines for playing it safe in this industry. Now here I was, pursuing our former chief neurosurgeon's daughter. Miguel could easily kick my ass, even in his sixties. Was it worth it? To see this smile and be around the boisterous energy of this woman for the rest of my life? You're goddamn right, it was worth it. Hmm, where have I been all your life? she said with a devious laugh. Well, I've been in Florida, busting my ass so I can work at St. John's. Looks like you and I might be getting married after all, Dr. Brooks. Well, professionally, anyway, she teased. I licked my lips after taking another sip of beer. How so? I'm working in St. John's Neuro Ward and will have my own office outside of the hospital as well. Quite the dream that I worked very hard to achieve. What will you be doing exactly? Surgery? Research? Jake asked. But I already knew. She never pulled her eyes from mine. I'll be the new neuropsychologist, I finished her sentence. That's right, Doc, she teased me with those luscious lips. You're moving into my office building, I said, studying her. And yes... I arched an eyebrow, taking another sip of my beer. You and I will be joined at the hip, mostly. I'm the one who requested a neuropsychologist to work closely with me, my patients, and even in some of my surgeries. I didn't know they'd already hired someone. I was supposed to have the final say in who took the new position. Looks like we both got screwed this week, missing my brother's board meetings, Jake said, shifting to face us both and leaning against the bar. Looks like you and your new wife have a lot to iron out, and forgive me if I say that it looks like the honeymoon is over for both of you. Jake took a sip of his beer and smiled knowingly at me. That's when I watched a tiny ounce of vulnerability flash across her face. Holy crap! She softly giggled, pink coloring her cheeks, and her hypnotic eyes shifted the night's gears into another place. She held her hand out to me. Allow me to introduce myself formally. I'm Dr. Elena Alvarez, she said, as I accepted her handshake. Lovely to meet you, Dr. Brooks. I can already say I like your style. And I can safely say, welcome to St. John's. Whether I hired you or not, those issues are irrelevant after meeting the woman who will make my job much more entertaining. Quite a compliment, she said. I think we'll enjoy each other's company. I absolutely adore working with arrogant asses. Is that so? I smiled. It is. She reached for her beer. I love putting them in their place. Then it's a match made in heaven. Jake raised his beer. Though I have to ask you, Dr. Elena Alvarez, do you think you'll enjoy working around this guy? Jake chimed in, and I could tell my best friend was enjoying the collision course of career death I was on now. The question is, will he enjoy working around me? As I mentioned when I met you on the dance floor, you'll be my wife, work partners or not. I had no idea how to stop this when everything in my body was screaming that I should run this woman off to the closest wedding chapel and have fake Elvis marry us. It was insane. I never believed in any of that love at first sight bullshit. Ever. That was all crazy talk for sappy romantics and hippies who collected crystals. And yet here I was, staring this woman in the eyes and knowing I'd make good on the promise that I'd marry her. Or at least ensure she was mine. Was her dad going to kick my ass? Yes. He knew me all too well. Could my medical license be on the line? No. At least, I didn't think so. There was no way I was going to let any of that get in the way. With the way she was flirting with me, and the way she treated Jake as if we were the three musketeers reunited, I knew this was somehow meant to be. She would be mine, and I would ensure that her gorgeous smile brightened more and more as each day passed with her in my life. 
Thank God she had three weeks before her assignment began. I'd just taken two weeks of much-needed vacation for the first time in three years at St. John's. So, get ready. All it took was seeing her on the dance floor to know that my days of playing women were over. This was going to be the biggest mistake of my life. Or the best thing that ever happened to me. Chapter 2 Elena I walked through the open space of the condo my dad had taken me to view. I was a bit shocked that he had been so proactive in my relocation to California. He had lined up five places within my budget, but this one stole my heart from the second I stepped foot inside. I think he had already picked up on that fact as he eyed me carefully, looking for more positive feedback than I'd given at the previous two listings. It's got the ocean views, Dad started in, but I don't like the commute. The commute is always worth it for a view like this. Mauricio, our real estate agent, chimed in, his smile directed toward me. Not when you work long shifts in the medical industry, I smirked. Mauricio wasn't getting anywhere with his charms here. Dad and I were forces to be reckoned with in situations that required negotiating. At the store where I was picking out a new mattress, well, we sort of ruined that poor salesman's day when he started in on his sales pitch. And that was a mattress, not a half-million-dollar home. This man was handsome with his dark hair, copper eyes, and deep brown skin. His smile matched his thousand-dollar suit, too. There was no time to get caught up in Mauricio's dreamy eyes right now, though. Medical industry? He responded. Shit. I just gave him the bait. Yeah, and lots of student loan debt, too. I responded with a discreet wink to Dad. Listen, Dad said. We need to think about the houses. This seller is extremely motivated, Mauricio answered, and I looked to the ocean view from the living room window to keep from smiling at how quickly the handsome man had caved. Hell, I would have caved by now. My father was nothing if not extremely intimidating. It felt good to be close to my father again. I hadn't realized how much I'd missed the old man until I got off that plane a week ago and woke up in my old room in Beverly Hills. I felt like a teenager again without a care in the world. All of the fun memories from before my parents' divorce came back as if I were still a kid. Unfortunately, those times were long gone. It didn't take my mother long to realize that my father's true love would always be work. Dad and I had spent our last few mornings together over coffee and laughs. No business talk. Well, mostly none. I had to admit to my father that I'd met and taunted the gorgeous and all too sure of himself, Dr. Colin Brooks, making the confident man believe I had been hired as his neuropsychiatrist. The expression on Dr. Brooks's face when he thought I'd been hired without his final say was priceless. It's also probably why I hadn't seen him since that night. The buzz around the hospital was this. Due to a conflict of interest, Dr. Brooks will have Dr. Sinclair sit in his place on the hiring board for St. John's new neuropsychiatrist. After I had told Dad about meeting Dr. Brooks and Dr. Mitchell at the medical conference, our dancing, his confidence, and my attraction for the man, Dad was certain I wouldn't have a shot in hell at becoming Dr. Brooks's new psychiatrist. Thank God Dr. Brooks didn't hunt me down after learning I'd left the conference to go through an entire week of interviews. As of yesterday, I had been narrowed down to the final three applicants, and I was the first one offered the job, as if I would turn down this dream opportunity. My father was the best neurosurgeon in the country before he retired, and he'd sparked my interest in neuroscience at a young age. I'd watched him fight for his patients, care for them, devote hours upon hours of his time to research diseases, and do whatever he could to help people who had no hope. That's what drove me into the psychology specialty of this field. I was the one helping these patients cope and learn to live and love life again, and most of all, to never let a disease defeat them. With Dr. Brooks being the one my father had spoken so highly about as the new Chief of Neurology at St. John's, 
I had to wonder how this man had captured my dad's attention. I mean, this poor real estate agent who was talking turkey with dad was taking a beating. How the heck did Dr. Brooks survive with my dad as his superior? The only answer to that was that he was passionate about what he did, douchebag or not. Tomorrow, I was set to observe Dr. Brooks's live surgery from the observation room, and something gave me the feeling that he would be just like my father. He would most likely push everyone in that room to their limits, act like a total asshole, and make the job hell for everyone who worked with him. He would do all of that if he were like my father because it wasn't about them. It would be all about the patient. Why did I have such a strong feeling about this? Because my dad still liked the guy, even after I told him that he'd hit on me at the medical conference. That spoke volumes, and that told me I was about to work with a doctor who was equally as passionate about neuroscience as my father. I was glad the man was most likely too drunk to remember flirting with me and dancing with me that night in Vegas, and proposing that I would be his future wife. What an arrogant ass. Either way, if he really was like my father, one thing was absolutely sure. I would never date the guy. Never. I was not a woman who rode second best to anything, especially a job, no matter how important that job might be. Surgeons were married to their professions, and that's why my mom has been happily remarried to a real estate developer in Miami for the last nine years. She found herself a man who could appreciate her and give her his time. If and when I settled down, I would find the same in my guy. So, Lainey, Dad snapped me out of my daze. What's it going to be? You've been staring out that window like you're not sure if you're ready to leave Florida for good. The family is willing to come down on their asking price by 10%, Mauricio smiled. Make it 20%. They cover closing costs, and I'll take the condo. My financing is stellar and already in place, and since the house is empty, we can close this in lightning speed. Closing costs? Mauricio stared at me in shock. How about we offer half the closing costs? I don't need this place, but it seems like they need to sell. If the sellers are as motivated as you are making it seem, they'll take my offer. I'm not sure they won't be offended by this offer, Mauricio said, a bit thrown off by my resolve. I think it's a compliment. I smiled and folded my arms. The house has been empty and on the market for six months, which brings up another issue for me. Things have been neglected. Let them know I also want them to pay for a warranty as well. You heard her. Dad smiled with pride. I'll give them a call and let you know what their answer will be. I guess that's it then. I'm actually wondering if you could find out that answer now. I batted my eyelashes at him. I'd love to leave here. I waved my hand toward the oversized square window and imagine that in two weeks, this will be my morning view and a place where I may enjoy sunsets on my days off from long hours at the hospital. I'll see if they answer, he acquiesced. You really need to stop doing that, Dad said when the agent walked into the back room. Doing what? Acting like you? No, he chuckled, flirting your way into a deal. I smirked at my dad. Just because I have that leg up on you doesn't mean I'm not going to use it, Poppy. I want this place. Well, let's hope you didn't insult the sellers. It's negotiating. I briskly ran my hand over my dad's back. That's all. They'll do it. Fifteen day closing, Mauricio said with the same excitement as I felt jolt through my body. Welcome to Los Angeles, Miss Alvarez. Thank you, Mauricio. I extended my hand to shake his. Let's get the ball rolling on this place. My poppy already has my deadbeat baby brother living at home with him. He doesn't need me lounging around, too. I arched my eyebrow at my dad. That's an understatement, Dad added. Esteban hides out in the pool room now that his sister has come home to rule the roost. Stevie loves his sister being home, and you know it. I teased. Let's go sign some papers. We'll get this moving and get you in your new home fast. Thanks, Mauricio, I said with a smile. We may have been obnoxious, but we had fun. I'd say I owe you a date for this sale, but I think you owe me. He smirked. I laughed along with my dad. Tell you what, if you can bust your ass and get me in my new place soon, I'll take you out, I offered. 
For now, I'm starving. I saw a few taco trucks on our way here. I've so missed Southern California food and most definitely the taco trucks. Let's call this a business lunch, and I'll be one happy gal. Let's go, Lainey, my dad said with a grin. It was a done deal. My new job was in the bag. This beautiful condo was mine. And now, I needed to see if I could handle the job and the doctor who'd opened up this position to make it all possible in the first place. Chapter 3 Elena I had just finished pulling my hair into a loose bun and prepping for my first day to observe Dr. Brooks at St. John's Hospital. I should have been nervous, but I wasn't. I was eager to learn more about this side of the doctor whom I'd heard so much about. Laney! My brother hollered my name from downstairs. One last slide of lipstick over my lips, and a few pops and smacks of making sure it was evenly spread out, and then I snatched my purse on my way out of my room. I hopped down the stairs, my brother repeating my name as if I were still fourteen, and he was four. I'm right here, I said, as he grumbled my name with impatience for the hundredth time since I'd pinned up my hair. About damn time, he said, before continuing in a quieter voice. Dad's lost his fucking mind. Easy on the language. I arched a big sister eyebrow at him. Seriously. Well, when Dad fills you in on his bright idea, my perfect sister might say a few choice words herself. We'll see about that. I reached over to poke his arm playfully. Where's Dad? Or should I be more concerned about where his brain is? He's eating breakfast by the pool. I stopped walking and looked up at my brother's concerned expression. Steve had grown to be such a handsome young man. More importantly, he was incredibly smart, so an average person could imagine how frustrating it was that his goal in life had morphed into pursuing his dream of becoming a full-time nightclub DJ. The kid had manipulated my mother into letting him move to California with Dad, under the guise of attending better schools, and it seemed like no one could see his con except for me. My older sister, Lydia, had given up on dealing with this particular subset of family drama when she was in grad school. Now, she was a hotshot lawyer at a top firm in Chicago, and she was on the fast track to becoming a partner. The chances of her caring about Steve's lackluster goals for the future now were even smaller than before. Part of me didn't know if I should cut the kid a break or not, he was no more than nine or ten years old when Mom moved us to Florida, and her guilt for moving us from our father presented itself in allowing Stevie to slack off. Couple that with her starting to date and then eventually getting married, and maybe it was a fair assessment to say that Steve had slipped through the cracks more than a few times. Who knew? Maybe I was hypercritical, but it was hard being the one who begged her kid brother to at least take a couple of classes in community college until he found his true passion. Neither mom nor dad helped in getting Stevie motivated, and it drove me batshit crazy. How did Lydia and I work so brutally hard in college for so many years, and yet baby brother got to wake up at noon after stumbling through the door at dawn, much like this very morning, and wear Adidas sweatsuits all day? I can tell you're judging me and not saying anything, Lainey, Steve said smugly. I chewed on my bottom lip. I'm just wondering why you're so upset with Dad. The look on your face tells me that whatever is up, you're not okay with it because it's not going to work with your professional tracksuit lifestyle, I said, waving my hand over his outfit. He's selling the house. My brother seethed in a low voice. Right. I cocked my head, studying his reaction. You do realize that Dad retired at a relatively young age, and he has every right to do what's best for him, correct? He ran a hand through his thick, black hair. I've heard you say at least a million times that you love the memories of this house. You love being home and waking up in your bed. You love- Stop right there. I reached for his arm and smiled. I love all of this, yes, but I also bought my own home. I'm moving out as quickly as I moved in here. You haven't. If you're going to live on Dad's dime, then you have to deal with whatever comes with his decisions. I pinched his cheeks as I'd done since he was a baby. Let's go find out if Dad's moving out of the country and if the nightclub life will work for you overseas. 
I started toward the living room that overlooked the massive infinity pool. Dawn was displaying its painted hues for us to see on this glorious morning. The city lights muted the skies, but we could always see a soft pink color displayed with a sunrise on the west coast. Morning, Poppy, I said, kissing his cheek. Stevie isn't happy with you, so why don't you get straight to the point? I have to leave in 15 minutes. Dr. Brooks's surgery is planned for seven, and I'm not missing out on my first day to watch this highly esteemed surgeon do his thing. Dad smiled after sipping his coffee. Knowing Dr. Brooks, you probably should have been at the hospital hours ago. He's always there early. Which surgery is he performing? Selective peripheral neurotomy? I answered with a smile. Dr. Brooks is quite the daring doctor. Dad smiled. That he is. However, the man's arrogance is what drives him to work for medical breakthroughs. You will enjoy this. I sipped on the coffee that Steve brought out and placed in front of me. Let's wait until after this medical breakthrough has happened to praise the man. As a surgeon, my dad said, eyeing Steve sitting down. It's always something to be praised when a patient wakes from surgery. Can we get to the real issue here? Steve cut into the conversation, obviously annoyed. I slid both hands around my coffee mug and let the warmth of it add to the soothing poolside sunrise. Yes, I smiled at my flustered brother, then looked at Dad's stern expression. What is this news that has Stevie staying up past his bedtime? Make it quick, Poppy. The sun is rising and your vampire son might burn in the daylight. I'm selling this house and moving to the ranch in Malibu, Dad answered with a challenging look to my brother. Really? I asked, then looked at the watch on my wrist. Well, this is not going to be a quick five-minute conversation. Why don't we table this? I have to get out of here if you're right about Dr. Brooks starting surgeries early. It figures. Steve sat back in his chair and gripped the armrests as he looked at our father. You cannot sell this house. I'll do what I deem best for this family and myself. Dad growled as I stood. I leaned over and kissed my dad on his forehead. No fighting. I looked at Steve. That includes you. We'll talk about this like adults when I get home tonight. It's not like my opinion matters in this, though. It's Dad's home to sell. I looked at Dad and smiled with some shock. The ranch in Malibu? You really are concerned about your health, aren't you? Doctor's orders were no more stress and to retreat to a quieter lifestyle. And no better place than our precious Manico Ranch. Go to work, Steve said in a whiny voice. I walked over and kissed my brother on his head. Be smart with your words, Esteban. You know what Dr. Mitchell and Dr. Shee said about Poppy's health. He didn't retire because he wanted to. His health comes first. Stevie reached up to pat my hand that I held on his shoulder. We can't sell this house. We'll talk it all out later, I said. You two talk about me as if I'm not sitting right here. Dad smirked. Just like the old days. I shouldered my purse. I'll see you both tonight. To say I loved the atmosphere of St. John's Hospital would have been an understatement. This place was like a five-diamond hotel, enhanced with waterfalls and walls illuminated with a soft light that gently changed colors. When you walked through the entrance, you were greeted by a beautiful crystal chandelier that should have been entirely out of place. But instead, it was the focal piece that projected the richness of St. John's. Indoor pillars lined the walls as if you'd walked into a palace. There were elevators further down past the guest lobby and behind the square columns positioned throughout the large and open lobby. In each of the square columns were holographic images that showed the hospital's exquisite outdoor grounds and different floors and wards. The other side of the column displayed numerous doctors, nurses, and staff talking about St. John's. Those were on a loop and played facing where private seating was set for each area. This was all state-of-the-art architecture, and from what I'd learned since my first day here, St. John's was remodeled and renovated by Dr. Brooks's father's architectural firm, so I wasn't surprised at the high-tech, modern nature of it all. I smiled at the ladies who were hidden in the admittance and information alcove as if this were a grand hotel. I gave them a friendly wave, 
and then I was waiting with a group to get into the elevators that were fashioned to match the walls and disappear into them. It was a fun feature for a new person on their first day, especially when they were looking for the elevator, and the frigging wall opened up in front of them. Now, four days in, I had it all down. And by now, I think it was abundantly clear to everyone that I was a smiley individual, so much so that it sometimes flat out annoyed people. Strangely enough, in my opinion, when someone smiles a lot, it can tend to irritate the hell out of people with particular personality types. I couldn't help it, though. And so here I was, smiling at people in scrubs and a handsome yet cranky-looking older man wearing his white doctor's coat. The doctor held himself with great superiority over the rest of us who were beneath him and stood directly in front of the doors, hands in his pockets, as if he held the greatest secret in the world, and us little guys only dreamt that we were in on it. As we filed into the elevator, Dr. Murdoch, as the ID pinned to his lab coat stated, took his place at the front. My eyes drifted toward the doors. That damn smile of mine came back when the door opened, and he stepped out in front of me, his brisk and long strides, carrying him through the long hallway that overlooked the atrium below on one side, and the walls of scenic images were backlit on the other. This place was enchanting. Off to snatch up Dr. Brooks, I softly said out loud as my badge let me into the gallery where I would find my place with two other colleagues and watch Dr. Brooks go to work. Good morning, Dr. Alvarez, a chipper voice said from behind me. Dr. Brooks is scrubbing in now. Thanks, Lacey, I said, knowing I wouldn't be changing into scrubs yet. Today was going to be a full day, and I wasn't going to let the silence of this observation room let my mind drift to the fact that Dad was selling our home. The gravity of his decision was sinking in, and it was the last thing I needed on my mind. I began to wonder if there was something more about his health concerns that he wasn't telling us, but it was something I'd get to the bottom of later. You're the new neuropsychiatrist, aren't you? An older man to my left greeted me. Only if she wishes to work for the haughty Dr. Brooks, a man said with humor from behind me. I glanced back at the deep, confident voice and found it belonged to Dr. Mitchell, St. John's cardio chief, and Dr. Brooks' best friend. The man was gorgeous, and that was an understatement, and he stood next to a man in an expensive suit who could have been his twin. Must be his brother, Mr. Mitchell, I thought. The Mitchell family owned St. John's, and I knew the CEO of Mitchell & Associates was Mr. Mitchell, so this guy couldn't have been anyone else. Dr. Mitchell, I said, standing and turning to reach out and shake his hand. Dr. Alvarez. He smirked that same handsome smile I remembered from that night when I first met him and Dr. Brooks. I see you're here bright and early. I am, I answered his deep blue eyes a contrast to those beautiful sky-blue eyes of Dr. Brooks. Great. I was standing in the company of the man who helped bring back all the memories I had erased from the night that I met Dr. Brooks. I had a feeling that if Dr. Brooks's flirting would have led me back to his hotel room, I probably would have signed a deal with the devil to experience one night with the man who was, hands down, the most handsome man I'd ever met in my life present company included. Don't get me wrong, Dr. Mitchell and his brother, who was in conversation with another man in a fashionable suit, were gorgeous. Still, there was something about Colin Brooks that never left my mind, and I had to force that damn smile of his away, or I wouldn't have made it this far at St. John's, with his face lighting up every holographic wall. Dr. Alvarez, Mr. Mitchell said. I looked over at him and... Holy cow. This guy with his bright green eyes, black hair, and commanding air was too much for one girl to handle. My eyes couldn't help but drift to the man with dark blonde hair sitting to his right. There was no way there could be this many gorgeous men in one area. Not even science could make something like this possible. Yet, here I was, being introduced to Mr. James Mitchell and Mr. Alex Grayson two of the youngest top executives in America. 
I guess this is Dr. Brooks's big day. I smiled at the three handsome men. Not only are the executives who run the hospital here, but an ultra-famous, world-renowned cardiosurgeon is here for this, too. That's right, the man who'd introduced himself as Mr. Grayson said. Though, I believe our opinions will pale in comparison to yours. His smile was mischievous, leading me to believe that these three were in on some joke I didn't know about, but his eyes never wavered from mine. Yes, and I'm quite sure I'll be thrilled to work with and for Dr. Brooks after our interview today. I said, turning to sit, hearing the commotion of the surgical teams and the patient being brought into the room. I guess you're not one to judge the doctor by his extracurricular fun at conferences, then. I heard the humorous voice of Dr. Mitchell say. That I can judge outside of the professional realm. I looked back at the teasing face of Dr. Mitchell. And let's just say I hope that Dr. Brooks is as exciting to work with as he was a great entertainment for us when we first met. Dr. Mitchell smirked, and his deep blue eyes twinkled. What happened to that vibrant young woman who tricked him into believing you were hired already, and without his consent? She's sitting right here and ready to watch this man turn water into wine. Dr. Mitchell laughed. If only I could take a crash course in neurosurgery and be on this team. He wasn't too upset that I lied to him, was he? I had no idea why I asked the question. Well, he wasn't too happy when he learned the truth of your trickery. His eyes widened semi-dramatically as he crossed his leg over his knee and leaned back. My stomach sank. I felt the eyes of Mr. Mitchell and Mr. Grayson on me now, and I felt a bit foolish. What if I'd pissed off the chief neurosurgeon and was just now finding out about it? I'd find out after the surgery when I finally met with Dr. Brooks professionally this afternoon. Just like that, I smiled, lifted my chin, and turned to watch Dr. Colin Brooks as he entered the surgical room. Heaven help me. The handsome men behind me prepped me so I wouldn't drool over the man who made surgeon's gear look good. His smile greeted those in the room, yet his piercing blue eyes told a different story. He was there for his patient, and everything had better be pristine as he went to work in this particular spinal surgery. Beyond the man's beauty, I was captivated by how he commanded his surgical team and room. He didn't talk like an asshole. He talked like a surgeon who was determined to complete this surgery in a manner unlike any other doctor. Maybe there were other doctors out there like Dr. Brooks, but I hadn't met one. Most were dry and a bit boring, mostly treating the patient and then moving on to the next subject. Not this surgeon, though. He was focused and he filled us in on what he was doing with each cut, suction, and move he made. He explained why he did what he did, and he was captivating to watch. I understood why my dad had passed the torch to him. Dad felt the same about his patients, and the knowledge that my dad's health was the reason I was watching Dr. Brooks, and not him, made my heart ache. There was no way in hell I was going home tonight and giving my dad crap about wanting to move to the ranch in Malibu. All it took was seeing the passion and care in Dr. Brooks to let me know that dad didn't want to retire early, but he was forced to. Dad deserved to be happy and content, and I thanked God for allowing me to see my own father's passion play out in the surgical room through Dr. Brooks. Chapter 4 Elena The surgery lasted four hours, and it was phenomenal. As of right now, my assessment was this. Dr. Brooks was an absolute genius, and a surgeon who was worthy of the praise he'd garnered. He complimented the redefined nature of this institute. The family eagerly waiting for their loved one to wake from surgery would undoubtedly have a long recovery road ahead. Still, the execution was flawless. The documentary makers in the observation gallery and I were left to wonder if this breakthrough surgery would work to give back the movement of the 56-year-old man's legs after his accident. Time would tell. Being a psychiatrist, I had to be grounded in the fact that experimental surgery may not work. I hoped with all my heart that this family was prepped for that possibility as well. 
Dr. Brooks may have done a stellar job today, but was this particular surgery ultimately going to be successful? Would it help this patient gain feeling again, let alone be able to walk? These were the things I would work on with Dr. Brooks. It was my job to help them cope with their outcomes and set realistic goals. It was a matter of Dr. Brooks and me seeing eye to eye on these topics. I didn't need a doctor with a god complex, destroying my voice of reason because of his ideas to move neuroscience forward. If Dr. Brooks and I were going to work together, I would have to be assured that he would not undermine my work while we consulted with future patients. I would never know why they were leaving my willingness to work with Dr. Brooks up to me. It really should have been the other way around. I would never sit idly by and let a greedy doctor risk a patient's mental state for the betterment of his reputation and in the name of science. But maybe that was the balance the administrators were hoping to achieve. I had just sat down in the dining commons of the hospital. It wasn't as crowded as it had been on previous days. But then again, it was one in the afternoon, and this must have been the time that this five-star restaurant place didn't see too many hungry families and staff. I closed my arms and looked up at the glass dome ceiling that added a beautiful light and airy feel to the restaurant. I had to give it up to whoever had a hand in designing this place. Ordinary hospitals had cafeterias, but I couldn't bring myself to refer to this place as such. It was as lovely as any nice restaurant I'd ever been in. I hadn't seen it at night yet, but I'm guessing they put candles on the tables and that the lights strung throughout the area twinkled and sparkled with magnificence. The designers had to be congratulated, and the chefs awarded something. Sis, I heard my brother call out. Why are you all alone? He pulled out a chair across from me and sat in it. Of all the people I know, you make best friends in minutes, but here you are, sitting by yourself like a loser. It wasn't like my brother to volunteer to bring me lunch from my favorite taco truck, but there was no way I was going to argue with him when he texted me and suggested dropping by. That's because I told everyone that my hot date was on his way to meet me for lunch. I smirked as I grabbed my tacos, unwrapped the foil they were wrapped in, and examined the different salsas that he brought. I decided on the extra spicy red sauce, doused my taco, and bit into the carne asada masterpiece nodding my head while pointing at the taco to confirm how delicious it was. Perfection, I said, smiling at Steve as he bit into his burrito. He swallowed as his eyes drifted over my shoulder. Holy shit, he said with wide eyes. Keep your mind out of the gutter, Esteban, I said. There are gorgeous men and women all over this hospital, but don't get caught up in the facade. Remember, beauty is in the heart. Beauty? I guess I know what's on your mind. He shifted in his seat like he was ready to jump up. I turned to see who my brother was gawking over. What do you know? Dr. Brooks had just joined Mr. Mitchell and Mr. Grayson at a corner table. Who are you looking at? What is wrong with you? I asked, confused by the way Steve was acting. It was like he'd just ran into Al Pacino, and he didn't know if he should run over and ask for an autograph. He looked at me in frustration. You see that tall guy with the black hair? The businessman-looking guy in the blue tie? I've been waiting for like a year to speak with him, but I can't seem to get past the gatekeepers at that locked-down building he works in downtown. Get past the gatekeepers? I questioned, finishing taco number one. I sat back in my chair, wiping my mouth with a napkin, and I folded my arms. Now I know why you were so eager to bring me lunch. Spill it. I'm dying to know how you even know about Mr. Mitchell. Do you think someone like him wants to be stalked and harassed by someone like you? Steve's face fell, and I felt like I went a little too hard on him. Maybe I did. Earth to my little brother, I said, trying to snap his eyes away from looking up and over my shoulder. You're not interrupting that man. Now, let's get back to why you showed up with my favorite tacos. What exactly did you come for, Stevie? Yes, why would you dare interrupt the almighty Mr. Mitchell from his royal lunch? I heard the voice I'd been focused on for the last four hours say. I watched as Colin walked around, pulled out a chair, and sat next to my brother. Steve looked over at him in his dark blue scrubs 
and smiled broadly. If it isn't the amazing Dr. Brooks, he said, turning to shake his hand. My dad's talked a lot about you. It's nice to meet you. I'm Steve. The pleasure is all mine, Steve, he said, then looked over at me. You mentioned that your dad has spoken a lot about me, but has your sister? Laney hasn't told me anything, actually, Steve responded with a knowing grin. Colin arched an eyebrow at me, highlighting how impossibly gorgeous he was. Laney, is it? I remember a young, vibrant woman named Elena. She was quite deceitful. I wanted to shrink in my chair, but hell no. Not in front of him or my brother, both of whom seemed to be on the same team suddenly. I prefer Dr. Alvarez, Dr. Brooks. He smirked. Very well, Dr. Alvarez. He looked over at my brother. I overheard the word gatekeeper come from your mouth regarding my buddy's building. I can get you into the upper floors and seated directly in front of Mr. Mitchell. He glanced over my shoulder and smiled. Who does not seem to be impressed with his raw vegetables at the moment? You can? My brother shot up. I was stuck in stupid hormone land, gazing at Colin's eyes in the light of this room. The dark and light blonde in his hair, highlighting some textured thing he did with it to make it look messy and youthful. It all worked. Everything about him worked. His sharp jawline, his biceps on full display, with the way medical scrubs seemed to climb up and not stretch over muscles like regular shirt sleeves. He was glorious, and my lust for this guy was out of control. You could see he was in excellent shape. His features were perfection, and his smile was going to be the death of me. It's a deal. My brother shook Colin's hand as he stood, snapping me to attention after I'd tuned everything out while I was fantasizing like a 15-year-old. Wait, what's a deal? What are you two talking about? I stood to try and meet the tall height of Dr. Brooks. Hey, I'm sorry I tricked you or whatever I did in Vegas. It was all in fun, and I was enjoying the last night there. I knew I didn't have the job, and you would have the final word. It was just too much fun saying that I'd gotten the job, especially after you were so confident in dancing with me and stating I would be your future wife. Now, it's professional. He smiled, and my stomach swarmed with butterflies. Of course it's professional. Dr. Alvarez. He acknowledged, with a look that tinted my cheeks pink. However, I'm still professionally acknowledging that whether or not you desire to work with me after our interview in 30 minutes, I made you a promise. And that was? I was shocked the man didn't hate me for tricking him. That I am the man I proclaimed to be that night. And who was that? I sat down in my seat, crossed my arms, and smiled. Dr. Brooks's eyes glistened as he bit on the corner of his mouth. Your future husband. He exhaled. You see, Dr. Alvarez, you may have been enjoying the quirks and fun in teasing me with a little white lie that you were my new neuropsychiatrist that evening. But I wasn't playing around. Okay, then, I said carefully. You're still willing to commit the rest of your life and do the whole death shall part us thing after a salsa dance? You'll see. Twenty more minutes, and your brother and I have an agreement. He leaned down, and I felt the coolness of his breath tickle my neck. Help the poor boy buy a suit, won't you? Mr. Mitchell won't be as easily won over with a young man who's dressed like he's a groupie for Run DMC. He may want to spice it up a little. If I have to, to make good on our deal, I'll have my designer help him out. I glared at my conniving brother, and then at Dr. Brooks. I have no idea what kind of lame deal you discussed while I was... Lost in thought over me, I'm sure. I am quite attractive in scrubs. He chuckled. Busted. I'll admit that yes, you are. However, I'm not spending a dime on my brother, no matter what ridiculous agreement you've come to. I think it's a fine idea, Colin said. I have no idea what the idea is, but if it requires you putting my brother in front of Mr. Mitchell for whatever crazy idea he might have, then I want no part of this. You can tell Mr. Mitchell that, too. So you'll lie to the chief neurosurgeon. I let you down. I smiled at him. Imagine how depressing that was. 
I thought we'd be planning our wedding this week. And yet, here I am, about to get grilled by the most beautiful woman I've ever met in my life. He winked. See you in fifteen minutes. Future wife? My brother broke my gaze on Colin's shapely backside and brought it back to him. You know what they say about neurosurgeons, I said with a shrug. Steve laughed. He's coming over for dinner next week. Coming over? Stevie? I sat up straight. We need to figure out why our father has decided to up and sell our childhood home and move to the ranch. If there's anything I learned in surgery today, it's that he isn't going to be a happy man if his health is the real reason he retired early. Something else has to be up, and we aren't going to have Dr. Brooks over for dinner as a distraction. He's best friends with Dr. Mitchell, Laney. That's Dad's heart doctor, Steve answered. Maybe Colin can fill us in? With Dad sitting right there? I shook my head. And when did you start referring to him as Colin? Since we made our deal. Good God. I rolled my eyes. If Dr. Brooks wants to play into your dream of whatever it is you need from Mr. Mitchell, then he'll deal with me for giving you a false sense of hope. It's to start my new company. I held my hand up. Don't. I eyed him. Now, thank you very much for my tacos. You're not going anywhere tonight. We're sitting down with Dad and getting to the bottom of his health issues and why exactly he wants to move to Malibu. Dad comes first, just like I said this morning. Good luck with the interview, he said with a smile. You should have wished your luck to your new friend Colin, not me. Right now, our interview may be going off topic and a lot longer than I expected. Chill out, sis. He's cool. That's what worries me, I smiled. Someone needs to kick your butt in the right direction, and I have a feeling Dr. Brooks just made my job a whole hell of a lot more difficult. And she cusses. Because you pissed me off. I snapped. And for the record, I'm no saint. I use profanity. I just don't spew it everywhere, and especially in Poppy's house. That's disrespectful. Love you, sis. You too. Steve was way too jubilant for me not to leave this cafeteria in search of Colin's office to find out precisely what Mr. Wedding Vows said to strike a deal with my brother. Was I up against a mess with this man already? Time would tell. The last thing I needed was some cocky doc giving my brother insane ideas about overnight success. My brother needed to be grounded and have a healthy mindset. Colin seemed to balance both well. Who knew? Maybe a few Cuban sandwiches would help the doctor talk sense into my brother. Chapter 5 Colin I sat in my office going over the medical charts for a young woman that I had been trying to persuade to hold off on a craniotomy. For now, anyway. The brain lesions weren't life-threatening, and even though they were the cause of Jamie's mild headaches, they weren't something that called for surgery at this time. I hated debating with patients when they were in pain and just wanted the fuck out of it. I understood their frustrations, and I was the first person in line to help fix that problem, but this patient was not a candidate for surgery. I only hoped she wouldn't seek out another, greedier doctor who would do the surgery. Some surgeons could get so distracted by seeing their success that they didn't consider the patient's after-effects. I wasn't that surgeon. I believed myself to be the most patient man on the planet, and situations such as these proved that. Knock, knock. Come in, I said, knowing it was most likely my assistant, informing me that the woman who'd stolen my heart and soul that night in Las Vegas was here to learn more about me and determine if she would take the job as my neuropsychiatrist. Am I interrupting you? Elena's voice, filled with sass and also professionalism, forced my eyes up from the CT scans I'd been studying and to her flawless body that filled her business suit perfectly. Damn that smile and those lively eyes. I was going to be lucky if she didn't eat me alive in here, because the only question that I had for her was whether or not she'd go out to dinner with me tonight. I offered a smile in return, and this was the second time I watched as our eyes locked, and then her cheeks turned the most beautiful shade of pink in response. Thank God I did something to her, because she had no idea what being in her presence did to me. 
I rose and waved my hand over my office chair. Looks like you get the boss's seat and I get the hot seat, Dr. Alvarez. I'll sit here, she smirked as she sat at the seat on the other side of my desk. I cleared my throat and my head and reached over to her file. So I suppose this is to be our first official interaction since you blatantly deceived me at the medical conference, I said. I thumbed through her resume and notes from staff before I ended at her handwritten statement as to why she would be a perfect asset to my team. I folded my arms, sat on the corner of my desk, and watched her squirm. Again, I am really sorry about that. She tried to cover a smile. Imagine my disappointment and rage to learn we are expected to begin our working relationship with little white lies, I said. And imagine my disappointment and rage to learn that you're going to use my little brother to get back at me for that, too. I chuckled and walked over to sit, more professionally, behind my desk. You played the wrong man, Elena. Dr. Alvarez, she corrected me, crossing her legs and clasping her hands together around her knee. May I ask why you're so insistent upon me referring to you as a doctor, doctor? Professionalism. I pursed my lips. Curious. I have read through all your previous interviews with the hiring panel, and you insisted upon them calling you Elena. I looked up at her from the papers I pretended to scan over. Am I to understand that out of all the respected doctors and administrators in this hospital that you've interviewed with, I am the only one you deem to be a professional? I have to say that I am utterly flattered that you show me such a level of esteem. She smiled, and her bronze eyes lit up. I only insist upon that level of professionalism for doctors who run around with a crazy idea that they're my intended husband. I laughed and tossed her folder on my desk, something very unlike me. Everything in my office, surgical rooms, staff, ward— and every other single thing I touched was in order and placed in an orderly fashion. That fundamental aspect of my personality seemed to have faded from the moment this little ray of sunshine sat across from me. Well, I'm thoroughly impressed with all I've read, and now it's time to answer some of the questions you might have for me, I said. She straightened up in her chair. Yes. My first question is about the patient you operated on today. Did you do so knowing that man would walk again? She was cutting right to the chase, and I liked it. I clasped my hands together and leaned forward on my desk. I operated on Mr. Hawthorne after he came to me and wished to have a better outcome in life. His car accident wasn't something he would allow to continue to rob him of the normal life he once had. Numerous rehabs weren't helping either. You didn't answer my question. She arched an eyebrow. Will he walk again, or... I'm ninety percent sure that in three days, you and I will walk down to his room and see that he has muscle movement in his legs. We remove the damaged nerves, allowing Mr. Hawthorne's brain to receive signals from his healthy nerves so that he can have muscle movement in that location again. Fascinating, she answered. As much as I enjoy hearing that come out of your mouth, and in such a beautiful way, I believe you understand very well that, in neuroscience, there's not an immediate answer with what we do. Especially when we are working with the nervous system, and most definitely the peculiar way every brain works differently. It's always a waiting game. No, I understand that. That's why you'll have me at your side. I'll be the one sharing what we can do together to help patients who've undergone surgeries, such as the one you did today. I would help them accept their new lives and give counsel if the surgery didn't help change their current predicament. So, if Mr. Hawthorne wakes to find that he still cannot feel his legs, despite my best efforts today in the operating room, I'm willing to help him accept his current situation. Wrong answer. I smiled. We fixed his current situation, but time must be waited out, or we fail in helping our patients recover. You're that sure of yourself, she questioned with some irritation. I wouldn't have performed the surgery if I weren't. 
I've studied this for years, and the science behind it makes perfect sense. But it will take time, and I will be there for him, encouraging him every step of the way to not give up. And now we have two minds thinking on the same level, I answered, relieved that she was as brilliant, open, and understanding as she was captivatingly stunning. Any other questions? When you are working with your patients, or when a neurologist calls you in for a surgical consultation for their patient, she paused, eyeing me as I studied her. Is your answer always surgery? I laughed. Funny you should ask. I pointed to the chart I had set aside. Those records belong to a young woman who moved from Colorado to Southern California to be in my care. She's been my patient for two years, and I have put off surgery that she's all but begged me to perform. She was twenty when her accident happened. She hit her head on the playing field in a soccer tournament. After studying her initial charts, I saw that this particular injury caused multiple lesions to continue to appear throughout her brain. Up to now, I have only done stereotactic brain surgery to remove the threatening lesions and keep her recovery minimal. Her minor headaches do not make her a candidate for a craniotomy at this time, no matter how much she begs. Wait a minute, awake brain surgery? Yes. I knew she understood the term, but her adorable expression had me silent and waiting for the comment that I knew was coming next. No human in their right mind begs for that. Agreed. Yet your patient is begging you, Dr. Brooks. She is. Her fiancé cradles her, she sobs, and I have to watch all of that after I reveal that her latest CT scans still do not make her a candidate for the surgery. You and I both know that's heartless. Is it? I questioned, seeing this issue cause my future neuropsychiatrist some discomfort. It's what the patient moved here for, right? So the world-renowned neurosurgeon can help her? If she's begging for this type of surgery and cries in defeat when you tell her no, what good are you to her? And what if I make the greedy mistake of trying to eliminate one of the small lesions, then something happens, and she can never walk again? Will that have been worth her craniotomy to get rid of minor headaches? Minor headaches don't always feel so minor to those suffering with them. She sat back and studied me. I've never met a surgeon who isn't willing to put their patients under the knife to fix their problems. Usually, surgery is always the answer. Yet here you sit, in front of the world-renowned neurosurgeon. I grinned. And he's telling you that surgery isn't always the answer, even if it's heartless for me to refuse them their wishes concerning surgery. Intriguing. I care about each patient I have. Even if they think they know what's best for them, I believe it to be my responsibility to guide them in the safest direction. For now, anyway. Jamie is 26, and her boyfriend, Paul, just proposed to her. She will continue to be my patient, but I plan to revisit her charts monthly unless the headaches worsen. I have new scans coming to me today. I glanced up at the clock. If the damn things arrive before her appointment this afternoon... I guess St. John's is suddenly understaffed, and I wasn't informed. Damn, I wish I could be with you for that, she said, ignoring my apparent frustration that I didn't have my patient's current scans yet, and I wanted a bit of time to go over them before I walked in and broke Jamie's heart. Again. If I were to bring you in when I meet with Jamie and her family this afternoon, what would the stunning Dr. Alvarez say to her that I already haven't? Well, I would do my best to work to keep her mindset positive and reinforce that she is in the hands of a doctor who is helping her, even though her headaches are telling her that he isn't, that she needs to trust that you have her best interest in mind, and that there is more at risk than I think she knows. She pursed her lips. You are sure that she isn't a candidate for surgery? You're willing to avoid something that could change her life for the better because you're not the surgeon who believes surgery is always the answer? trying to use my words against me, Dr. Alvarez? I need to understand it all completely, she answered confidently. Forgive me for saying this, but neurosurgeons are known to be arrogant assholes. 
My dad passed the torch to you, saying you were the greatest arrogant ass out there, too. I'm just trying to ensure that you're not completely on the opposite end of the spectrum with your judgment in preventing this young lady from having a better chance at life. Is that so? Or perhaps you're doubtful of your ability to perform this surgery with no complications, and that's why you don't want to take more risk than necessary. I'm not sure if you can tell, but I'm hardly doubtful of my skill, myself, or much of anything else. Like I said, an arrogant ass. She grinned. She wasn't wrong to push me about Jamie, because the truth was that I had been going back and forth with myself about doing the craniotomy for quite a while. Elena was making me admit to myself that, like it or not, it was time to make a move. The lesion on Jamie's frontal lobe is the largest of them all. This one concerns me the most, but there is another one on the parietal lobe that I've been monitoring closely, and when I heard she was experiencing numbness in her right hand, I called for this meeting today. I ordered more scans, barring some unforeseen act of healing. I think I will be confirming her candidacy for surgery today. Now, I hope you accept the offer to work solely as my neuropsychiatrist, because you are the reason I have concluded that I will be performing these surgeries at all. That is, of course, if you agree to be my psychiatrist and work with her and me as I map her brain and repair these lesions. I stood, and she stood with me. I did what? Wait, what? She asked, looking confused as hell. Are you second-guessing your decision to help me help this young woman? No, but you made a decision based on our conversation? You gave me the nudge I needed. There's nothing wrong with me being on the fence about something and having a beautiful and intelligent woman like yourself push me off, is there? I walked past her and licked my suddenly dry lips when I made eye contact with her stunning bronze irises. Let's agree that Jamie will have you to thank for becoming a candidate for surgery today. I didn't say anything, she said in some bewildered tone. Well, you need to say something now. Will you or will you not be my personal neuropsychiatrist? I have a patient who is waiting for me to deliver some good news. Of course I will. When will you perform the surgery? I will allow the family to determine that, given we have the holidays coming up, and she may not want to be in a recovery unit when Santa comes, I teased. I glanced back at her confused expression, and I couldn't blame her bafflement. I'd surprised myself by making the decision without looking at Jamie's new scans. Unfortunately, one thing was certain. The lesions were growing. Elena was intelligent in her questions, and she'd pressed on the one point I'd been avoiding myself. Jamie's quality of life was suffering, so why not fix these lesions and be done with it? I just needed a small push in the right direction, and Elena gave that to me. I believe that you and I will make a fantastic team, I said, opening my office door. I still can't believe it took you sitting down with me to figure this out. I suppose it just took me meeting the right person, Dr. Alvarez, a doctor who I can trust, to give me the willpower to stop putting this off. Now, to confirm... Are you willing to perform this surgery with me? I haven't proven anything to you that I would be a great help. Ever heard of trusting one's instincts, Dr. Alvarez? Marriage again? She teased with a smile. I grinned. As I said, I'm a patient man. I will wait for you to come to your senses about me and our future, I teased, loving the new facial expressions and reactions I got from her over that. It's just a matter of time. I believe that, with your will and determination, we'll work together in a perfect balance to consult Jamie this afternoon. I held a hand up. No jumping to the other side of the table if she cries, though. She chuckled. I'll do whatever I believe is in the best interest of the patient. Our patient, I informed her. And that's why I'm willing to do this surgery. We will be successful together and I look forward to having you at my side. I look forward to seeing a patient who's waited a year for you to fix this issue 
hear that you will help them, giving them the best news of their lives. Her name is Jamie, I said. Unlike you, she's entirely comfortable with using first names. She laughed, and the delightful sound sent a shiver through me. Her radiant smile, her genuinely happy laugh, her body language. She was completely open, light, and cheerful, and she sent blood rushing to every part of my body. So before I leave to find out where Jamie's current scans are, I must know, are you excited to become the arrogant ass's personal neuropsychiatrist? I am, she proudly said. Good, I raised my eyebrows in humor. I have some charts that need to be filed away. You can start there. I pointed to the file cart that my secretary, June, had rolled to the corner of my office, and I winked and walked past Elena. Good to have you on the team, Dr. Alvarez. After my office door closed behind me, I withheld my laughter and kept my composure. June, I said, after she got off her phone call. Dr. Brooks, she answered with a smile. Well, is Elena going to stick around? She lets you call her Elena, too? I questioned in disbelief. She's told all of us that she prefers it. I strummed my fingers on the high desk that June hid behind. Interesting. I sighed. Well, she'll be quitting on us soon enough if you don't get in there and clean up your filing mess. Oh, fairy darts! Fairy darts? I asked my jubilant assistant, who was majorly in the Christmas spirit, as her Grinch-themed scrubs and flashing Christmas pins showed. That's a new one. Fairy darts, she said, as she rolled her eyes. It's part of the lore. A lore I want no part of, it would seem. And find a new term, please, or Elena will quit on us for sure. I don't think she realizes you are secretly obsessed with woodland creatures. Juno laughed and nodded. I need to bring those files downstairs. I'm sorry I didn't get around to it before your appointment today, Dr. Brooks. No worries, Junebug. It was a good way to get Dr. Alvarez back for a little prank she played on me before we met professionally. Oh? Oh, indeed, I said in a mischievous tone. Sort of like throwing a fairy dart and hitting the bullseye on that one. She frowned. That is not a fairy dart, Dr. Brooks. God forbid I upset the fairies for insulting whatever the hell a fairy dart is. I feigned fear. Can you please tell Dr. Alvarez to get Jamie Peterson's file off my desk and meet me in conference room five? My patients are due there at any time, and I have a feeling she's scrambling to figure out where the filing cabinets are for the cart of files you hid in my office. I'll get on that. I loved June immensely. One would naturally pin her for being the nut job on the floor, but she was a hard-ass worker, and I wanted for nothing when it came to her. However, I did feel that she and her fairy darts, whatever the hell that was about, coupled with pranking Elena, would have me on my toes. Chapter 6 Elena I sat in awe of Dr. Brooks as he spoke with the Peterson family. I watched Paul, Jamie's fiancé, tear up, along with Jamie and her parents, as Colin delivered the good news. The whole situation was an emotionally charged experience and a perfect reminder of why I entered this work field. In moving forward, Dr. Brooks said as he glanced toward the charts he'd intently studied on our way down to this conference room. Those charts make me truly grateful that I listened to our new neuropsychiatrist's advice today. The lesions have put me in a position not to be able to give you an option to wait until after the holidays. For this, I am sorry. But we'll get you on the road to recovery, and that's all that matters. He subtly smiled at the family who sat across from us around the long, polished table. Now... I won't be using the 3D images and devices that I used in stereotactic brain surgery. He nodded toward where I sat at his right. This surgery requires my neuropsychiatrist to guide me instead of computers. Dr. Cullen, Jamie said, sniffing and taking tissue from the box Dr. Brooks picked up and extended toward her. I'm not worried about this surgery interfering with the holidays. 
This is the best Christmas gift I could have asked for. Dr. Brooks softly laughed, and I couldn't help but smile. I'm happy to hear that I was able to one-up your handsome fiancé for gift exchanges this year. He grinned over at the ecstatic young man. I know we are all grateful this is moving forward, and I'm quite sure. He slowed down those last three words as he eyed at Jamie playfully. You've done all the research under the sun and moon to understand exactly what will happen while we perform this surgery. Even with what I've already explained, and your own research, I'd like to turn this part over to the one who will be at your side during the surgery. He shifted to face me, and his twinkling blue eyes locked with mine. To prevent me from falling victim to the gorgeous man's gaze, I carefully pulled my eyes from Collins and smiled at Jamie. Thank you so much, Dr. Alvarez. Jamie looked at me eagerly. She blotted the corners of her eyes with her tissue as she choked up again. I'm sorry, this is just overwhelming and such great news, especially since my headaches have gotten worse. I'm so very happy for you, Miss Peterson. Jamie, please, call me Jamie. She sniffed again and smiled at Dr. Brooks, before bringing her attention back to me. And if it makes you more comfortable, you may call me Elena. You see? Dr. Brooks interrupted with a broad smile. This is why she'll be an amazing asset to my team. She is comfortable using her first name instead of being one of those super uptight physicians who always wants to be called Doctor. Yeah, those kinds sound like the worst, Paul said, as Jamie and her family laughed. Oh, you have no idea. So obnoxious, right, Elena? Colin said as he glanced at me with a hint of smugness that was wildly charming and almost irresistible to me for some strange reason. All of us being on this first-name basis is fantastic. What a wonderful way to be comfortable together in the OR. I would have it no other way. I agree. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Jamie answered both of us with a smile. Absolutely, I said, keeping a smile on my face through Colin's buffoonery. Aside from wanting to roll my eyes and elbow the man in the ribs, I was a bit shocked the young woman was happy at the idea of awake brain surgery. I'd never met anyone who was okay with this. As Dr. Brooks mentioned, I will be the one at your side during the surgery. Dr. Brooks revealed earlier the details of using the electrical probe to ensure that he will not be anywhere near the good tissue and causing any damage to any part of your brain. I paused to ensure I was on track with the doctor and the patient. That is where I come in. After you are pulled out of sedation, you will have enough medication to keep you relaxed. Since your brain has no pain receptors, there will be no need for sedation or heavy drugs for him to fix the problematic lesions. You and I will have lots of time to talk in that room. I smiled at her. Dr. Brooks will rely on our communication and me to relay information about your responses to him, and he will be able to maximize his pursuit to fix the lesions. Does this make sense? I've probably read everything ever written about this procedure, so I think I've got a grasp on it. She chuckled. But I'm delighted you'll be there. So, now that is all cleared up? Dr. Brooks chimed in. If you lose your ability to recite the alphabet backward, or you forget how to make pancakes, he pointed his thumb toward me. It's all on this beautiful doctor who you'll have the privilege to talk to during your surgery. Dr. Brooks? Jamie scolded him as she and her family nearly roared with laughter. Not a response I would have expected, but at least they had a sense of humor. I can think of no better person to have at my side. When are we doing this? As much as I know you'd love to walk out of the room right now and run into the OR, we're not doing it today, Dr. Brooks said, while I laughed at this woman's cheerfulness. Once I have all the consent I need, he paused, looked at her parents, fiancé, me, then the patient. Which I believe we are all in, yes? All in, she said, crying tears of happiness again. Very well, then. I will begin freeing up mine and Dr. Alvarez's schedules, and I believe I can push out my Thursday appointments this week. I will inform my secretary that this Thursday will be dedicated to taking care of the young woman who has been eagerly awaiting getting back the quality of life she once had before these lesions began interfering with it. Dr. Brooks stood, and the rest of us followed his lead. I really don't know what to say. I'm so grateful, Jamie said. 
Have patience with me. I need Patty to clear up this Thursday. And from there, I will have Patty call you to confirm the time and dates of pre-op. Patty hasn't had the baby yet? Jamie's mother asked, while Jamie and her fiancé fell into a tight and loving embrace. Dr. Brooks grinned that sexy smile of his. Not yet. I tried to get her to take her maternity leave two weeks ago, Dr. Brooks said as he picked up Jamie's files from the table. Given it's her first child, and her husband is serving the country overseas, I wish for her to be comfortable and fully prepared for the little one's arrival, but she's not budging. She probably hopes she'll go into labor while she's on the clock and in walking distance from the hospital. He chuckled. She probably feels safer, knowing there's a doctor around, Jamie's dad said. Hey, I've told her time and again that I'm a neurosurgeon, not an OB. She knows me better than that. He laughed. You're not just a neurosurgeon, Dr. Colin. You're a miracle worker. Jamie's mom laughed along with the rest of us. A miracle worker, who will probably get me into a lot of trouble, I thought, as we said our farewells and left the room. After we walked away from the Petersons, Dr. Brooks whipped out his cell and called his office. I listened as he handled the call and followed him as we returned to his office. He took the files that June handed him while he worked out the details of opening up his schedule with Patty on the phone. I watched as other staff around the area appeared to look over at him as if he were some kind of god. He missed nothing and no one. He shot a smile at those who greeted him in passing. He gave a quick punch to a young doctor's arm as we passed the nurse's station, and even gave a nod or two toward the interns who gawked at him, gawking like I must have been doing since we left the meeting with Jamie Peterson. It reminded me of those teen shows where the star of the football team walks through the hallways of his school and everyone is high-fiving him or smiling. His charisma radiated to everyone around him, and he knew it. I watched him ease his right hand on his taut waist as he continued discussing moving his patients around to free up Thursday. His voice was calm yet assertive, as he worked with another doctor to take one of his patients due to a scheduled surgery that the two would be doing together next week. With his white lab coat removed, I had a perfect vantage point, standing behind him and enjoying his firm ass and his scrubs. I was beginning to wish I didn't have female hormones that suddenly loved to betray me with this man around. I couldn't take my eyes off of him. His perfect back muscles flexing nicely through his scrub top, don't get me started with the forearms, broad shoulders, and biceps. There was nothing but beautiful perfection built there. I wouldn't expect anything less, though. He was a neurosurgeon, and he needed the steady hands. And so, he had the arm muscles to keep that all in check. Yes, that's it. That's the reason he was built so muscularly perfect— and I was feeling those stupid butterflies flooding my stomach once again while I imagined him taking off his shirt so I could get a glimpse of how well he was defined. He hung up the phone, and that's when I felt the heat blaze across my cheeks. Shit, what was I supposed to do? Fan myself like an old lady who'd caught the Holy Ghost in an Alabama church service? He slid the phone onto his desk, picked up the files June had given him, and turned to face me. He leaned back against his desk, and his eyes went to the charts he held. So, doctor, he started, my cheeks cooling down just in time for his icy blue eyes to meet mine. Oh, I forgot. We're on a first-name basis now. Right, Elena? No, I said, my palms sweating. What the hell? This was a problem I'd never experienced before unless Dad was grilling me about something. He arched an eyebrow at me. Well, I feel more comfortable calling you Elena. I don't, I said, honestly. God, the way my name rolled off his tongue. The way he said it was sexy, even if he was only teasing me. I couldn't do sexy with this man. I couldn't do anything with this man so long as I got butterflies in my stomach around him. My cheeks heated up to a feverish temperature, and my palms started sweating. May I ask why that is? He asked, and I could sense that the flirty side of the man, Colin, had vanished, and I was left to stare at Dr. Brooks and his solemn and curious blue eyes. 
I sincerely do not wish to make you uncomfortable in my presence, or my ward. We need to come to some kind of agreement outside of this Dr. Brooks and Dr. Alvarez nonsense. Even if you don't return my feelings. He started thumbing through his charts, as if this were any other conversation. Which eventually you will. He looked up at me and flashed that irresistible cheeky grin of his, and then looked down at his charts again. You and I need to be a bit more comfortable in each other's presence, wouldn't you say? I say we keep it professional and move in that direction as we get to know each other. I answered with a smile, finding my bearings. His phone buzzed, and all he did was smirk as he answered it, put it on speaker, placed it aside, and continued looking at his charts again. Dr. Mitchell? He answered. You're on speaker. Talk. Pull me off speakerphone if you're in the company of a group of staff, please. Dr. Mitchell answered with annoyance in his voice. You're in the company of Dr. Alvarez and me. We're alone in my office. He said. Dr. Alvarez? Ah, Elena. Dr. Mitchell said, realizing Colin wasn't referring to my father. How are we enjoying the cocky neurosurgeon? Are you going through with this professional marriage agreement? Hold up. Colin's eyes met mine after setting the charts to the side and picking up his phone. She allows you to call her Elena? I thought she preferred Dr. Alvarez. Jake started laughing, then was cut off when he was interrupted on his end of the phone. Colin folded his arms as he studied me with a look that made me swallow the instant lump that formed in my throat. Trying to keep it professional with him was starting to backfire on me if he only knew why I would rather keep it to professional names. He hit the mute button on his phone. You mean to tell me that you're more comfortable with Dr. Mitchell than the guy you'll be helping to guide through a brain-mapping craniotomy? Dr. Mitchell? You mean Jake? I teased, now able to hold my own under his humored yet somewhat baffled expression. Something told me that working with Dr. Colin Brooks was going to be highly enjoyable. Yes, I mean Jake. Dr. Mitchell, Jacob Mitchell. He pulled his phone off mute as he narrowed his eyes at me teasingly, and Jake came back on. Jacob Allen Mitchell, he said with a shit-eating grin. Hey now, Jake came back. Who the hell are you suddenly, my dad? Or has my brother taken full possession of my best friend? It's the name that Elena, pardon me, Dr. Alvarez, just informed me that you prefer. Is this shit true, too? Colin said, pinching his lips and closing his eyes. You're lucky as hell that you're still in the process of trying to keep Elena working for you. So, what shall we all call each other, then? Colin looked at me while I heard Jake sigh on the other end of the phone. I told you, Dr. Alvarez. Jake can call me Elena if he's comfortable with it. We already had that conversation earlier. Colin's lips rose dangerously sexy on one side. Very well, then, Dr. Alvarez. Listen, I hate to interrupt you two already bickering, but I have a very thrilled Mrs. Irene Waller down here. She's getting ready to leave the cardiac unit today, and I told her I'd see if her second favorite doctor would like to come down and say his goodbyes. You tell my spicy little Irene I'm on my way, and that I have a good friend I'm bringing with me, a doctor that I'll be putting her in contact with, too. Should I inform her that it's Dr. Alvarez or Elena who will be joining you and sending her off today? Colin rubbed his forehead. You see the madness this is causing the entire hospital, don't you? He seemed to feign annoyance, while Jake laughed. I see the madness it's causing you. I found my game and rhythm again, and was so grateful to God I had. Colin was fun, and his reactions were priceless. I seriously never expected a neurosurgeon to be this enjoyable. Let's go before we hurt ourselves. Work out your kinks before you both walk onto my hospital floor, please. Jake laughed. Then the line died. I believe I told you that you are playing the wrong doctor, Colin said as he picked up the charts on his desk. You did, I answered as we walked out of his office. Junebug? He handed her the charts. Keep these out, please. Dr. Alvarez and I have a quick visit to make on the cardiac floor, and we'll return in about 30 minutes to make these rounds together. Yes, doctor. Dr. Brooks, I said. I prefer Colin, he said as we walked through the nurse's station, prompting heads to pop up and look at him like he'd lost his damn mind. No, he hadn't lost his mind. 
He was making me probably the most entertained I'd been working in any hospital with and around doctors since my intern days. The man was fun, quirky, and highly intriguing. And even though this whole Dr. Alvarez thing was getting old to even me, I figured it was more enjoyable than not to watch him get a bit flustered that everyone got to call me Elena except for the one man I loved hearing say my name the most. If he only knew I was struggling to keep my professional composure with these sudden hormonal rushes around him, he'd understand exactly why we needed to steer clear of him saying my name in his youthful, sexy voice. His voice that had a certain raspiness that turned me on by that alone. Time would tell how long I'd be able to keep up the doctors and professionalism only basis with him. I was a down-for-whatever kind of gal, and there was undeniable chemistry between us. I could feel it without needing to have more than these small interactions. I could see it in his eyes. Though he teased me with the professionalism stuff, I could tell he wanted more. But how much more? I wasn't afraid of commitment, but who knew how the handsome doctor who turned heads everywhere he went felt about that? That's why I was going to keep him at arm's length and enjoy this for now. Chapter 7 Elena Dr. Brooks and I walked onto the cardiac floor. We were greeted by an extravagant outer waiting room, one of the ones where families could comfortably sit if they were not dealing with a family emergency. I was more than impressed with how the hospital atmosphere at St. John's was fashioned to be relaxed and carried with it a soothing ambiance to keep visitors comfortable and most likely to feel like they were in the atrium of a large, exquisite hotel. I'd seen most of this in pictures, but to be here and experience in person was unreal. We walked down the hall opposite the intensive care floor and turned into a hospital room that matched the exquisite feel of this place. There's my hot tamale. Dr. Brooks said when the patient came into sight. Dr. Colin, the elderly woman who sat on the side of her bed, dressed and ready to leave, said with a smile, You're as handsome as the day you saved my life. I followed Colin and smiled over at who I assumed were her children in the room. That was over a year ago, Irene, he said, sitting next to her on the side of the bed. As I told you then, I'm like a fine wine. I just get better with age. She chuckled and patted his leg. Very original for the witty doctor, I thought with a smile. All this professionalism and hardcore doctor stuff I'd learned in school and experienced in hospitals as an intern faded when I watched Colin bring his arm around the sweet and tiny elderly woman. I could almost imagine this woman to be his grandmother or a great aunt, but she wasn't. His warmth drew everyone to him, and he was such a natural at being a star. I grew more curious by the second about what had happened to her and why she was the patient of both a neurosurgeon and a cardio doctor. She wouldn't budge until she had an opportunity to see you one more time, a woman in her fifties added from across the room. Colin grinned, and Irene's sharp eyebrow arch validated what the woman had said about her. Well, I'm not surprised, Gail, Colin said, glancing to the woman behind him and back to Irene. I believe I told my young crush here that I was owed at least a small turn on the dance floor if she promised to allow Dr. Mitchell to fix her up and get her back on her feet again. Irene smiled over at me. Before I grant you that dance, young man... Is this beautiful young lady my new doctor? Colin's humored expression met mine. She is, he said, and I kept my cool, trying not to fall victim to his eyes and smile again. This sweet interaction between Colin and Dr. Mitchell's patient was enough to make my heart swell. I'd never witnessed a doctor this close and caring of a patient before. It was endearing, to say the very least. She's not talking because she has these moments, you see, Colin said, pulling my mind off of the elderly woman whose makeup was done, complete with bright pink lipstick and matching blush. Moments? I questioned with a smile and walked over to Irene. Hello, Irene, 
I reached out to shake her frail hand. I'm Dr. Alvarez, but you can call me Elena if you'd like. I eyed Colin and smiled. Dr. Brooks has informed me that I am going to be quite fortunate to have you as one of my new patients. Elena, she smirked, eyeing Colin, then bringing her attention back to me. I am happy to meet you. Dr. Mitchell explained a bit about what you'll be doing as my doctor, and I have to say, I might not be your favorite patient. What makes you think so? I asked, teasing back to the sass in her voice. Well, Colin interjected as he arched an eyebrow at the lady. She doesn't like to follow the rules. She was supposed to stay on her medications, but one day she decided she didn't need them anymore. That executive decision led to multiple TIAs and me having to call in the cardiac doc to have a stint put in at the top of the shunt I'd already placed so we can keep my favorite lady around. I just get to the point where it's hard to imagine that I'm 83, she said in defeat. I guess that's why I ignored my doctor's orders. And imagine my despair to know I was about to lose you again. The family remained quiet as Colin and Irene sat side by side on her bed, talking more seriously. I can't go through this again, and if you end up breaking my heart or making me a patient of Dr. Mitchell's, I don't think he or I will ever forgive you. I guess this is where I come in, I said, listening to Colin and Irene communicate. Colin used a serious yet teasing method of trying to keep this sweet woman on her medication and out of the hospital. I could instantly sense her depression when she admitted to accepting that she wasn't a young woman anymore. We'll work together. I want you to remember that it doesn't matter how old we are when it comes to taking medication. Age is most certainly just a number, and that medication is going to keep you feeling great, strong, and as youthful as you believe yourself to be. No, age is not just a number, Dr. Alvarez. She came back still sad and with a hint of annoyance. Colin frowned and studied me, waiting for my response, after I seemed to piss off his patient. This was my specialty, though. My job was to ensure people could psychologically understand and accept a positive outcome to any adverse situation that may have altered their lives. Whether it was the sinking feeling of allowing one's age to spin them out to depression, injury of a car accident, or even paralysis— it was my job as their psychiatrist to help them cope. Helping a neurosurgeon perform a craniotomy was just a bonus of being at a patient's side while helping the surgeon and his patient through that particular process. Perhaps you are correct, I said with an unwavering smile. Some, even younger than I am, believe that they're older than they appear. They even act like it, too. That's impossible. Oh, it's quite common. I smiled at Irene, who was looking to Colin for whatever reason. You'd be surprised at how many young people have wasted their days, plopped onto a couch, lost in the television, napping all day, never wanting to leave the house for some reason or another. Absurd. She sat up and stared at me. She looked back at her family, then to me again. Before this last incident, my kids back there couldn't even keep up with me. I bet, I said. Let me guess. You're not the type to sit around the house and act like you're over a hundred years old like a lot of middle-aged people do. She gave me the most adorable, smug grin. Not a chance, she cackled. I've been all over the globe. I just returned from a trip to Australia to see my oldest boy. I go to Reno all of the time to gamble, and I never miss square dancing nights. That's why age is just a number, I reaffirmed. Maybe one day I can join you on a square dancing event when we get your doctors to approve it. The first square dancing partner she's going to have will be me, Colin said, standing up and turning to offer her his hand. I wanted to take in the reactions from her family behind her, hoping they didn't think I was some crazy psych doctor who was going to have their 80-year-old mother skydiving as soon as the doctors cleared her but I couldn't take my eyes off the sight before me. Colin stood perfectly erect and held Irene as she stood as his ballroom dance partner. It was. Can't help falling in love, wasn't it? 
Colin asked as he took his phone out. Oh, Elvis Presley. I saw him in Las Vegas once. She looked at me. Dr. Brooks promised me a turn around the dance floor if I followed his orders in the hospital. She smiled. This was mine and my late husband's song. The only man I'll allow to take Clancy's place is my sweetheart, Colin here. As Colin set his phone to play the song, I smiled as I watched him ease her around the small area next to her bed. The rest of us in the room must have vanished, leaving the doctor and his adorable patient dancing together in their own world. I watched as Irene held on to Colin's hand and waist, closed her eyes, and began to sing her and her husband's song. I could tell she must have been imagining dancing with her husband, and not the handsome neurosurgeon who was leading her to the beautiful love song. She's a firecracker, the woman who walked around to me said. I'm Janice, her youngest daughter. This is my oldest sister, Gail. Both women were meticulously dressed and quaffed, and their air told me they were a very proper and wealthy family. This is our little brother, Wyatt. Our oldest brother, Miles, left before you both arrived. He's working with the medical staff to make sure Mom's place is set up for in-home care with her new nurse. She won't move in with family? I softly asked, as the two continued to dance in a way that made me want to learn more about Colin. Not just inside of work, but outside of the hospital, too. I mean, who wouldn't fall hard for this man? He had the looks to call for that alone. But this softer and more loving side, I would have never imagined. She would never move in with any of us, Gail chimed in. She's far too independent for that. We interviewed numerous in-home health nurses who would be willing to stay with her, and we finally settled on one that Mom fell in love with. That's nice to hear, I said. Do all of you live here locally? Only me, Janice said. I live about 20 minutes away from Mom in Burbank. Our dad passed 15 years ago. He worked in television, and Mom loved every bit of that crazy life they had with the after-hours parties, award shows, you name it. She's still in the house where we grew up and has friends who still like to cut the rug with her. She chuckled. I don't want her to lose that youthfulness in her spirit, I said. How do all of you feel about her still holding on to that? It's the best thing for her, Wyatt interjected. This last round of mini strokes that sent her to the ER gave all of us a scare. Thank God that Dr. Brooks was on call since she was already his patient from before. My God, that's terrifying, I said truthfully. And how did he determine she stopped taking her meds? Gail laughed and nodded toward where Colin finished their dance with a graceful twirl and a dip. That man can get her to spill the beans on just about everything. He's truly the best. Outside of me, of course, Dr. Mitchell said as he entered the room in his scrubs and fresh out of some surgery given the medical cap he was wearing. The two heartbreakers, Irene giggled. Get over here, Jacob. She held out her hands as Dr. Brooks walked over to Jake, took her charts, and pulled out his pen. I'm going to miss these handsome faces. Thank you, sweetheart, she said as Colin intently studied her charts, then flipped the page and started writing his notes. Let's keep it at this. If you want to see your favorite doctors again, invite us over for dinner, Jake said, accepting her hug. My son just celebrated his first birthday, and I'm sure he'll love tearing up your place like he does mine. Irene laughed as her kids walked over to grab their purses and Irene's personal belongings. Well, Dr. Colin, Jake said, is she able to go home and be transferred into the care of the lovely Elena? She is, Colin said, scribbling more on the charts before looking up. You and I will have another turn on the dance floor next week on a follow-up appointment in my office. At that time, I will work with Dr. Alvarez, as her schedule will start filling up fairly quickly. Her office is still under a small renovation, but she'll be right next to mine if, for any reason, she may need my assistance with any of the patients we share. Which means, Irene, Dr. Mitchell said, his dark blue eyes mischievous. If you give Elena any trouble then your mean doctor will come rushing in to bust you. He crossed his arms and smiled. I'm the nice one, remember? Hospital gossip, Irene said, 
The five-foot-tall woman stood in front of these two GQ model-looking men, their muscular build highlighted by their scrubs. That's all. I love you both. She grew serious. And I thank you both. She looked at me. I think you and I will have fun together, especially if your office is close to Collins. Maybe we'll give him a hard time together. She winked, and then her family helped guide her from her two favorite surgeons. I'm finishing up on the release orders right now, Dr. Brooks said. Follow them, please. I look forward to meeting your new in-home nurse next week at your follow-up. Any questions for me or Dr. Mitchell before we turn you loose and back into the human population again? As Irene and her kids asked a few questions to both doctors, I stared at Colin. At this moment in time, I didn't know what to think of the man. Never before had I been at a loss for words, my heart somehow feeling it would take the lead over my mind. Relationships happened between medical professionals often, and so did fun and straightforward affairs. I wished I thought the man was only flirting with me after his constant teasing and the way his smile broadened and eyes sparkled when we were playful from our day of interacting. But I wasn't foolish or naive. I felt Colin might have seen something in me that night we first met, the night that I first lost myself in the most striking set of blue eyes I'd ever seen, when he spun me around to face him after coming from out of nowhere on the dance floor. I would be a fool to turn the man down after witnessing what I had today, and I knew it. Was I afraid of him breaking my heart? Well, no one wants to be crushed after allowing themselves to take a chance on someone, but I was raised to get up when I fell and to walk off the pain. My parents didn't raise their children to be sensitive and crumble. They raised the three of us to be bold, daring, and live every day as if it were our last. And that's how I saw life. I loved life. And I wasn't afraid of loving hard, no matter the cost. Was I in love with Colin Brooks? No, but I was fascinated by the man. Right now, I wanted to be a good, close friend with the doctor. I loved this part of first meeting people, the fun, less complicated side of everything. I knew these thoughts were only in my head because of how we both seemed to fit together. I could see it in his eyes as solidly as I felt it in my mind. We clicked, and we would work well as a team. One thing was sure, though— he would continue to refer to me as Dr. Alvarez until I was able to hold my own against the way my name sounded coming out of his mouth. We didn't need me drooling over the doctor, or like I was now, watching him and Jake banter back and forth, lost in these thoughts. I had to get all of this out of my system and get myself under control, or I wouldn't be an asset to his team. I'd be the giggly goof, sitting there in surgery while Dr. Brooks depended on me to help him during high-pressure surgeries. Here I was putting Colin in his place by insisting we keep it professional with the doctor formalities. Little did he know, it wasn't Colin who I couldn't trust on the first-name basis stuff. It was myself. Chapter 8 Colin The day had finally ended, and if it weren't for Jake's heads-up text— I would have completely forgotten that I was supposed to meet up with the guys at Kinder's tonight. Since being in Elena's presence on Monday, the fact that I'd lost two days in the week was somewhat strange to me. The time flew by, and here I was on the eve of Jamie's surgery and mine and Elena's first surgical experience together since she accepted the job. She was already stacked with appointments, and that didn't surprise me in the slightest. Elena was charming and a brilliant light that couldn't be put out. Everyone wanted to be in her presence, and that included me. I took a step back, though, after having her at my side all day on Monday. I knew she needed to shine on her own, and she did that without even trying. Did I still fantasize about the woman as I had since the day I met her? Hell yes. In fact, I hadn't turned my attention toward another woman since the first dance we'd shared in Vegas. I guessed that my best friends believed I was taking some personal challenge in not dating, but the reasoning for it they'd never believe, and I didn't give a shit. That's the file on Mrs. Johnson, 
I said to Patty. I'm out until Monday. Thanks again for moving my patients around for the surgery tomorrow. Never a problem, Colin, Patty answered with her dimpled smile. I bet Jamie is nervous, but I know she's elated to have you fix the issues finally. She deserves the freedom from the pain and the pain meds she's been living on, I answered, signing off on one last prescription for Mrs. Johnson. This needs to be sent off, and I want Mrs. Johnson to call the hospital if she feels the slightest dizziness after taking her first dose. She understood that after I talked to her, but make sure the pharmacist relays that vital information for me, please. I hope this helps with her seizures, she said. I leaned against the counter that faced the center of the office floor. Ten doctors shared this common area, and all of us worked the neuro floor in the main hospital of St. John's. I'd previously spoken with the hospital board about closing things off a bit to allow our patients and personal secretaries a bit more privacy. Things could easily get chaotic in this open environment, whether the neurologists, psychiatrists, surgeons, or therapists were sort of our own unit or not. Some days, like today, this place was more congested than the hospital, and it made for a tense environment for patients whose diseases varied and required a quieter and calmer atmosphere. Don't get me wrong, I loved this spot, the teams I worked with, and my office, but we needed to do something with patients being called back on intercoms and staff being called out the same way. It was a goddamn circus at times, and today was one of those days that all of us were in here working with only two up in the hospital. It was a madhouse, and I was shocked that Patty didn't go into labor just juggling shit around all day. Not only was she dealing with my patients, but until Elena hired herself a secretary, she was dealing with Elena's, too. You need to go home and get your feet up and stop worrying about our friends, Miss Tao, I teased. I swear you worry more about the patients than you do little Colin. I eyed her large stomach and grinned at her. You think it's a boy, eh? she asked, swiveling around in her chair. And that I'd actually name my firstborn son after you? Of course I do, I teased. He's heard nothing but my wisdom for the past nine months. You might as well name the little fellow after the most intelligent man he's ever had the privilege of listening to. You're too much, Dr. Brooks, Patty answered, typing the script in her computer to send off to the pharmacy. And if it's a girl? Colin seems to love the name Elena. I heard the voice of the one woman who found a way to speak straight to my heart without even knowing she did. I say, if he's all about naming your baby, we stick to his selfish ideas, Patty. I twisted to lean and smile at the beautiful ray of sunshine that filled this part of the office. Selfish? Me? You've lost your mind, Alvarez. You are a selfish man. Elena raised her eyebrows at me and filed her papers off to the side. Patty, don't worry about these until tomorrow. Go home, put your feet up, and relax. I believe I already gave her that order. I arched an eyebrow at the bronze eyes that stole my breath away. Then she's under two doctor's orders. She grinned, and I was done. I pulled my bottom lip between my teeth and enjoyed taking in the portrait of perfection, beauty, and cheer. God, I was a patient man. Until her. After leaving Patty to finish up her work and Elena, giving me the privilege of watching her float down the hallway to her office, conveniently located next to mine, with poise and grace, I decided to pack it up and head out to my car. After tucking away Jamie's file and most recent scans, I pulled on my suit jacket, shouldered my leather work bag, and left the office through the side door. While I fiddled with my keys, I went back in my mind to Elena's and my previous meeting with Jamie and her family. We'd fully prepped Jamie for her craniotomy. I'd be back at the hospital at four in the morning and ready to do what I did best, go after issues most doctors would naturally shy away from. This surgery would be a challenge, but instead of allowing challenges to play with my mind, I welcomed them, heart and soul. Case in point, Elena Alvarez. Aside from the woman who was testing my patience more than I imagined possible, I had to admit I thrived on situations that those in neuroscience referred to as breakthroughs for our work field. 
Brain lesions weren't necessarily a breakthrough in science, but any form of a craniotomy while being so close to the brain's vital areas was critical. These lesions were seemingly too close to her memory receptors and her fine motor skills. One small fuck-up, and I could wreck Jamie's life, and my new neuropsychiatrist would be working with Jamie on a whole new level. Like anyone, neurosurgeons made their fair share of mistakes, but in all my years, one case would never leave my mind. The act was perpetrated by a chief surgeon from a previous hospital while I was an intern, and it made me sick to recall how greedy the doctor was. He was so sure of himself and so fucking cocky that he stopped listening to the doctor who was working with his patient during the craniotomy, and he kept going after the poor woman's tumor as if it were his to conquer. The motherfucker ruined that woman's life that day. And instead of allowing that man to destroy my outlook on being a neurosurgeon, it pushed me harder to become a better one, one who wouldn't put my aspirations of being the best above the well-being of my patient. I wanted to be the kind of physician who could put his ego aside and know when to quit, and especially when to listen to those helping me in surgeries like a craniotomy. Did I want Jamie's lesions never to return? abso fucking lutely I also wouldn't dare go farther than Elena would guide me and risk any damage to my patient. If I removed these damn things entirely, Jamie would never have to return for a craniotomy again. Nice car, I heard Elena say when I finally reached my vehicle. I glanced up to see her smile beam under the lights of the covered garage. Damn, you are beautiful, I said, finally outside of a professional environment and alone with the woman who stole my heart away and seemingly had no plan to give it back either. She playfully pulled her hair out of the loose bun she always wore, giggled, and flipped her long black hair around like she was being filmed for a shampoo and conditioner commercial. I get that a lot. Her eyes widened playfully as she walked up to where I'd reclined against the newest car I'd added to my sports car collection. Only a fool would think otherwise. So, I folded my arms, mirroring the sassy way she stood in front of me. When are you going to finally let me prove that I'm the man of your dreams? Who says you already haven't, Dr. Brooks? She teased with her smile. The fact that we're still on this doctor nonsense, I smirked. You're wasting precious days without being able to come home with me each night. She covered her smile, and I loved it when I said something that painted her cheeks pink. What if I wanted you to come home with me? And get my ass kicked by your dad? Hard pass, I returned. She rolled her eyes. A man who's all talk and no walk. Bullshit. I lifted my chin and held her gaze. I believe you've seen the walk, Alvarez. Nope, she answered. You may be the best and most attractive neurodoc I've ever met, but you're scared shitless to come home to see what my dad has to say about you as my boyfriend. Your brother and I have an agreement, and I'll be there next week, I returned. That's cheating, Brooks, she said. You're coming over as my brother's friend and not Miguel's daughter's strappingly hot doctor boyfriend. All right, you got me there, I answered. Why can't we just start slow? Slow? She answered. I swear this woman did nothing but smile and vibrantly interact with everyone she came across, and it made me crave her presence. Talking to her again made me feel like an addict getting their fix. Yeah, like eating at a taco truck or something, I asked. Her eyes widened. You know taco trucks are my thing, right? Then I'm your man, I answered truthfully, hoping to rope her into doing something with me. Possibly, but I don't do the whole... She waved her hand over my new McLaren. You know, the car is making up for something the dude doesn't have. Overcompensation, I believe, is the proper term. I choked out a laugh. What the hell does that mean? This car is obviously one that you bought for performance, correct? And I have quite a few others you might disapprove of as well. This one I enjoy for commuting. 
But its performance is why you bought it? It's the only reason I drive sports cars. Yeah, makes sense, Dr. Brooks, she smirked. Your car is making up for your performance issues. Now that's something you'd have to judge after riding in my car and back to my place. I don't date doctors, she finally said. I don't either. Never have. Then why all the games? Because they're not games, Dr. Alvarez. I don't see you as solely a doctor. I see you as the woman I will spend the rest of my life with. I studied her as she almost nervously ran her thumb over her bottom lip. It was a gesture I noticed two days ago, something she did when I brought her into consultations, and she was deeply considering the answers. Does that scare the shit out of you? She twisted her lips up and recovered the slight nervousness I'd sensed. No, nothing scares me, she boldly proclaimed. Then what's the holdup? You and I have chemistry, and you know it. I see it in your eyes. Good God, man, she laughed loudly, that lovely, delightful laugh that lit her face. We hardly know each other. That's why I want to take you on a date to a fucking taco truck. She exhaled, cocking her head to the side, as she looked at me with the most adorable face. It was like she was loving every second of this, and she had no intention of turning me down. I could sense that from a mile away. Tempting because I'm starved, but Dad texted me, and he's making one of his Cuban delights for dinner tonight. I stepped forward. Enough of the silly back and forth. I had to do something to stop this woman from being hung up on me being only a doctor when, even though that was true, I was also a human man, a man who had been shot by Cupid's arrow and had mysteriously fallen for this Cuban goddess. She stood completely still as I reached my hand up and gently took a piece of her soft hair in my hand and tucked it behind her ear. I was keenly aware, watching and hearing everything, that her breathing had fallen out of rhythm as I gently allowed my fingertips to run down the side of her neck. I'll see you in the morning, Alvarez, I said, trying to win her over with a touch of charm. She had no idea how desperately I wanted to pull her into my arms. The soft moan from her and her eyes, which were now dazed, made this interaction more torturous for me than her. My cock could attest to that. It'll be a big day for you, me, and our patient. It will, she answered. I will be ready. I do not doubt that, I answered, stepping back, needing to cool it down for my own good. Where's your car? I'll drive you over to it, or walk you. On the other side of yours. I get doctor parking, too, she chuckled. Then get plenty of rest. Give your dad and brother my best. Perhaps you and I will celebrate our first successful surgery tomorrow night at the taco truck of your choosing. You're that sure of yourself with this brain surgery, she asked. I'm sure of you, I answered, and then turned to get into the car. Tomorrow night, Alvarez. She smiled, shook her head, and then walked in front of my car and over to hers. I took a glance at the vehicle she had been more impressed with than mine, and I smirked to see it was a white Land Rover. Overcompensating indeed, I thought with a laugh. She enjoyed some fine luxuries herself, and here I was starting to feel like somewhat of a douche with my high-performance sports car. I backed out and called Jake knowing I was late to meet up with the guys. These nights were pretty much our midweek guys blowing off steam sessions. A nice dinner, a few drinks, and teasing the hell out of each other is what we lived for. Tonight was probably going to be the discussion about the whens and wheres of Jim and Avery's wedding. Who knew? Our conversations lately ranged from the mundane to news none of us ever saw coming. This night would be no different. Chapter 9 Elena My night was restless, and it wasn't because I was anxiously awaiting Jamie's surgery. 
I was more eager than I expected to help that young woman get her life back. But that wasn't what was weighing on my mind. What started my spiral into a sleepless night was my little brother, acting like a spoiled four-year-old about Dad selling the house. Dad wouldn't divulge any extra information about his particular reasons for moving. And the truth was that he was a grown-ass, retired man who could move to Japan if he so wished. He certainly didn't deserve to be questioned by anyone in his family, especially his son, who wouldn't just fall out of the damn nest and learn to fly on his own. Mom and Dad let Stevie get away with too much shit, and now Dad was dealing with the fallout. Stevie didn't have the memories that Lydia and I had from the Malibu ranch. That was where we learned to ride horses, forced to ride, in Lydia's case, and participated in equestrian events. We enjoyed every second of our slice of paradise, with countless acres to explore and play. It was every kid's dream. But why would an aspiring DJ care about any of that? My brother was such a little idiot sometimes, and I certainly wasn't in the mood to stay up late and calm down the two bulls who were locking horns about this topic all night. So, I left them grumbling in the living room while I headed to bed. And that's when the last three days of falling harder and harder for Colin's charms decided to plague my mind. Watching the man, even in passing, was enough to make me drool. I watched him on the hospital floors, and then spent the last two days watching him move around our beautiful office. Colin was cocky as hell, that was certain. But what was surprising was that he was even more compassionate than he was arrogant. That was a hidden gem that I wasn't anticipating, and I couldn't get past it. Something was sparking up between us. He knew it, and I knew it. But I was the one pumping the brakes on him, until tonight. Tonight, I finally had given in and allowed my feelings, which were growing more rapidly than they should have, to come to the surface. It was true that we hardly knew each other, and we'd only started working together three flipping days ago, but I'd never felt more drawn to a man in my life. This was different than all of my other romantic experiences. I couldn't explain how, but it was 100% undeniable. And every time I wanted to shut off the emotions, Colin and I wound up face to face, and he conjured them right back up again. Oddly enough, it felt like the brain surgeon was already in my brain and manipulating it in ways I couldn't understand. So, on my path to destroying a perfectly solid night's sleep, I decided to press him, to flirt back with him, and to feel the gentle touch of his fingertips as they slid down the side of my neck. That, coupled with his eyes, his seriousness, and being half a second away from reaching up to feel his full lips on mine, finally letting the crisp scent of his masculine cologne seep into my senses, was the reason I woke up every thirty minutes throughout the night. Hornier than hell, too. Jesus, what I wouldn't do to feel his fingertips soothing my clit that seemed to throb at the thought of how it would all go down, having him in bed with me. I'd been single long enough, and I was dangerously close to thinking that if we just had sex and got it out of the way, maybe we could both get on with our lives as usual. Unfortunately, the fantasies that had held me hostage all week told me that getting on with life as usual was not in the cards for either one of us. Now and then in life, we come across someone we know is meant to be a significant part of our lives, and Colin was one of those people for me. Call it kismet, fate, or fortune. Whatever it was, it was beyond either of our control. I'd had plenty of coffee before arriving at the hospital. I wanted to quickly check on Jamie before I worked with the staff to help set up the OR for Dr. Brooks to do the craniotomy with his attending neurosurgeon, Dr. Nathan, and the entire team we met with yesterday afternoon to prep for Jamie's surgery this morning. Thank God for this line of work, and today's surgery, because it wasn't less than three seconds on the floor, and I was in surgery prep mode. As I expected, Jamie was nervous and ready to get this over. It was a typical reaction to having an awake craniotomy, and I reassured her that Dr. Brooks would ensure that this six-hour, give or take, surgery 
would move safely, and she'd be walking out of here tomorrow after Colin cleared her. Once again, I was highly impressed with how efficiently and smoothly this team worked to prepare the surgical room and the patient for the doctor to do his job. Colin's voice announced his entrance to the room, and I was greeted with a confident smile, as if this critical surgery was like everyday walking and talking for him. His presence kept the room's atmosphere calm, yet charged with an energy of confidence that radiated through everyone. I watched the image guidance screen that Colin had used to make his marks. He used the equipment to help lock Jamie's head in a vice to prevent her from moving when the anesthesiologist was ready to wake her to work with me. He made smaller-than-usual cuts with such precision that there would be no scarring when he was done. Colin, the surgeon, was a completely different individual in his OR. I could quickly tell this man didn't bullshit his way through or around anything. He had the most advanced technology giving me and him the 3D images of Jamie's brain to watch, as well as the functioning MRI which was telling me and the doctors in the room precisely where certain areas were being stimulated. At the same time, he would probe around on her brain while she and I would talk. Everyone's brain was different, and that's the fascinating thing about brains and the human mind. One's speech may be in a particular area of the frontal lobe, and it could be in a completely different area of another person's frontal lobe. That's why we were in here, and Colin was now calling for the anesthesiologists to wake up our sweet Jamie. I smiled, holding different picture images for her to tell me about when her eyes fluttered open, and she stared at me in confusion. Hey, Jamie, I said. It's nice to see you again. Her eyes widened with a bit of fear. That was normal, given she would still be a bit loopy, and her head was locked in a vice, as opposed to how she was positioned before they put her under. Where's Dr. Brooks? She asked with some paranoia as I reached for her fidgeting hands. Right behind you, Colin said, eyes staring through the computer magnifier and working on probing around the troubled lesion in her brain. I know you want to see my handsome face, but Dr. Alvarez, sitting at your side, has decided to do all the easy stuff. She smiled and calmed some, her eyes sliding back over to where I stood. That's right. She answered. I'm having brain surgery. That you are. Colin looked at me as my eyes flicked from Jamie to the computer screens the neurologists were carefully studying, displaying each cut, clip, and electronic probe Dr. Brooks was doing on Jamie's brain. And I'm looking at Elena. She smiled sweetly at me when my eyes went back to hers. That must be wonderful. I have to know something, Jamie. Colin said as I watched him probing around the frontal lobe area. What does it feel like to wake up and the first thing you see are the beautiful eyes of Dr. Alvarez? I forgot the color. Remind me, would you please? Her glossy eyes dazzled as I looked at Dr. Brooks to shake my head for him to stay clear of the area where he was working. Hazel? She said, somewhat confused. Hazel it is. Just like my great-grandmother's name. Colin answered. I held up a card, showing a picture of a shoe, and asked Jamie if she could tell me what she saw. I could instantly recognize her discomfort. This was a blatant reminder that we were in brain surgery. Dr. Brooks was doing so well in ensuring everyone in the room was comfortable and moving through this surgery flawlessly. And here I was, acting like a robot fresh out of an internship, with the basic cards to keep our patient talking. Good grief. Colin said with a laugh. Why are we looking at oversized flashcards, Dr. Alvarez? Jamie laughed. Her name is Elena. Elena? She questioned while I watched Colin, working extremely close to her temporal lobe where the largest lesion had grown toward. The area bordered the frontal lobe, where Colin worked with her cognitive skills a moment ago. The frontal lobe was where he had to be extremely careful, given I was mapping him around these two areas where her speech, cognitive skills, and responses were located, not to mention her memories. Now, we needed to get her talking about something, while Colin worked within millimeters of where her memories could be altered if he got too close to that part of her brain. Yes, Elena. A beautiful name. 
even more beautiful than my great-grandmother's, Colin said. Elena, she repeated, as I continued to nod and communicated with Colin to assure him we were in a safe area for him to work on this lesion. You remind me of Elena from the vampire... She stopped speaking, and I shook my head to Colin to let him know that his device had mapped the location of her speech, which cut her off mid-sentence. Colin nodded and moved away from that area. Vampires? Colin asked. Like Dracula? Are you saying that Elena reminds you of one of the Count's beautiful blood-sucking creatures? He chuckled. The vampire diaries? She laughed, too. Interesting, Colin said while I smiled at her. That's a huge compliment, I said, after Colin gave me a look that said he'd let me know when he was sure of the location where he could safely operate. I love Elena in that show. I love her too, Jamie said. Why am I just now hearing about your love for vampires? Colin asked. I found it fascinating that he could operate and hold an actual conversation instead of needing silence to focus, given how close he was to these critical locations in Jamie's brain. You would have laughed at me before, Jamie said with a grin. And do you think I'm not laughing now? Colin answered. So that you know, you'll remember all of these confessions after you wake up from surgery. I love Damon, I added, knowing we had to keep Jamie talking because Colin was now making cuts and clamping off certain blood vessels. I love how Damon loves Elena. So, who's the vampire? Colin asked. The lovely Elena or this Damon joker? Damon, Jamie said. Sometimes Elena. Sometimes a vampire, sometimes not. Interesting, Colin added. And does this lovely Elena share Damon's love in this vampire show? No spoilers. You'll have to watch it someday. Jamie laughed. Maybe he can binge watch it on a day off and find out. I love Damon's icy blue eyes, I said. Icy blue eyes, Colin asked. Like yours. Jamie answered. Ah, Colin answered, and I certainly wasn't disagreeing with our patient, who was confessing that she loved a vampire television show. Given this vampire has the same beautiful eyes as I have, and we have an Elena in the room, I might have to ask her out. Elena doesn't like Damon in the beginning, Jamie said as Colin continued to work, and the room chuckled to her response. He's too pushy, I think. I said, though extremely handsome. Sometimes, it's not about icy blue eyes and looks alone, Colin said, then turned to a nurse for suction and another tool. He was moving to the area with Jamie's fine motor skills. So, vampires are usually cold, since they are dead, Colin said with sarcasm. Can you tell me if our Elena has deathly cold hands, Jamie? I reached over and held Jamie's hand and shook my head, knowing that somehow Colin was about to turn this talking and awake brain surgery experience into some Colin and Elena vampire show. Nice and warm, Jamie said. Go ahead and squeeze my hand. I watched Colin as he mapped around where her second lesion was on her parietal lobe. Nice, I said, nodding at Colin and giving him the clear on this area. Can you hold your hand up for me, Jamie? Colin asked. She couldn't, and everyone in the room knew that this was an area he had to stay away from. Nope. It doesn't sparkle, does it, Dr. Alvarez? Sparkle? Jamie laughed. Those are different vampires. Aren't they all the same? He questioned, working diligently in this area of her brain. Hardly, I answered with a wink to Jamie. As we said, we like Damon and his icy blue eyes. Like yours, Dr. Brooks. Jamie smiled at me. Are you wanting to be in surgery all day, Dr. Alvarez? Colin asked, working closely with the nurse to gather instruments. I need the magnifier shifted to the left, please. He requested. She's doing a great job, Jamie said. Ignore him. Colin reached for another instrument, gave me a quick, knowing look, and then looked back to Jamie's brain. Dr. Alvarez understands that if she distracts me, we'll be in here all day with me having great difficulty trying to focus. We're just down here stating vampire facts, I said. I thought vampires sparkled. Twilight vampires sparkle, 
If you really want to be here all day, we can go into all the different vampires. I added with a laugh. You thought vampires were Dracula's ladies, too, Jamie answered. That's how I always saw them. The Count was the reason they multiplied. I am just now learning that vampires aren't in love with the big guy with no heart. Strange. Colin was back and working closely on the lesion where her memories were again. The brain was so complex, and each one of them so different. Being in here and helping a surgeon map out one for multiple lesions was even more fascinating. Vampires? Jamie questioned. To the left, I said to Colin, seeing his attention was solely focused on fixing this last lesion. You remember we were talking about how hot Damon is, but he was too pushy with the beautiful Elena, I said, teasing Colin and knowing he was trying to get this lesion fully repaired, but it was too close to the memory location of the temporal lobe. Colin remained silent while Jamie looked at me in confusion. How is it a man can be too pushy when it comes to a beautiful woman, especially when her name is... What was her name again? Colin asked while I prayed that she remembered. This was the do-or-die moment for this lesion, and if Jamie couldn't recall things right now, he'd have to abandon that area completely. Elena, she finally said. What happened? Colin is jealous of Damon, I smirked. Oh, she laughed. I thought I did something wrong. You're doing everything right. Just keep talking to our Elena and we'll keep moving along, Colin said. I could hear the nurse, Colin, the other surgeon, and the others talking, but I was fixated on the fact that, somehow, we got lucky. With Colin's steady hand and patience, he was nailing this lesion and repairing the most problematic one. He was a prodigy, and there was no doubting that fact, even if his broad knowledge of all things vampire royally sucked. Jamie and I talked about Vampire Diaries episodes, and I laughed when Colin grew tired of hearing about Damon's eyes. I even tried to change the subject to her talking about her wedding plans, but she wouldn't have it, and I loved that. Well, I guess your fiancé is going to have to blame Dr. Alvarez for whatever I messed up in your surgery. It must have happened at the beginning. He teased with a laugh after Jamie refused to talk about her wedding. He didn't mess anything up. I laughed while he and Jamie argued about the wedding stuff. No? Colin pressed. I figured you two ladies would be filling me in on wedding plans for Jamie this entire time. But instead, I'm hearing about doppelgangers and witch weddings. The witch wedding happened, Jamie insisted. I remember it. It was a horrible scene, to be honest, I added. The horrible scene will be when you wake up and your handsome fiancé who doesn't have this drop-dead gorgeous vampire's icy blue eyes, finds out you'd rather talk witchy weddings than your own. My colors are silver and blue, she told me with a smile. You're in trouble, young lady, Colin said. You're marrying poor Paul while you're in love with a vampire. Wait, Paul isn't a vampire, is he? Colin nodded toward me to signal that he was finishing three hours ahead of time, after all of us going on and on for the last four hours. All Jamie's lesions had been repaired, and that was only due to Colin's steady hand and constantly watching me for locations he could or couldn't get anywhere near. I don't even think my dad would have had the skilled precision of that man, pressing himself to the limits and trusting me to guide his hand by watching the computer models, as well as talking with Jamie. Most doctors would have gone in hard and fast to repair the lesion in such a critical area, or they would have abandoned it and waited to see if the patient felt any different when they woke up. Not once did I see either of those temptations in Colin. We mapped her brain down to the closest areas, and I wanted to jump up and shout in the victory that we'd done so well and pulled off what I would deem the impossible. But I kept my cool. Just as Colin called for the anesthesiologists to return Jamie to sedation so that he could stitch her back up, I smiled over at the man who was hard at work and as cool as a freaking cucumber. This was second nature to him. I could sense that a mile away. Colin requested they turn on Bob Seeger songs for what I assumed was his wrap-it-up music, and I couldn't wipe the smile off my face if I wanted to. Dr. Colin Brooks was perfection. 
and I was definitely down for celebrating tonight at the taco truck he mentioned the previous night. This was my first surgery, and I was damn proud at how well we all did. It was crazy how I felt since it didn't match the vibes of the room. Everyone was still working on their ends of the craniotomy, and I was sitting here feeling an adrenaline rush as I focused on Jamie's vital monitors. I felt like confetti should fall from the ceiling, and I couldn't help but laugh at the fact that I was such a newbie. I didn't care. I knew this cheesy grin would stay plastered on my face for the rest of the day and night. Hell yes. We did it, Dr. Colin Brooks. We were a team, and I wouldn't change the fact that I worked with the best neurodoc I'd ever seen. He made my love for this job grow to heights I didn't know existed. To see a calm, fun, patient, and skilled man work in perfection was simply amazing to me. What a guy. That's all I could conclude. This man rendered me speechless, and after we walked out of this room, I knew I wouldn't be able to hold up this flirty front with him. All I knew was that adrenaline was pumping in my veins, and I couldn't be prouder to work with such an incredible neuro team. Chapter 10 Elena Strangely, the only thing to get a stunned reaction out of Colin after a day in the hospital, performing a highly successful craniotomy, was me asking him when he planned to take me on our date to the taco truck. The man reacted as I'd reacted in the OR when he managed to get both lesions fixed in Jamie's brain. His smile was plastered from ear to ear. Unlike Colin, I remained in my scrubs, since I didn't keep a change of clothes in my office, and I had to pull my shit together when he walked out of his, wearing a pair of jeans and a snug v-neck sweater, the burgundy color making his blue eyes pop even more than usual. I followed his badass sports car to Long Beach, shocked that we didn't stick around the downtown Los Angeles area, but Colin swore by this particular taco truck, and I wasn't going to argue. We arrived and ordered our food before driving to a more secluded area where Colin found us a bench to share closer to the beach. We sat in comfortable silence, eating our food and listening to the waves rolling into the shore across the street from where we sat. Damn, these tacos are the best I've ever had, I finally said as I went in for another carnitas taco out of the bag. Told you, he said between bites of the large-ass burrito he ordered. It's the seasonings they use, and I love their green salsa. It makes it worth the drive to Long Beach. You live around here? I asked. No, he answered with a smile. I have a place in Malibu. Oh, yeah? My dad is selling my childhood home and moving to our family ranch in Malibu. When he retired, he said something about going to Malibu so he can enjoy the ocean again. Yes, I laughed. That is the current family drama that I'm dealing with at home. Colin crumbled up the foil from his now-devoured burrito and reclined back with his bottled water in hand. Drama in the Alvarez family? He questioned. I definitely couldn't see that ever happening. I nudged him with a laugh, my mouth full of the last bite of my taco. Getting off the subject of my family issues? How'd you find out about this place? You don't seem like the Long Beach kind of guy. Did you date some hottie who lived here? Colin smirked. Jake and I love to surf. It's our way of decompressing sometimes. You surf? I asked, drinking from the glass Coke bottle I ordered. Have since I was a boy. You name the beach, and Jake and I most likely have surfed it. He draped his arm up over the back of the bench. What about you, Miss Cuban Floridian goddess of mine? I practically choked on the carbonation I was downing from my soda bottle. Pardon me? He chuckled. It's what I call you, he stated factually. I'm not yours. Changing the subject again, Colin? I exhaled. My eyes turned back to the beach because I knew that if I didn't look somewhere else, I was going to kiss him and prove how much I loved hearing that sentiment come out of his mouth. Colin, you say? He perked up. As in, we're finally on a first-name basis? I'm in scrubs, so I'm still Dr. Alvarez. I teased. You changed into civilian clothing, so I can call you Colin. Oh, come on, Colin said, smiling over at me with a look of annoyance on his face. 
I'm starting to believe you're one of those obsessed doctors now. What? I looked at him in confusion. Yeah, the assholes with a doctor complex. He poked my leg teasingly. That's not what I'm doing, and I don't have a complex. I answered. Listen, another subject change, but I wanted to tell you that you were awesome today. Honestly, I wanted to jump up and scream with excitement at how well you performed a surgery that most doctors might not have handled as you did. Well, funny that you should say so, because I usually prefer to end all of my surgeries with such fanfare, so you should have done so. He answered with a cheeky grin. It would have actually made me believe I finally impressed you. Our taco truck date didn't prove that to you? I knew that was going to happen, he said. I already asked you on this date last night. I shook my head. What made you go into this profession? I know it wasn't money. I see you've stalked me out and found I was born with a silver spoon in my mouth. He smirked, and damn it if he didn't continue to look sexier and sexier with each passing moment. Possibly, I lied. Everyone knew about Dr. Colin Brooks, the famous neurosurgeon, and son of the late and gifted architect, John Brooks. Well, everyone who was in our profession, I guess. Colin's father came from old money, as they say, and aside from John Brooks having a stellar reputation, his net worth of billions was well-earned. I'm just wondering if St. John's was named after the famous architect who designed its renovation. Colin shook his head smiled, and then looked out to the white foam waves in the ocean. My dad was a lot of things, rest his soul, but he was no saint. However, he was arrogant enough to wish the hospital was named after him. I'm sorry for your loss, by the way, I said. I heard about it from my dad. He said you seemed to accept it better than Dr. Mitchell, though. We all grieve differently, he said, becoming more introspective at that moment and I instantly felt terrible for saying anything. I apologize. I didn't mean it to sound like Dr. Mitchell cared more about your father than you. That came out completely wrong. I spoke out of turn. No, please. Don't apologize for that, Colin said with a laugh and a look that made me tingle from head to toe, even through my embarrassment. I understood what you meant. And to be clear, I was devastated about my father. There were many factors leading up to his death that didn't make his passing a complete shock to me, though. That is to say that some people die suddenly and unexpectedly. My father had been sick for years, which doesn't make his passing any less tragic to my mother or me. But, on some level, I had been slowly accepting that it was inevitable. That being said, his death affected Jake much harder because Jake lost him on his table. We were both on call that night, but when Dad stroked... He was going down faster than any paramedics could handle. Then, if it wasn't enough, the ER staff sent him straight to Jake's OR, and it was chaos. Oh my God, I said in shock. That's horrible. Dad had it coming, and we all knew it, Colin answered. Jake knew it too. It was no one's fault. The ER didn't mess up by not sending him to me first. Dad's heart was failing and was the immediate killer in his situation. It just fucking sucks because Jake had him and saved his heart. But he went into renal failure and everything started shutting down. You know how it goes? It just all landed on Jake. He thought he could do more. Jake blamed himself? I asked, confused. Colin looked at me. Jake is close with all of his patients. And if he loses them, he goes down pretty hard for a day or so. My dad was like a father to Jake and his brother Jim after their father died so feeling responsible coupled with deep grief is never an easy thing to swallow. Jake may seem like he's solid as stone, but he is deeply caring, and my dad's death rocked him hard. And you, how do you deal with the death of your patients? I've watched you this past week, and you are also extremely close to your patients. Jake and I are a lot alike in that regard, but when it comes to grieving, that's where we differ. How so? Here we are talking about death, and this is supposed to be a nice taco truck date with an ocean view, Alvarez. He looked at me like I had grown three heads. Sorry, I zipped up my jacket, feeling the chill of the salty air hitting my scrub top and going right through, almost causing a shiver. Don't apologize to me unless you fuck up in my OR, Colin said as I crossed my arms and legs to keep my body heat at an even temperature. 
Speaking of which, or rather, going back to that, I looked at him. How do you do it all so casually? What, brain surgery? Is that supposed to be hard or something? He nudged my arm and laughed. Shit, I laughed at the brilliance of his smile that I loved to be on the receiving end of. Everything, all of it. You're a natural. I wouldn't call it that. He dismissed the compliment. Then what would you call it? You're a highly educated, brilliant physician. I see it in how you work. I hear it in the way you talk. You had to have graduated at the top of your class, and now look at you, putting it all into play so effortlessly. Nice guess. And you're right about graduating at the top, he said. So that's it then. A smart ass and an even smarter doctor? Colin laughed. Ever hear of the quote, while wisdom dictates the need for education, education does not necessarily make one wise? Yes, I responded. I can have all the education in the world and graduate at the top of my class. But without wisdom, I'm just an educated fool. So how did you gain your wisdom? I teased him with the last word. Experience, mostly. But I'd like to think that my innate curiosity and ability to be ultra-observant is the real reason. Being in the OR like you were today, watching everyone and everything, was vital to me. I scrutinized every move that every person made, especially the doctors. I could see when a doctor was selfish in his methods or being a chicken shit compared to the way another doctor worked. I absorbed all of those things in my internship days like I was a goddamn sponge. I knew the kind of doctor I wanted to be when I decided that I wanted to enter this field of medical science and that I was going to be wise in my methods, patient, and use my best judgment. That's why you got into this field of work? I suppose I got into this field of work because there are so many fascinating obstacles to keep me challenged. He grinned at me. I am so damn intelligent that I get bored easily, you know. Neuroscience keeps me guessing. Ah, of course, I answered. So, how long before Colin grows bored of Dr. Alvarez? His eyes held mine at that moment. I've already grown severely bored of Dr. Alvarez. He raised an eyebrow at me. I'd like to enjoy some time with the lovely Elena for once. I grinned. Keep staring at me with your sexy, icy blue eyes like that, and you may not know what hit you, doctor. That was a beautiful, extremely tempting statement, until you killed it with the doctor tagline. I laughed. Okay. Truth? I've been nothing but honest with you since the moment I first spoke to you, he said without missing a beat. I believe it's you who needs to gain my trust with your lying about being my new psych doctor when we first met in Vegas. I don't, I mean, shit. I couldn't think with the way he was casually leaned back and looking at me like he'd take me home and fuck me if I said the word. And that was the problem. I was back to wanting that again. Loss for words? Just come out and say it. You know that you and I work. There's something here. Just say the damn words and I'll show you exactly what I've seen in your eyes this entire week. You act so sure that I'm not just your girl, but the first words that came out of your mouth were that you'd be my future husband. Glad that stayed with you since our first dance, he added. Then I get here, and you're acting as if I'm the woman of your dreams? How am I supposed to take you seriously? Because I am serious. I shook my head. You have girls throwing themselves at you all day at work, and yet you settle for the one girl you hardly know? I would never settle for anything, Alvarez, he answered confidently. Jesus Christ, I loved that confidence. It doesn't make sense, I laughed. You don't make sense. I'm not one to be played, Brooks. Neither am I, he answered pointedly. So, you're going to marry me then? I thought I'd just hit him straight between the eyes. I'd love to pretend that I was as self-assured as I hoped I sounded but the truth was that I was way past the point of no return with this guy. He didn't flinch. You're going to marry me. He corrected my statement. You're the most complicated man I've ever met, I said, more perplexed than before. Here's something that might help you understand me a bit more. I don't just fall for women, especially women in the medical field. His eyebrows rose. 
if I'm honest, which I am, unlike you when we first met. I should have run the other direction that night. I should have never allowed myself to fall under some spell by your gorgeous smile and then walk out to that dance floor just to hear your laugh. I should have never gone anywhere near you, given you were a beautiful woman from our medical conference, because those are my rules. When you said who your father was, I should have had one of the men in black come to wipe your memories away so he wouldn't try to murder me for hitting on you. Even with all of those things that I shouldn't have done, wouldn't have done under any other circumstance, I didn't have a choice. There was no way that I could have stopped myself from doing all of those things. I crossed so many of my personal boundaries to get to you. I didn't just cross them. I did Olympic-level vaulting to get across them. And I'd do them all a thousand times over without a second thought. Our eyes were locked onto each other's at this enlightening confession of his, and I had a lump the size of Albuquerque in my throat. I smiled, my cheeks burning with fire as his lips pulled up confidently on one side, his eyes mysterious, yet so beautiful. I thought you told me you were a wise doctor, Colin Brooks. No self-control, huh? It would have been lovely to form a statement that remotely covered his heartfelt sentiment, but that stupid response was all I could manage. I guess the heart overrides the brain. He confirmed and leaned closer to me. You're not the only one questioning my wisdom, however. My friends think I'm sabotaging my career because I want a piece of ass, so that goes to show the respect I get from my loved ones. He laughed loudly, and I was grateful for the levity. Are they right? Firstly, I would never sabotage my career, so on that count, no, they're very wrong about that. He pressed his lips together and studied me. I'm not historically the kind of man to have his sights set on only one woman. Especially if she makes me wait so long even to call her by her first name. So, I should feel lucky that you're giving me the time of day? I teased. I would love to make you feel lucky all times of the day, he said with a devilish smile. I instantly felt the throbbing between my legs and growing wet at the thought of what Colin was referring to. So, you haven't had a girlfriend or anything like that? I paused while I watched him unashamedly shake his head as I spoke. I haven't been with anyone since I met you and realized that this whole soulmate shit is real. You've become the biggest test of patience ever to challenge me. Soulmates? I half smiled. I felt like a lunatic entertaining the thought, but maybe this was the connection I was feeling with him. It was kind of hard to make heads or tails of anything when I was so busy lusting over his beautiful face and body on top of his personality and his genius in the O.R. I see it in your eyes right now, he said, narrowing his eyes at me. You're questioning it. Perhaps. He grinned and chuckled. It's much easier if you just fucking go with it. I thought I'd test him and play with him because, well, why not? If not now, then when? Without giving him a chance to react, I straddled him and cradled his face in my hands. I studied Colin's eyes, sexier and more serious than I'd ever seen them. If this is the case, I said, feeling a charge of emotions I'd never felt with a man before. Then I guess we should both hope I accept this fact, and soon. Colin's hand slid down my sides and over my ass. My body froze after a violent shiver surged up my spine in reaction to his graceful touch and somber expression. I wanted to do so much more with him tonight, but something deep inside told me to hold off for now. He licked his lips, and the fresh, crisp scent of his cologne was potent with our faces so close. I wanted to taste his kiss, to feel the urgency of him kissing me. I wanted all of him. I closed my eyes and exhaled. Are you going to let me kiss you, or is tormenting me high up on the things you enjoy doing? Alvarez. I smiled at the way he always said my last name, as if he were a high school basketball coach. My eyes pulled from his, and the wind blowing away his delicious scent helped me come back to hold my own against the man I desperately wanted. If he wanted me like he said he did, I would find out soon enough. But not tonight. You're one intriguing man, I said, my eyes studying his. Thank you for an incredible day at work, reminding me why I love my job 
and this delicious dinner. I slid back to see Colin's face flustered and filled with bewilderment. What the hell are you trying to do to me, Elena? I bent over and kissed his forehead, my eyes closed and inhaling deeply of the man I knew deep down inside I'd fallen blindly in love with, somewhere between when we first met and this moment. I let my lips linger as I ran my fingernails through the sides of his short hair. It's Dr. Alvarez to you, and I'm trying to say thank you. I don't know how I did it, especially since I heard him let out a breath as he ran his hands over my forearms. But I managed to stand and leave the man sitting and staring as I smiled at him and then turned to walk away. If he did believe we were soulmates, as I was starting to believe myself, then we'd see how he would treat me after that. Most men would tell me to kiss their ass for wasting their time. Most would call me a bitch and probably a cock tease. But if Colin and I were going to play the soulmates game, well, that went farther than screwing and flirting. That was hardcore. That meant our souls were created to find each other one day. And they finally did. I knew I wouldn't be able to keep Colin at arm's length for much longer. I wasn't that strong. And I didn't know if I even wanted to. I wanted more. And I wanted it right now. But I wanted to relish in this feeling. It was the beginning of something immense, something epic, and I knew nothing was going to stop this. Chapter 11 Colin I walked into Kinder's to meet up with the guys, and, for the first time, I was the last one at the table. If it isn't the man of the hour, my best friend Jake said, as I sat at our usual table. And I'm all smiles, I said, sitting down and grabbing my menu. Always. Jim, Jake's older brother and CEO of the company that owned St. John's, added. How's the relationship moving along with Dr. Alvarez? Alex, our close friend and the vice president of Jim's company, asked. Well, after she decided to kiss me on the forehead a few nights ago, I started, setting my menu aside after deciding on blackened salmon. I figured I'd give her a taste of her own medicine during our lunch break. Jake chuckled. As fond as I've become of the woman you're obsessed with, I have to say, I loved watching her squirm with that one. What the hell are you two talking about? Jim asked, after the waitress quickly took our order and left. Elena, Jake, and a few others were sitting in the cafeteria, eating lunch, and I got Paige to go to the OR. I reached over to the gin and tonic that had been ordered for me, took a sip, and shrugged. So before I got up, I kissed her in front of everyone and then I left. That is not how that shit went down, Jake laughed and took a sip of his usual scotch. We're all sitting around the table. It happens to be one of those rare occasions that we're all having lunch in the cafeteria together. Jake shook his head as he gave me the side eye before continuing. Call gets paged and becomes distracted with the scans that were sent to his email on his phone before he determines it's a go for surgery. Then in front of every gossiping hen that lives and breathes hospital drama, Colin gets up, Jake dramatically raises his hands to create the full visual, turns to Elena, who is sitting at his side, and kisses her cheek before he walks away from the table. I watched Alex, the one that every chick we've ever met claimed was a younger Johnny Depp lookalike, nearly choke on the Manhattan he was casually drinking. Spit that shit out on me and you'll pay. I raised an eyebrow at him, sitting across from me. God in heaven, Jim said as he elbowed Alex's arm. Here come all the jealous women complaints from St. John's again. That's an understatement, Alex added with a laugh. Are you sure this chick is worth all of this trouble? More than, I assured the table. That's not even the best part, Jake chuckled. Poor Elena was rendered speechless because the poor gal probably knows that every woman who has been eyeballing this sexy neurosurgeon is going to be talking shit about her, Alex interrupted. She's only been there for, what, a little over a week now? I told you that wasn't the best part, right? Jake continued, without skipping a beat. 
So it's obvious that Colin realizes the position he just put Elena in because he stops in his tracks, turns around, and gives me, Dr. Brandt, Dr. Chu, and Dr. Brown all the same farewell he gave Elena. Cheek kisses all around? Alex burst out laughing as Jim slowly shook his head, trying not to smile. Have we been sent over complaints that Dr. Brooks is kissing doctors in the cafeteria now? Jim asked, looking at Alex. Nothing about the French farewells yet, Alex said, swallowing the last of his drink. You are a fucking lunatic, Colin. You know that, right? You either need to get somewhere with Elena or just let it go. I shook my head and remained firm. Nope. She's my girl. And she knows it, too. She's just playing me right now. She'll come to her senses soon enough. I looked over at Jim who undoubtedly saw his fair share of sexual harassment complaints. He was lucky Jake and I were close friends with each of the doctors I'd laid lips on so I could move the gossip off of Elena and on to the fact that I was working on 72 hours of on-call sleep deprivation. Most people know that Elena and I not only work closely together, but also, you both walk around with constant fuck-me eyes toward each other, Jake interrupted. Even if I didn't know you, I could easily see that you're obsessed with the new neuropsychiatrist. A woman who's been hit on by practically every male and some female staff at St. John's, by the way. Whatever you idiots do, just keep this ball out of my court, Jim said. Seriously, Call. You and Jake have enough goddamn complaints working their way up to Alex and me since you're both hot shots. It's the burnouts who are constantly making bogus complaints, and you know it. Jake said, defending both of us. And what about Brandt? He's Mr. GQ of pediatrics. He's getting this shit, too. Alex rolled his eyes. Brandt is different. That guy needs to quit messing around with the new nurses who are hired on. Dude actually blamed us for that. He said it was our fault for hiring hot nurses. Jim chuckled. I guess that's one way to spin it. It's the fact that you have a new documentary running on him now, too. He's easy on the eye, and we're sending these things off to universities with, shall we call them, eager young interns, I added. Not that I keep track, nor am I defending him because I have my own problems, and I don't care all that much, but last I heard, Brandt was in a relationship with that pediatric nurse, and he broke it off with her. Word has it, she was fucking pissed and determined to make his life a living hell. I'm just saying what I hear in passing. As you all know, I don't listen too much to the gossip brigade. This job is hard enough without finding out there's a complaint against your ass every other week. He's too good at what he does to be dealing with that shit. The waitress arrived with our food, and this conversation was doing nothing but starting to piss me off. I hated that unqualified, bitter associates scrutinized everything we did. People's lives rested in our hands, and you would think that should have been the most stressful part of the job. Dealing with HR grievances was not what any of us signed up for. The frivolous complaints seriously need to stop, Jimmy, Jake said, taking the words right out of my mouth. You guys need to put a pin in that shit. If the hospital board can't kill this nonsense, then what the hell are they good for? It comes directly to me when I have highly esteemed doctors who could be fired by the board, dipshit, Jim said, cutting into his steak. I request it from the board and then deal with the board. Your asses would have been fired long ago if I didn't oversee this shit. Then hire someone to take it on, I added. You both know it's mostly bullshit. The legitimate harassment complaints are being overshadowed by people making shit up. Alex laughed. You think we can't see through it all? Every time we get together, you both act like this is all you get on your desks, Jake added between bites. That's because you and Colin get so fucking pissed that it makes for a great dinner, Jim mused. I rolled my eyes at the two jokers sitting across from Jake and me. Okay, so once again, we're the subjects for your entertainment. Let's change the topic, shall we? You're going to ruin my fish. All right, Jim said. Moving on to more important things. We're throwing the hospital Christmas gala this weekend. I closed my eyes in annoyance. The one weekend I'd planned on going over to Elena's new place and helping her move in? I looked at Jim and sighed. Can I not catch a break in my pursuit of this woman? 
What the hell are you talking about? Jake questioned. This is news. Not breaking news, obviously, I said, rubbing my forehead. This gala that we are always forced to attend, what is it, four weeks early this time? That, my friend, is breaking news. I'm curious, do you honestly believe that unpacking boxes with Elena this weekend is going to be the start of a relationship with her? Alex asked with a laugh. God, you are off your game these days, man. I don't give a shit how our relationship begins. Whether it's cleaning toilets or unpacking boxes, the bottom line was that I would be alone with her for the first time since taking her to Long Beach. Better than that, alone in her new home. I raised my eyebrows. I figured it was a gift from God that she got her keys early and actually invited me to help her move in. Take her with you to the gala then, drama queen, Alex said. That way we can all experience your true love through your cheek and forehead kisses. More than that, if you think that shit is going to get real between you two, it's best to have the CEO and VP of Mitchell and Associates in attendance while you show up with her on your arm, Jake added. Great point. It's just a matter of convincing Elena of that. At the moment, we're just friends and are working on acting on our feelings. I pinched the bridge of my nose. I truly don't know how she feels. She smiles radiantly at everyone, has this beautiful, infectious laugh. I took another sip of my gin and tonic, my frustration rising, and really for no reason. God damn, what was going on with my obsession with her? All I have is that her cheeks turn bright pink when I flirt with her. And that ever-loving kiss to your forehead? Alex chuckled. I pursed my lips and kept my gaze on Jim's grin. What's the reason for the last-minute gala? Aside from it interfering with my plans with Elena, this was my only weekend off before I planned on taking the Friday before Christmas off for the time that we usually have this jamboree. Well, you'll have two weeks off the day after Christmas and through the new year now, too. We have to move things around because Avery and I decided to get married the week after Christmas. In Hawaii. I expect you still plan on being one of my groomsmen. Jim said, with a broad grin. You're shitting me, right? I questioned. You two have waited almost six months to finally marry, and now that you've decided on this, and it's all last minute? And... I stopped myself. I had to shut my fucking mouth, because I was happier than hell that Jim and Avery had finally settled on a date to tie the knot. So if everything needed to be scheduled around that, I shouldn't have been bitching about it. It was just so annoying because I'd been looking forward to spending the entire day this Saturday, and hopefully through the weekend, with her. What the fuck ever. I couldn't seem to have anything go my way when it came to Elena. For God's sake, she still mandated that I call her Dr. Alvarez, and that was more maddening than anything. Mostly because I wasn't a fool, and I knew she had feelings for me as well, but she seemed to hold back for some reason. A reason that was driving me batshit crazy while trying to figure it out. Fuck it. I needed to stop acting childish about Avery and Jim's spur-of-the-moment planning. And? Jim pressed. Dude hasn't been laid in months, and now he's all caught up with Elena. I can only imagine how blue his balls really are. Jake laughed. That's completely true, I said. How long has it been, lover boy? Alex asked. If it was your damn business, which it's not, I smiled at Alex, a storm of an idea brewing in my head as we talked, I might tell you. I should have all you dip fucks know that I was never the one to just screw around with women. I dated them and enjoyed them while I did. Says the chump who got all of us labeled the goddamn billionaires club, Jim said, while rolling his eyes at that fact. If I recall correctly, you were the one who was too drunk to think and fucking around with that real estate heiress. Thanks to her, we have to explain that to anyone who finds out. That was years ago, and I ended shit like that then, too. I smirked at the three who all had their hellish histories, fucking women and breaking their hearts in their own particular and selfish ways. So that Casey girl was the last woman you seriously dated? Jim asked trying to keep his demanding CEO composure that didn't work worth a damn around the three of us. He turned to face me. 
You haven't been laid in how long? Laugh it up, assholes, I said with a smile of my own. I'll be making up for the lost time when my little spark plug finally realizes that I'm her guy. Anyway, moving on. Jim put to bed the topic of my seriously needing to get laid. We're flying out three days after Christmas. Schedules are cleared, and I had my assistant check for both your and Jake's scheduled surgeries. It appears there are none planned during that time, is that right? I'm clear. I smiled at Jake, who narrowed his eyes at my grin. If anyone could tell that I was up to no good, it was my best friend. As am I. Any urgent surgeries that come up always go to Chi in my absence, Jake added. Jim had just finished texting Avery, and I reached for the phone that he was dumb enough to set between our plates. I held the phone to his face and unlocked it, knowing Jim would keep his composure given the expensive restaurant we were in. I now had the world of Jim and Avery at my fingertips. What the hell are you doing? Jim asked, as the waitress returned with a new round of drinks. Perfect timing, I thought, eyeing Jim with an unwavering smile. Handling an issue with your fiancé, I said. Try not to act like a teenager and tear the phone from my hands, please. Jim rolled his eyes after I punched the button to dial out to his most recent call, Avery, and she answered in three rings. Shit, that was a quick dinner, she answered, and as usual, Avery's sailor mouth made me smile. Actually, it's been a painfully long and hellish one, I said. It's Colin. Oh, hey, she said, with a surprised laugh. What happened to Jim? Well, he's devastated, if I'm honest, I said, in a voice that had all eyes on me now. Oh, fuck, here it comes. What is it now? She answered, likely hearing the smile in my voice. Well, I'm not going to make it to the wedding. I just can't do this to you and Jim, I said. Do what? Well, Jim informed me that I'm to be a groomsman in the Aloha wedding he just popped on us. And that's a good thing, right? He said your and Jake's schedules were clear for this time. Where is he? Sitting right here, looking at me as if I've lost my mind. Which you have, Jim grumbled. Here's the deal, I continued, ignoring Jim. Being a numbers guy, and the genius I am in all things, I've done the math and this wedding will be a disaster. I assume you're having Ash's best guy friends arrange it all? Clay and Joe? Yes, and they're not worried about anything. Please tell me how a brainiac neurosurgeon has made this determination within the span of the evening, she said, humoring me. I rested my elbow on the table. Jim went to reach for the phone over my bullshit, but I wasn't making the point yet. I calmly held up my index finger to stop him and leaned away. Does Clay and Joe realize that you have a groom with three groomsmen? Yes. And how many bridesmaids to even out the beautiful wedding pictures? Wedding pictures that I'm sure will be taken as you kiss while the sun sets on the ocean's horizon. What the hell are you trying to... Avery laughed. I have my sister, Ash, and... The line went silent. Right. And who am I to walk with? I questioned dramatically, which brought eye rolls from around the table and a laugh from Jake. Imagine how Clay and Joe are going to view this nonsense. Seriously, Av? A billionaire gets married in a tropical paradise, and the whole thing looks like an offset, uneven calamity because I've got no partner. And sweet Jesus, if not me, I don't even want to think about Alex being the only one without a chick in some bright pink chiffon dress on his arm in all the pictures. First of all, Avery started, this wedding isn't taking place in the 1980s, so don't worry about the chiffon. Second of all, I really don't care what you guys look like so long as I get to marry the love of my life. I guess I should apologize for not taking you into consideration with my wedding plans, she added sarcastically and with a laugh. Apology accepted, and as long as you don't care, sweet Avery, I said in a teasing voice, then you won't care that I'll be providing the missing bridesmaid for you. She is a woman who will enhance the photos with a smile brighter than the flash of the camera. Avery laughed. You think Elena will be down for something this crazy when she still won't even let you call her by her first name? 
Do you and Jim gossip about everyone's shitty situations, or is it just my life that is the most fascinating? I asked, looking at Jim's smile. I must insist on this. I cannot in good conscience allow your wedding photos to be unbalanced. Good God, woman, you're a billionaire now. It's time to start acting like one. Oh, for the love of God, she said. I knew how much she hated all the money talk, but I couldn't resist. You can bring Ronald McDonald for all I care, just as long as it shuts you up. I don't care for his makeup, so Ronald is going to have to sit this one out, I said, hearing her laughing on the other end of the line. Hey, as long as Elena is comfortable and you aren't harassing the poor woman, then she is more than welcome to come and be a part of our wedding. I can't wait to meet her. You'll meet her, I said. And you're welcome. I ended the call and handed Jim his phone. Are you out of your mind? Jim asked. As if you hadn't known that for years, Jake responded to his brother. I know what I want, and that's the lovely Dr. Elena Alvarez. This is the brightest idea I've had since... I paused and chuckled. Well, since I decided the woman would one day realize I'm the man of her dreams. You'd better hope to God the woman doesn't think you're some insane doctor and run far, far, far away from your desperate ass after this bright idea, Alex said, shaking his head. It'll be fun, I added. Of course, I won't force her to do anything she doesn't want to do. Hell, I'm not even forcing her to go to this Christmas party if she's busy unpacking. Elena is her own woman. We are all swiftly learning that. I guess this is the part where we all place bets on whether or not Colin gets Elena on a plane to be in a wedding for someone she doesn't know. Right? Jim added. Place all the bets and wagers you've got, boys, I said. All I needed was Avery's approval, and now all I need is Elena's. You mean Dr. Alvarez, Jake teased. Don't forget you still need her approval to call her Elena, too. This should be the easiest shit you've ever pulled off. Exactly. I held up my glass and smiled confidently. Here's to you all losing your lame-ass bets against me. It was up to me to make it all work, and if I could perform brain surgery, I could pull this shit off, too. Chapter 12 Elena I loved my office. This hospital, these patients. God, you name it, I loved it. I was happy and grateful for everything, and I was so relieved when my family drama finally started dying down at home. My brother took his attitude down a few notches after some convincing, but Dad surprised us both when he announced that he'd decided to rent out the Beverly Hills home instead of outright selling it. After coffee this morning, Dad admitted that he wasn't quite there yet, selling the home where we all shared so many fond memories. Maybe it would happen eventually, but for now, it would technically remain in the family. Either way, the time was here to juggle my moving out and Dad and Stevie needing to pack as well, because Dad wanted to move to the ranch this weekend, and I'd gotten my new keys already. Thank God I was off until Monday after I finished work tonight. Dr. Alvarez? The RN working the floor acknowledged me as I passed her in the hallway. Hey, Katie, I said. Everything going good today? Long day, she eyed me with a smile. It's good to see you up here today. Mr. Follows is almost ready to leave for the rehab center. You're just in time. Got it, I waved as she turned to continue walking away. Have a good one. I loved the staff here, every single one of them. They were all pleasant and lively to be around, making it enjoyable to come to the hospital and check on my patients. Sure, there were a few cranky RNs, techs, and doctors. But hey, sleep deprivation does that to people. Well, to everyone but Dr. Brooks, of course. God only knew how that guy functioned, working nonstop on his on-call days. Another check in the box of a dream guy, a guy who had a bright outlook on everything, even when functioning on zero sleep. Mr. Follows, I said, entering the room seeing where his stroke had caused him to lose strength on the right side of his body. I rushed to his bedside when he smiled and tried to get up. 
His wife was in conversation with the rehab doctor and Dr. Waters, who'd been his surgeon since he was rushed to the hospital. I gently sat next to him, took the cloth from his hand, and dabbed the saliva that was dripping from the right side of his mouth. I know you're excited to see me, but Dr. Waters will not be pleased if I'm the reason his patient is in rehab for longer than a month. I watched him smile, but then fall back into his pillows in defeat. Hey, I said, reaching for his hand. Look at me. He did, and I saw the man I knew he was before this stroke caused him to suffer from hemiparesis. His pitch-black hair was sprinkled with gray, and his eyes showed lines that were evidence of what his family told me when I met with them yesterday. He smiled often, joked, and was a pillar of strength. I wasn't about to let him suffer or become a victim of this stroke. Dr. Verez, he slurred. Yes, I arched an eyebrow at him. Listen, this is a new chapter, a new challenge. I've talked to your wife and kids. I gave him a knowing grin. And they told me I was lucky to have met the strongest man they knew. Is that still true? He nodded. You're darn right it is. We talked about this yesterday. They told me that you've broken in the most stubborn young horses, and even the Mustangs that you and your wife rescue, right? He nodded. Talking wasn't going to be easy for him, even though he was already progressing well with his new speech therapist. I eyed his charts, seeing that he was ready to be released and in more appropriate rehab center care. My job was to prepare him for the road ahead mentally, so it would be a speedy recovery. There would be changes he would need to make to adjust to the lasting stroke damage, and it was my duty to bring him the facts and not talk down to him. I had to shoot him straight. He had to fight hard, and it was my job to make this fight worth something. Now, just like with the stubborn horses, you have to be determined and patient. Have you ever given up on a horse? I asked seeing this man was broken. He tried to turn his head from me. Mr. Follows, I said, my voice a bit sterner. When you leave St. John's today, it's up to you if you want to give up and become a victim of this stroke. You can easily become that, but I don't think you're that kind of man. I think you're the kind of man who fights back with everything he's got. The kind of man who gets right back on that horse when he throws you from his back. He looked at me in annoyance. There are statistics that show the body has a way of recovering through these strokes, and that the neuropathways can open back up and reestablish nerve and muscle function. I squeezed his hand. You can choose here and now to leave St. John's as one of the statistics of a patient who has recovered from a stroke, or you can give up. I won't allow the latter. You will fight back, and you will work hard. His expression grew curious. Yes, he managed. Yes, I repeated. I won't lie to you during this process, so I am going to tell you now that this will not be easy. This will probably be one of the most difficult things you've ever done in your life. But like the stories that I've heard about you, you're going to get back on the horse. One of those horses should have broken his neck at least three times. A young man no older than I interjected. Dad was beaten up and bleeding from being thrown into the fencing time and time again, but he wouldn't stop. Would you, Dad? I looked over and saw Mr. Follow's expression brighten, listening to his son, who stood at the foot of his bed. You worked that horse until morning when I got up. Slept in. Mr. Follow's mumbled with a husky laugh. I smiled at the young man's beaming expression. Slept in? I teased and then looked back at Mr. Follow's. I have a younger brother who likes to sleep in. Drives me insane. If you call waking up at seven in the morning sleeping in, Dr. Alvarez, the young man stated, standing there, impeccably dressed, looking nothing like the slacker his father might have led me to believe. I do, I lifted my chin. That suit you're wearing tells me that you know seven in the morning is sleeping in now, too. He smirked. Dad's always right. His stubbornness shows in everything. And yes, Dr. Alvarez, if I'm up at seven in the morning, I'm most likely missing a morning conference call, an important meeting, or losing a client. Your dad's going to come out of this just fine, I said. 
I looked back at Mr. Follows. I want to hear that you'll fight to get your life back. He nodded, his eyes still on his son. I could tell that even though the tough cowboy who lay in bed differed vastly from his businessman son, the two shared a close connection, and Mr. Follows would be in great hands with his wife and son. I stood. I love to check in on my patients before they leave for rehab. So, don't think for one second I'm letting you off easy by walking out of this room right now. You promise me that when I show up in a few weeks, you're going to be ready to get home and saddle up. If there's one thing I know about you, old man, his son said with a laugh, it's that the only thing that will stop you from getting back on those horses is death itself. He looked at me. My mom said we could consult with you for anything. Is this part of Dad's recovery plan? Yes, I'm here for anything. The rehab center is in the new wing and close to where I can make rounds on my lunch if needed, I said. And I will. Your dad will recover. He just needs to be determined and fight when his body doesn't want to fight. His son scratched the shadow on his cheek. I could see that it was difficult for the man to see his dad like this, but I also saw that same fire in his eyes. So... I get to finally be the one to boss you around now, eh? I wouldn't let him, I said, siding with Mr. Follows. You show your son that Dad's strong spirit is alive and well. Thanks, Dr. Alvarez, his son said, as the doctor and Mrs. Follows were wrapping things up. The rehab doctor was ready to bring in his team to transport Mr. Follows to their facility. It truly was up to him to fight, and I would be there to check in every step of the way. Discouragement was such a silent mental killer if you let it take over. In a stroke victim's case, that could easily happen. It was my job to help them. This won't be easy, I repeated, but any success is monumental to progress in retraining your mind to do things. I will see you soon enough, Mr. Follows. I smiled at the family. You all have my information on his discharge papers. It is in his care plan with St. John's and our rehabilitation center for any of you to make an appointment for consultations. Please don't hesitate to make an appointment for anything. With that, I took my leave with Dr. Waters, and we both walked back to our offices together. You are an amazing doc, Elena, Dr. Waters said. It's nice having you on the floor like this. I don't know how you make the time for it. I looked over at the man who was number two on the cocky neurosurgeon list at St. John's. Everyone knew who number one was. Dr. Waters was a bit older than Dr. Brooks, but still young, being in his mid-forties. I did find it strange that St. John's was almost like a soap opera hospital. Young, hot doctors and nurses floating around this extravagant place. I'm just grateful you trust your patients in my care. I'm still new and have a lot to prove. To have doctors trusting me with their patients is quite an honor, I answered, as we turned toward the back doors that led into our offices outside of the hospital. What makes you think we trust you and aren't testing you? He said in his dick voice, something I was accustomed to with men like him. I hope you're testing me, I answered confidently, because if I were getting things spoon-fed to me around this place, I'd probably suck at my job. Oh? He smirked as we stopped and I turned to open my office door. I hardly think you'd suck at your job. Your smile alone is enough to rehab any patient. I laughed, pulling off my lab coat and turning to pack up my desk. Amusing. If only that were the case, then I wouldn't have had to bust my ass in college, med school, and internships. Good night, Elena. He smiled and then left me to pack things up. It was Thursday night, and my stuff should have been delivered and moved into my new place, ready for me to go through and unpack this weekend. I pulled out my phone to confirm the movers had shown up, and Stevie was there to let them into the apartment. God bless his little nightlife soul. He was taking the week off to help Dad and me clear the main house and move out for the cleaners to prepare the place for the new renters. Part of me knew that Dad could hold off, and should have, to save us all this crazy time crunch in getting out of the house— but he was ready to go to Malibu. And after talking horses and seeing the cowboy and Mr. Follows, I was excited to get out to the ranch and greet the horses. Dr. Waters, eh? I heard Colin's light-hearted voice say. I placed my briefcase on my desk and looked up at the man, 
leaning casually in my doorway. He had his arms crossed, and a leg smoothly crossed over the other one. Damn it. I had trained my eyes and brain to get used to this man by now. So why was I acting like it was the first time I'd seen Colin looking hotter than ever in his dark suit? Dr. Waters? I questioned with a laugh. I just finished up with one of his patients he's sending to rehab. Ah, Colin answered, eyes illuminating with his vibrant smile. You realize that guy is so slimy that if you poured salt on him, he'd dissolve into a pile of goo, right? Well, shit. I sat back in my chair and rubbed my forehead. Too bad you're not a shrink like me, then. I could easily fix any problem you might have if your mind is leading you down a path to date some slimy geek of a man. I bet you could. I laughed, trying to cover up the fact that my body was aching for things to turn into something more than unpacking boxes and setting up my bed this weekend. What makes you think he'd even be up for a date with me, Dr. Brooks? Colin glanced over his shoulder and then smiled back at me. Unlike you, I've actually listened in on the gossip that is brewing around the floors of this hospital. It looks like you're the new hottie that the doctors and nurses- Oh God, don't. I closed my eyes and held up my hand. Colin laughed. You seem a bit flustered, Dr. Alvarez. In the new Colin fashion, he seemed to know when things could work me up, like hospital gossip directed at me in such a way, and he diffused it with a smile. And why the hell does that guy get to call you Elena? I think you know exactly why by now, I said, somewhat annoyed. And please don't tell me that people are talking like this about me. Everyone adores you, he said, more sincerely this time. You are quite the asset to St. John's. And that's not just me speaking as your future husband, either. That was all it took, and I chilled out some. Well, I love working here, I added. Whether I'm speaking with my future husband or not, I am about to find out if the brain and spinal surgeon can put a bed together this weekend. His lips tightened. About that, he said in a lowered voice. I'm sure you heard through the rumor mill that runs stronger than the Whitewater Rapids through Arizona that we have a Christmas event this Saturday evening. Yes, I said. And those rapids in Arizona and Utah are both quite the adrenaline rush. His face lightened and that beautiful Colin smile spread broadly. You enjoy whitewater rafting, Dr. Alvarez? Absolutely. Sort of an addiction. I shivered with excitement, remembering the many times we vacationed in Colorado, Utah, and Arizona, just to take on the rapids. I love the feeling of adrenaline coursing through my veins. I exhaled, feeling almost that same way as I noticed an expression I'd never seen on Colin's face before. God, it was as painful as looking into the sun right now. I could barely hold my own against his flawless face and this cursed smile that could be a superpower against evil, if that were even possible. Wow. His forehead creased while his eyebrows shot up as if he'd just been slapped with the most enormous revelation of his life. You really are my other half. Because I'm an adrenaline junkie? I chuckled. Precisely because of that. You enjoy whitewater rafting? I asked, somewhat surprised. You have no idea the adrenaline me and my best friends chase. Well, mainly Jake and me because the other two are boring, CEO workaholics. He laughed. Listen, I have to go to this gala, and I promised James Mitchell that I would ensure his latest hire, the amazing Dr. Elena Alvarez, would be there. So, how about we go to this Christmas thing together? And while we're in the holiday spirit, we'll hit up a Christmas tree farm. We can pick out a tree for your new place on Saturday morning, and we can manage the unpacking and moving in around... He raised his shoulders in excitement. Well, around this festive holiday season. You do have me figured out, I smirked. All but the part where Mr. James Mitchell is requesting me to show up. Last I recall, this was to recognize the best through the year at St. John's, celebrate the holidays, and give out special bonus checks. Me being here for less than a month says that I get to duck out of this event. Colin's lips twisted. Even after I offer to buy the Christmas tree for your home? Even after all of that? Decorate it too? He said in some playful voice. You're going to decorate a tree that you plan on randomly buying me? Yep. 
he said resolutely. With what ornaments? Whatever ornaments you have. I don't have any. Colin grinned. Well then, that allows me to help buy our first Christmas ornaments together. Slow down. I stood, ready to leave. You have fun at the Christmas party, and I'll text you my address if you still want to give me a hand unpacking. Colin pulled up from reclining in my doorway and walked toward me. What are you so afraid of with me? He asked, almost as serious as he seemed curious. I'm not afraid of you, I said. I have to get moved in. I already said that I'd help. I have no type of Christmas party outfit to wear, I finally admitted. Good God, Alvarez, he said, plopping into one of the seats across from my desk. You're in Southern California during party season. I'll take you out personally to buy the dress. Then, I say we make an appearance at this party and bounce. I eyed Colin, becoming more relaxed and casual. If I'm honest, Colin, which historically is not your strong point when it comes to me, he interrupted, never missing a chance to rub my Las Vegas lie in my face. Continue. Fine, I'll go, I said. Let's give us a try, starting with a chaotic event that I'm not prepared for, a looming move that's hanging over my shoulders, and... I stopped and smiled at him as he nodded along. And... His eyebrows rose. The Christmas tree you'll be picking. That, in and of itself, should be enough to put a strain on trying us out. I'm picky with my trees, I said. I'm picky with who I invite to last-minute hospital Christmas parties. Then it's a date. You and me, the two pickiest people on the planet, trying out a date. You said you loved adrenaline, right? Addicted to it. I believe those were the words you used. He stood and said with wide eyes, Crave it. Live for it. Then I'm sure I'll find a way to satisfy your adrenaline addictions. He turned to walk out. I'll have you addicted to me. He stopped and eyed me. And I'm sure you're not afraid since you made it very clear you're a fearless woman. My heart decided to take off at a rapid pace again, knowing exactly what he was talking about, and me wanting him more than ever before. I'll meet you there, I said. No, you won't. He smiled. This isn't going to be a separate cars situation. I'll drive you. Text me your address, Alvarez. I'm not going to be in the office tomorrow, so I won't see you until party night. Fine, I'll see you then. And it's about time. He smiled. Hey, I caught him before he left my office. I rubbed my forehead, knowing I needed to keep my priorities straight. Seriously, I don't think I should go to the party. I really need to get up and help my dad unpack at the ranch. Colin seemed to be unaffected by that. Well, then we'll unpack two houses this weekend. He answered. I don't give a damn. I'm not letting you back out of this. I met his challenging grin with one of my own. I'm off this weekend and I'm headed to the ranch tomorrow. I shouldn't break up everything with a Christmas party. Well, it's a good thing I have the weekend off too, isn't it? You seriously think you're going to go to the ranch and help me get my dad all squared away? I seriously think I'm taking you to that Christmas party, and I'll do whatever it takes to make it happen. His smile broadened. And here I had no idea you had the entire weekend off until now. It looks like we're unpacking Papa Alvarez tomorrow, making Christmas party appearances, unpacking your place on Saturday, and then, he pursed his lips, We'll be a solid couple by Monday morning. Sometimes you're too sure of yourself. I narrowed my eyes at his confidence. Okay, I let out a breath. Meet me at the ranch in Malibu. We'll see how sure you are of this solid couple thing by Monday morning after dealing with my dad. Best to get his kicking my ass out of the way now instead of later. Give me your digits, Alvarez, he said taking my phone number as I laughed in disillusionment that he was willing to do any of this. Great. Now here's mine. He smiled as he texted me. See you bright and early at the Alvarez Ranch. He winked and walked out of the room. My phone buzzed and I glanced down at it. 555-230-8927. Save this number as my future husband. I couldn't do anything other than smile at Colin's text, reminding me of the name he used when we first met. 
the man would most likely have his confidence shaken by my dad tomorrow. I sure as hell wouldn't want to be in Colin's position, anyway. Hell, I didn't even want to deal with dad going off on my brother's lazy ass. But I was putting off unpacking my stuff until Saturday so I could get this out of the way. I wanted dad settled, and God help me if Stevie had been sleeping all week and hadn't yet lifted a finger to help. At least we had my future husband helping out. As far as I was concerned when it came to moving, the more help, the merrier. If I was honest with myself, I was excited about this. I was excited to be around this man who excited me so much. It was time to get to know Dr. Brooks better and see if he crumbled under pressure outside of work, because he sure as hell didn't seem to let any form of pressure get to him otherwise. Chapter 13 Colin I pulled up to the Alvarez family ranch and parked next to Elena's Land Rover. People were in and out of the front door, carrying boxes and working to help Miguel get this house moved in as fast as the man would call his surgical team into the OR for a trauma-related surgery. I had to give Dr. Alvarez some credit. Never in my life would I have imagined the man to have such a badass ranch in Malibu. The house was across the Pacific Coast Highway and hidden in the mountains that overlooked the beach. The rustic yet contemporary log cabin sat peacefully overlooking the ocean and was surrounded by small pastures shaded by the mountain bluffs beyond them. This was undoubtedly any horse lover's dream if they loved the serenity of the mountains accompanied by the ability to gaze at the ocean from their front porch. The barn and horse stable sat beyond the detached garage and matched the main house with their log and slate rock exteriors. Definitely a place you couldn't easily find on the coast in Southern California. Hell, I lived on the beach twenty minutes down the road from this place, and it was an entirely different world from where I stood at Miguel's house. I knocked on the knotty pine double doors, and the one man I knew who may or may not be happy to see me answered it. Brooks, he said. He gave me a stiff nod. Then his forehead creased in humor as the man brought me in for a hug. What the hell? Didn't expect this. Damn it, it's good to see your ugly face again. I teased him like we were at the hospital. I have to admit, the old battlefield isn't the same without you there. I already know that. Get in here, he said with some humor. What brings you out here? A patient? Ready to resign that chief position already? Funny, I said, glancing around and seeing the man was entirely moved in. I was actually invited by another Dr. Alvarez. Elena came walking up, wearing a pair of overalls with a red and black checkered flannel over them. Her smile was mischievous and giddy all at once. You may know her. She's good at misleading me into believing her little white lies. My adorable and innocent Elena? Miguel laughed and draped around Elena, who held an open moving box in her hands. White lies? Never. She was more beautiful now than ever. She had a handkerchief tied around her head, holding her hair back from her face, and the red material made her bronze eyes pop more than when she wore makeup to enhance them. That's right, Poppy, she said, leaning into her dad. These are the first of the memory lane boxes you won't let that company touch. Colin and I will get them up into the attic. Colin and I were just about to catch up, kid, Miguel said. I'm ready for a beer, and now that the boxes are unpacked and moved in, it's time to relax. Elena bit down on her lower lip when my eyes met hers, knowing she'd lured me out here to spend time with her dad, but this time he wasn't my co-worker. He was the father of the woman I was infatuated with. I could see it in her challenging smile, and I could sense it in Miguel, but at the moment, I was somewhat lost. Was Miguel going to sit me down and tell me to keep my ass far away from his daughter? Or was he poking back at Elena and on my side with the fact that the man didn't need help moving in, as it was apparent he'd hired a company to do most of the work for him? Nah, there was no way Miguel was taking my side over his beautiful and tricky daughter. You told me you needed help moving in, and I dropped everything to show up and find out you hired a company to do most of the work. 
Colin offered to help too, and now look at us. That's why I'm offering up a beer, he smirked. At eight in the morning? Elena raised an eyebrow to her dad. I don't think so. You need to unpack your office. Stevie needs to wake his ass up and help unpack his stuff. And there is a room full of boxes of stuff from us kids I need to get up into the attic, she challenged her dad. You go wake Stevie up and get back to your office. We'll relax with a beer later, old man. Miguel shrugged. And you think you can handle that one? He asked as Elena turned to give directions to a group of movers who had walked in with more boxes. Good God, Brooks. You're in over your head with her. I see I've been the topic of conversation. I smiled, following him into the house. Well, when my Laney comes home saying that a handsome fellow who goes by the name Dr. Colin Brooks proposed to her on the dance floor, then yes. He turned back and smirked at me before he clapped me on the arm. Anyone who takes that kind of interest in my daughter becomes the topic of conversation in my family. He glanced over at his daughter as she spun around and walked toward us. And allowing you to spend time with her might keep her off my butt for a while. Oh, Poppy, Elena came back with a laugh. Get to your office. Colin, you're with me. Miguel nodded. Gee, thanks for the help. He chuckled, then disappeared, and left Elena and me to haul boxes up to a massive attic. Elena was on a mission to clear the boxes out of the room where they'd been stacked. We worked to organize the boxes in sections, and I studied a picture of a strikingly beautiful woman that had slipped out of a box with the name Lydia scrawled on the side. It looks like the genetics of beauty run strong in your family, I said. Elena chuckled and took the portrait of the woman from my hand. This is my older sister, Lydia, she said. She's gorgeous, right? I studied the sharp features of Lydia's face. Her piercing green eyes made me feel as if she were sizing me up through the picture alone, and her ruby red lips set off her thick, pitch black hair. She was beautiful, that was certain but I'd been around my fair share of beautiful women who had a similar, mysterious look in their eyes. I looked back at Elena's bronze eyes as she patiently watched me, and those feelings I felt the first night I saw this lively woman returned. She was perfect in every way and soothing to a soul that had been searching too long to find its other half. Not nearly as gorgeous as you, I said. Well, you'd be the first to think that she responded with a laugh. Lydia's even won some pretty fierce modeling competitions. That wouldn't surprise me at first glance, I pursed my lips. But she's not as beautiful as my future wife. Elena's cheeks tinted pink. Get over here. I need some help with this heavy box. I followed Elena over to her section and saw where she had a box open. This one, I asked, seeing ribbons and trophies in it. Yeah, I need it moved over here. Hold up. I knelt when I saw a picture of a teenage girl, dressed in an equestrian riding outfit and holding on to a stunning thoroughbred. Is this you? I asked, pulling out the old golden picture frame. Elena laughed. That's Cookie and me. He was the best jumper around. I can tell. He won a hell of a lot of trophies and ribbons, I said seeing first place written on pretty much everything in this box. Hey, I did some of the work for us to get those, too. She reached into the box, pulling out a picture of the horse standing alone. I miss this guy, she said, running her fingers over the image. You enjoyed jumping, then? I asked, intrigued to find out more about her. Well, the adrenaline part was mostly what kept me going. I would sneak Cookie out of the stables, and we'd race through the mountain trails so that I could feel his power surging through him. So, I smiled at her soft expression. Is the woman who has captivated me into horses? I love them. They're therapeutic to ride. To feel that raw power come to life and turn the reins loose? I love every minute of it. I know how you feel. I grew up doing the same. Perhaps we crossed paths during a competition once? Perhaps, she said playfully. 
Maybe one day I'll find another feisty horse like Cookie and use my weekends off to come here to feel the freedom of being on the horse again. I eyed her, seeing the look of wonder in her eyes, and the first and only thought that hit me was fulfilling her wish. Hey, I saw that your dad had three or four beautiful thoroughbreds out in that pasture. Not good enough for you? Elena laughed and folded up the box top. No, she said. Two of those horses are being boarded here, and the other two are Dad's and Stevie's. I wasn't living in California when Dad and Stevie bought them. They got them from some ranch in the Central Valley. Great horses, but I would have saved up a bit more money and bought from Nat Summers. I laughed in response to that. What? Elena returned my laugh. My old man knew Grant Nat Summers. I knocked out his son in a fight in the seventh grade, but hey. I bet I could still get you a good deal on one of his horses. They are the best, I chuckled. Well then, she rocked back and sat on her heels. There's no hope for you and me for sure now. I knew there was a reason I couldn't date you. I'll make you a promise here and now. I smiled at her confidently. Another promise, she smiled as she pointed to the box. I need that over here, you goof. I picked up the box and followed Elena to a darker corner of her section in the attic. Then I stopped her when I put my arm up on a stack of boxes, our bodies so close that I could hardly handle the energy between us. Okay, what's the promise? Elena asked, crossing her arms and arching her eyebrow at me. Another Christmas tree? A horse ornament? No, let's call it a prediction. I pursed my lips at her challenging grin. I'll get your Christmas tree and have you in my arms as my future fiancé, all while securing a chestnut stallion as your wedding gift. She burst into laughter, the same as me, knowing it was ridiculous, but it was fun and I was confident it would happen. I saw the way she looked at me, and I just needed to gain her trust. I'll hold you to that. Let's go get lunch, she ducked under my arm. You said you rode? Yep. I turned back to her. How the hell else would I have gotten into a fight with that spoiled Nat Summers kid? Good God, she laughed. All right, then. Let's saddle up Frisco and Brinks and take lunch out by the lake on the edge of Dad's property. Do you want to know where I got my little white lies from? It's that man. He made it seem as though he had no help to move, and Dr. Mitchell was going to come after all of us for allowing a man with his blood pressure to unpack his entire house. She rolled her eyes. I could have gotten my whole house unpacked today. Well, let's make the best out of your dad misleading you, and then me, into coming out here. I'm curious to learn more about the woman I'm about to spend quite a lot of money on a horse for. On the day that this woman walked back into my life at St. John's, if someone had told me that I'd be on horseback, riding on my way to have egg salad sandwiches with her by a lake, I would have told them they'd lost their minds. Elena was becoming more intriguing to me by the hour. This fun yet strangely romantic affair was more consuming to me than trying to get her into bed. That was saying something for the type of man I'd always been, but I was adamant about locking down a relationship with her no matter what. And I wanted to know everything about her. Elena and I managed to saddle Frisco and Brinks in record time, and as soon as we set off, everything came back, as if I hadn't skipped a day of riding since my teenage years. I smiled and followed the feisty, spirited woman who encouraged both horses into a race up through the mountainside on a dirt path. This was as exhilarating as bringing my car up to top speeds on late nights when the freeways were clear, and it was as close as it got to bringing my street bike at an aggressive speed while cruising up PCH. It was freedom and an escape, and what better person to do this with than the woman who drew me in more every time I was with her. We climbed up to the mountain ridge, and Elena slowed her horse when a pasture opened up, displaying a small lake with a canoe and dock. All of it seemed like it was from another place. It was hard to imagine we were still in Southern California. I lounged on my side, propped up on an elbow on the blanket Elena had laid on the grass, facing the serene pond, 
and I bit into the delicious egg salad sandwich that was more than fitting for our view. So, Alvarez, I said, looking at her where she sat, cross-legged and watching the horses graze without their bridles. What's your story? My story? She smiled back at me. Yeah, I need to know specifics since I'm marrying you. Okay, future husband. My story. She gave me a teasing wink that only made me adore her more, and she gazed up at the sky, holding on to her sandwich. I grew up here. My parents divorced when I was young. My mom easily got custody and moved us to Miami, where I graduated high school. Then I went on to college. I was fascinated by the stories I'd heard from Dad's profession. So two years into that, good God, woman, I laughed. That's a highlight reel. Well, what do you want to know? I seriously have no idea why you're on this crazy road to marry me anyway. She laughed the laugh that I'd fallen in love with from our very first conversation. You mentioned you were fascinated by your dad's profession. I smirked at her brilliant eyes, which basically affirms that you're already fascinated by me since I'm doing that exact job. Then I decided I didn't want to be a neurosurgeon, she challenged with a bite into her egg salad, giving me a funny expression and crossing her eyes in a silly way that made me laugh. You wanted to be a shrink instead? She reached into the bag of chips she brought and tossed one into her mouth. I don't know. I realized that doing such a high-risk job wasn't quite my style. I would rather be the one to help those who have to deal with the life changes that an injury could cause them. You know, she looked at me, more serious now, it's devastating and could happen to anyone. One minute, life is normal, and you're dancing around or driving down the road, and the next minute, you're waking up in the hospital with a disability that you never saw coming. That's a difficult tragedy to deal with. I want to be their advocate when their minds see nothing but defeat. I watched the way you consulted Mr. Newman's family. You did a good job with them. That family was torn in every way possible after his accident. The irreparable damage that had been done to his spine is indeed a tragedy. He'll be paralyzed for life. Those things sit with me, knowing that I can't fix the problem in cases like his and give him his life back. From the medical records and your notes, she eyed me, you did better than any surgeon I'd met in fixing the areas to help give him a fighting chance to use his hands. Sometimes, in surgery, a surgeon gets lucky and finds something he can repair. I instinctively knew there was something more. I managed to find and repair it, and I was grateful when I made my rounds and saw that he had some movement in his hands again. You realize that he can still overcome just by using the hope with the start you gave him. I heard you loud and clear on that. However, I am a scientist, and scientifically speaking, he won't completely overcome the paralysis of his legs. I said, crumbling up my napkin and putting it in the trash bag we'd brought. It's why, at first, I was concerned with you giving the family such hope and praising me. I arched an eyebrow at her. Yet you remained firm on what you read on his charts and scans. You're out of your mind if you think I'm going to plant flowers and happy-go-lucky pictures in people's minds. I never said that. But it was one of our first consultations, and I was hanging on to how you would work as a team member on the neuro ward. Well, Dr. Brooks, she eyed me, I do study charts, and I see where the mind is one powerful thing. It will take work, but if he follows my advice of mentally overcoming what science says he can't, then you'll have a patient feeling better about his altered life. That's a tough one, doctor, I said. He has to accept that he'll never walk again. So many people are crippled with disabilities that they mentally impress upon themselves, and for no reason, too. How's that? It's anything. It's waking up one day and asking, where did the time go? Why did I lose my spouse? Why do I hate my spouse? What the hell am I doing with my life? She sighed. Believe it or not, that negativity can alter minds in ways to cripple a competent individual. That's very true, I said with a smile. And how do you get through a situation that you don't mentally put yourself in? 
Like being in a wheelchair, she asked, crunching into another chip. You find other methods to live happily and appreciate that you're living and breathing and waking up to a sunrise every day. You rode that horse today. How'd that feel? Pretty fucking awesome, I answered truthfully. Therapeutic, wasn't it? She asked. Yes, I grinned. Are you trying to get into my head now, my sexy little shrink? She blushed, and I loved that she responded to my flirting like this in a fun way, instead of getting pissed about it. One day, I hope to have a rehab center with horses. They have them here in Southern California. But what a dream to have a place where I can treat my patients, who can't easily recover, and give them freedom and the thrill of the accomplishment of riding a horse. Many have broken through with their diagnoses for life in a wheelchair after equine therapy, you know. Well, we'll call it Elena's Equine Miracle Therapy. Nice. She rubbed her hands together and folded up the chip bag. How about you and I take a ride in that canoe? I looked to the lake and the canoe and laughed at the thought of us doing this. I was hoping we could just call it what it is between us. You allow me to call you Elena from now on, and we make out up here in the middle of nowhere. Nice try, bud, she rose. Let's go. I'll show you a little about my story that you asked about earlier. Balancing and trying to get into the canoe without tipping it over was a laugh all on its own. Still, once we were in, Elena sat perfectly straight, gently pulling the water through her paddle, and we escaped life, finding ourselves together in this unique moment. So this is it, eh? I asked, rowing my oar to the rhythm of hers. This is Elena's story, riding in a canoe. Hell, I knew I fell for an adventurous woman for a reason. Getting bored back there? She glanced over her shoulder. Well, we're rowing, and your ass looks sexy in overalls, I answered. Elena turned and hit me with the smile I'd been hoping I'd see today. All right, don't move. Hold still, she said, moving closer to the middle of the canoe. About time you kiss me, I said. Don't move, she said with a smile. She exhaled, steadying her hands on the sides of the canoe, gripping the rim, and it wobbling in response. I watched in curiosity as she blew out another breath, and then my eyes went from her perfect cleavage to her feet as they started pointing toward the bottom of the boat while she began to bend her knees. What the hell are you doing? I asked. Don't move, damn it! She laughed, froze, and then I watched in awe as she did some crazy acrobat shit and slowly brought herself to hold her legs up in the air, body completely erect. The woman was doing some crazy handstand by holding onto the rim of the boat. Jesus Christ, I said, marveling at her and trying to figure out how the hell she'd pulled off this crazy yoga canoe maneuver. Pretty awesome, huh? She said her white teeth brilliantly shining through this upside-down Elena grin. You're insanely talented. Want to try it? she asked with a laugh that shook the boat. Don't move! Don't move! I tried to steady the canoe, but made it worse. Oh, hell, I said, as Elena erupted into laughter, and the boat flipped both of us into the water when her weight shifted. Elena came up directly after me and pinched the water from her nose. I smoothed my hair back and cleared the water from my eyes while I caught the canoe from drifting away. And you just came up with that. That's some crazy acrobat shit. I did it all the time up here as a kid. I got bored with floating on rafts and the canoes since the lake is so small, and I got creative and taught myself that stunt. I'm shocked I can still do it. You're pretty fucking amazing, I said, as I pulled her closer to the canoe and she pulled herself in before helping me up. After enjoying Elena's personality now more than ever, I was beginning to ache for the woman to allow me in more. She kept my sorry ass at arm's length, and I was as patient as I could be. I loved the challenge, and Elena Alvarez was my greatest challenge yet. I was going to use a little bit of her advice in pursuing her as well. It was a mental challenge, and instead of being pissed as hell that I couldn't so much as seal a deal on a kiss tonight, 
I'd get that kiss and much more later. Now just wasn't the time. I was about to take off after we got back to her dad's place, but Miguel insisted I stay for his famous Cuban sandwiches. Best damn sandwich I've ever eaten. I swallowed another savory bite after Miguel asked what I thought, then looked at Elena. Aside from your delicious egg salad today, of course. She gets that from her mother, Miguel laughed. And I can cook as well as my poppy, too, she teased back. So, Steve spoke up, eyes bloodshot from whatever he'd been smoking on all day. Is James Mitchell going to give me a shot to pitch my idea or what? He asked me and I instantly felt the previously happy atmosphere at the table disappear. The DJ thing, right? I smiled. Exactly what do you want Mr. Mitchell to fund? Me, man, he answered, as if he were the solution to every businessman's problems. Have you finished college? I asked, wondering if the kid was serious. What reason do you think a billion-dollar man and his empire would want to invest in... A kid who smokes weed all day and sleeps until the afternoon? Elena cut me off. Yeah, the weed thing isn't going to seal any deals for the big guy, I said. I get you must love music, and I'm down with all of that. But you've got to keep human hours, man. Exactly, Elena said. I'm at the club making a name for myself, he said. I keep real human hours. I could tell Miguel struggled with his son's life choices by his expression alone, and the way Elena fired up like she was about to eat her brother alive reaffirmed that. Oh, Stevie, please, Elena said, holding up her hand as if to shut him up before she looked at me. I'm sorry about this. Don't apologize. I was once wild and carefree, too. You have to be real with yourself, Steve, I said. You have to get your ass back into college. You want to milk Poppy for everything and live here for the rest of your life? Trust me, bringing chicks back to your parents' place isn't ideal. I arched an eyebrow at him. You've got some strong family genes in you. Don't waste them. What's college going to do for me? It doesn't give me any life experience. Life experience, he says, Elena interjected, rolling her eyes. It was painfully obvious they'd had this conversation too many times. You like music and mixing all that up, right? I asked. Yeah, I'm an artist. Then head into college, striving to learn more in an artistic field. You could even do sound engineering, I said. At your age, a lot of people have no idea what they want to be. It's natural. But you've got to take a step in that direction, and it'll come to you. I took a sip of my beer. Yeah, I guess, he reluctantly agreed. Maybe just to shut me up, but whatever. Start small and work your way up. You can't get shit done without a degree these days, so life experience isn't going to help much in the long run. Not anymore. The sky is the limit with grounded dreams and goals. You'll get them. Thank God someone speaks sense, and hopefully the boy listens, Miguel said. Steve stood. Thanks for dinner, Poppy. Nice to see you again, Colin. Later, sis, he said, tapping her on her shoulder. In one ear and right out the other, Elena said, as Steve walked out. Well, it's the first time he said thank you for dinner, Miguel laughed. I'm going to talk to him some more. I swear I will lose my shit if he goes out and clubs all night tonight, she said. Elena left a smiling Miguel and me at the table. She's been up his ass since she moved back, he laughed. And here I have you at my table now, too. He took a swig of his beer. Damn it, Colin Brooks. I want to be pissed off at you for going after my little girl, but I can't. I have to warn you, though. Elena is her own woman. She's made that clear, especially since I can't call her Elena. It's only Dr. Alvarez for me. I laughed. You know, he arched an eyebrow at me. She wouldn't let you this close to her if she didn't have the slightest feelings for you. She's fun and tough all at once. Fire and ice, I smirked. One way to put it, and somehow that sweet daughter of mine thrills my heart to be around her. 
he leaned back in his chair, beer in hand. Babies are usually born screaming their heads off, he said, and then his eyes became distant. But not my Laney. That child came into this world with big, curious eyes and a smile as bright as the one she wears to this day. Yeah? I shouldn't have been surprised. Of course she'd be a perfect baby. Laney's eyes were always searching for something, always dazzling with wonder in them. I knew then we had a special little girl, and I can't fathom seeing her heart crushed. He looked at me with a half-smile. Tread carefully with her, Brooks, he said, with some warning in his voice. She's a wild and free spirit that can't be tamed. She has a soul that strives to see the good in everything and find adventure anywhere she can find it. I have to say that's what captivated me about her, I answered honestly. From the first moment that I saw her, I knew she was a special woman. So long as you keep that in mind, I won't feel the need to kick your ass. She's an angel, so don't you dare try to clip her wings or break her heart. I stood, knowing I only had an hour to meet up with Jake and Ash for Ash's art gallery Christmas presentation. I enjoyed the day. It was really fantastic to see you again. Miguel nodded. You too, Brooks, he said, standing with me. I'll tell Elena you took off. You're seeing her tomorrow, right? I smirked. We have the St. John's Christmas Gala, and I promise to unpack her place, I said, making Miguel laugh. Glad those parties are all behind me. I wish I could retire just to get out of them, I chuckled. Good night, Miguel. You have an impressive home, and I know Jake will be delighted with this location for your blood pressure issues. Give my best to Jake, and you keep doing what you're doing. I hear nothing but great things through the hospital grapevine. That's good to know. I smiled and took my exit, not knowing where the hell Elena went, but I wasn't about to get into the middle of her roasting her brother's ass for being stoned as fuck tonight. The next morning, after falling asleep to images of Elena's face, I found myself excited to go to this Christmas gala. The threat of Miguel kicking my ass, especially after hearing him confirm his daughter was as special as I thought her to be, would probably hang over my head for the rest of my life if he had his way. I didn't even have her yet, but I knew there was no way I would hurt that woman. If I didn't get close to anywhere with her tonight, after the Christmas party, then my idea of buying a fresh-cut Christmas tree had better be a game-changer. Chapter 14 Elena I had just finished fastening the stubborn top button of my dress when I heard a rhythmic knock on my door. I smiled at my reflection in the mirror, knowing it was Colin, and my heart felt like it was going to beat out of the top of my simple spaghetti strap dress. Be right there, I called from my room, which was a maze of boxes scattered around the mattress that was lying on the floor. The only thing put together in this disaster of a place was me, and I was on my way to walk out the door. I opened the door to the brilliant smile that had officially smitten me, and I saw Colin was dressed in a dark, navy, three-piece suit, looking like a million bucks. I expected no less, though. I see you brought your A-game, I teased. And I see you didn't even have to try to bring yours, he said reaching for a piece of my hair that didn't make it into the stylish bun I'd twisted my hair into, which was being held together by a silver clip and a prayer. I tucked the loose strands into the back of my hair, hoping that would do the trick. Like the dress? I asked, giving him a twirl with a laugh. The last time I'd worn this thing was underneath my cap and gown at my college graduation. I had no idea why I twirled around, because there was nothing special to see. The dress was plain, blue, and form-fitting from my chest to my knees. Not exactly hot date attire, but whatever. I was trying to be casual as I watched the dangerously handsome man admiring me, and I could feel all of my female parts urging to blow off this gala and take him to bed, currently known as my mattress on the floor. Did a bomb go off in here? Your place is a disaster, 
he finally said. You're the one who insisted we go to this Christmas party, I said, as his eyes roamed over my body. I'm about to call Jim and tell him to find another prodigy of a neurosurgeon to help honor our new pediatric doctor with the prestigious award the company is offering tonight. His lips pursed. You're so impossibly beautiful. He cocked his head to the side. But this look you're giving me has me stumped. The look of wanting to strip you down and ravage your body? I thought, biting my lower lip. Are you upset we're going to this thing? I don't want to pressure you. Honest he said. That made me smile. Finally, the man couldn't get into my mind with the expressions that always seemed to give me away. Of course I am. I toyed with him. Let me get my jacket so we can get out of here. Jesus Christ, I really should help you clean this place up, I heard him say while I plucked my white wool dress coat off a hanger. We'll be busy tomorrow, I teased. Let's go. I love this apartment, but having boxes everywhere stresses me out. We're going to handle it, he said, as I followed him out to his car. Holy shit, I said, when his metallic gray Lamborghini came into my view. You're kidding me, right? He smiled as the door opened to the passenger side. I'm not kidding you. This car is my baby. I've had it for less than a year, he said as he closed the door behind me and walked around to get into the driver's seat. You're the only woman who's ridden in it. So now, it's my favorite of the cars I own. And... He grinned at me as I checked out the cockpit of this insanely awesome car. And... I can most certainly outperform this car since you mentioned last week that I was... He paused while working with his crazy GPS computer screen of a radio. Overcompensating for lacking in certain areas? That's it, he said looking over his shoulder and taking off as the radio started playing where it must have left off when Colin shut off the car. I smiled at the song and artist. Leonard Skinner, eh? You'll find I'm a bit of a classic rock, blues, and soul kind of guy. You name it, I can most likely sing the song and know the artist. Oh? I smiled, seeking comfort in the smells of rich leather, Colin's sweet and sensual cologne, and the seat itself. You're a music man, too. I found it interesting you had Seeger playing when you finished up your surgery. Colin laughed as he casually reclined in his seat, his right hand smoothly shifting gears while the other casually steered. That song was meant just for you. He smiled ahead as we drove up the on-ramp to the freeway, merging with traffic. Night moves? I laughed, the music chilling out my nerves as I enjoyed this ride. Nice. Hey. Music says what the heart wants. Then why the hell do you have Rob Zombie's Living Dead Girl on your playlist? I asked, pointing at the songs that varied from Aretha Franklin to Sinatra and Led Zeppelin to Otis Redding. You name it, this guy had the best hits from soul to classic rock and rhythm and blues. It's a badass song. Here, he ran his fingers up the touchscreen, and the music titles seemed to scroll on for forever. Pick a song. There's at least two hundred or a thousand on my playlist, he said with a laugh. I'm pretty sure you'll enjoy my taste. In fact, I know you'll love it since I'm profoundly in touch with my music and my love for it. Okay, then, I said. I'll pick a song, and you, Mr. Music Guy, have to sing the song to prove just how in touch with it you are. Go. He pointed toward the windshield, dropping the hammer on this car and moving at what seemed to be light speed to the fast lane, only to slow down and pace with the traffic. I clicked on the Aerosmith song, Sweet Emotion, to which Colin instantly started to tap his fingers to the rhythm on his steering wheel. The instrumental intro sounded so killer in this car, and I felt like I was in the recording studio. Want to hear a fun fact about this song? He asked. I'd love to. My mood was lifted as I enjoyed this drive, watching different aspects of Colin's personality emerging. He was a constant, absolutely delightful surprise. The band was in the studio with all their shit, ready to record this song. He shifted lanes to move around the guy who wouldn't stop tapping his brakes in front of us. Anyway, he said as the song moved into the lyrics. They had everything set to record, but somehow there weren't any maracas for the intro and the song. Steven Tyler was pissed, but being the genius musician he is, 
he improvised. Collins smiled over at me. What, did he make that sound with his mouth or something? Collins softly laughed. No, he saw a sugar packet on the ground, picked the thing up, told the studio to turn up his mic, and he shook the thing like it was a maraca. You can't even tell, can you? Wow, I said with a laugh. That's wild. You know your musicians, but you still haven't proved you know their music. Turn it to another song, then. Trust me, Alvarez, I know my music. Okay, I scrolled through, and as I was trying to navigate the sensitive touchscreen, I accidentally chose the wrong song. Oops, oh shit, I said with a laugh. Colin smirked over at me. Bad company? I exhaled as I watched him fall into the rhythm of this song. And for the record, this song is dedicated directly to you, Alvarez. Feel like making love? I laughed at the title that Colin started singing. In a perfect voice, I might add. Instead of being uncomfortable, Colin made me laugh and become highly entertained as he poked my shoulder and pointed to me every time it referred to making love to you. I need to find a harder one, I said. I'm making this too easy on you. Colin chuckled. Not my fault you absently picked the perfect song for the way I'm feeling by having you in my car. I scrolled and decided I couldn't find anything to stump him. Then I found one I liked and wasn't surprised that Colin had almost every song from the Allman Brothers band. Soulshine. He smiled and started to change his entire demeanor. This is one of my favorite songs. As Colin sang, it was apparent that this was a favorite of his, given how enthusiastically he sang along as if I weren't even in the car. He was so beautiful, sitting there and singing lyrics to a song that had always been soothing to my soul. Everything he did seemed to make me fall a little deeper for him. After close to an hour of jukebox driving with Colin, I was thoroughly entertained and almost completely forgot we were heading to this expensive hotel and Christmas gala. Colin was out of the car and buttoning his suit jacket as the valet came over to retrieve his keys. He was quickly at my door, holding out his hand for me to help hoist myself out of his car in my restrictive dress. Colin pulled my hand into the bend of his arm without skipping a beat and covered my fingers with his other hand. Look at what a gentleman you are. See? He smiled down at me. I'm a considerate man, aren't I? I never said you weren't. I said as we walked through the exquisitely decorated hotel lobby to the area where ushers were guiding the St. John's staff. It's time we go ahead and let the hospital gossiping crows discover that they were right about you and me. Right about what? You know exactly what. I know you've heard shit flying around the hospital airwaves about you and me. I laughed. All I've heard is how Dr. Brooks is obsessed with Dr. Alvarez, and he tried to cover it up by kissing everyone in the cafeteria the other day. Colin rolled his eyes as I walked into the elite room that had been set up for all of us. My eyes must have nearly popped out of my head when I saw the insanely rich elegance of the room. I cleared my throat and stopped our progress into the room, being in more shock than I imagined. You still with me, Alvarez? Colin asked, standing next to me as if I hadn't already drawn attention to us, as I looked around like a toddler at Disneyland. There were shimmering crystal chandeliers, and a stage was backlit like we were at some award ceremony. Velvet red covers were placed over the chairs and tied in the back with white satin sashes, and everyone was very formally dressed. Tuxedos and floor-length gowns everywhere. I wasn't dressed for this. I wasn't even dressed to work at the front desk of this hotel. As I took in everything, the realization that I shouldn't have expected anything less almost made me feel like an idiot. I mean, the hospital bathrooms at St. John's looked like they belonged in the Ritz-Carlton, so why would I think I could get away with dressing like I was going to a backyard barbecue? Want to go back to my place and have sex on a moving box? I leaned in and whispered to the tall man standing regally at my side. Unequivocally, yes, he answered. Then I felt his thumb smooth over my hand that was clenching the inside of his arm. Just let me rearrange the ceremony real quick and tell Jim that I'm handing out the final award before drinks are served and the ceremony begins. I'm serious. I am too, he said. Then I looked up into his soft blue and loving eyes. Let's get the hell out of here.
I'm only here to give that award, and I don't give a shit when it's given out. He grinned, especially after you offered me the one thing I've wanted to hear come out of your mouth since I first met you. I exhaled. This is way too formal for me, I finally said, and stepped off to the side. Is the adrenaline junkie afraid of formal affairs? He challenged with an arch of his eyebrow. I'm not appropriately dressed for this, not by a mile. I may as well be wearing flip-flops. If you ask me, you're overdressed for it. He chuckled, and then his lips came to my ear, his warm breath causing goosebumps to spike all over my neck. I'll fix all of that later, though. You're already starting to get nasty looks from some of the staff. He pulled back some and smiled down at me. That means you're doing everything right. If it isn't the two doctors of the night, Jake said, walking up to us. Why the hell are you two standing in the back when you know Jim has our asses planted in the front row? Of course he does, I groaned, and I smirked at Colin and Jake as they exchanged glances, proving I was behaving like a total chicken shit. Fine, take me to the front row, and let's give everyone something to amuse themselves over. What, that you're here with this chump? Jake laughed and glanced out at the room filled with doctors, nurses, various other staff, and board members, the people who breathed life into St. John's. Trust me, there's going to be a lot of pissed-off guys tonight because you're here with this arrogant prick. I chuckled. Let's go. Where are the ladies? Colin asked as we followed Jake, weaving through the tables. If there are any guests in attendance who can keep Dr. Alvarez here until the end of this gala, it's Avery and Ash. Avery's already got our food spread at the table. Jake glanced back at me. You're going to enjoy yourself, he said as he smiled. The gals looked the same way you did when they entered. I saw your eyes bulge when you and Colin walked in. Good to know. And they're sort of used to this, right? I asked. Hell no, Colin said as we rounded a table toward one where I saw Jim, Jake's older brother. They despise this shit. They're just good women to put up with this nonsense when their men need their beauty and support. He chuckled as we arrived at the table, and Jim stood and smiled. I think you remember Jim? This is all his idea to keep us feeling loved by the company that owns St. John's. He said, then pointed to the other man I saw in the observation room. This Johnny Depp wannabe is Alex. I think you remember him? I shook both men's hands and laughed. Wow, you do resemble a young Johnny Depp, I said, while everyone at the table laughed. That's a pretty great problem to have. He hates it, but whatever puts a woman on his arm, he'll take, Jake said, walking over to a beautifully dressed brunette. This is my wife, Ash. He looked at the bright-eyed young woman. Ash, this is the woman you've heard about since Colin. It's nice to meet you, Elena, she said, cutting off whatever insult Jake was about to pay his best friend. Sorry to interrupt my husband, but if we let him and Colin go on a witty word exchange, they'll kick all of us out of here. We've got to get out of here somehow, Jake smirked at Ash, then Colin. It's nice to see you again, Elena, Jim said, eyeing Colin mischievously as we took our seats at the table. This is my fiancé, Avery. Colin might have... I haven't said a word about it. Colin cut off Jim as he introduced Avery. Very nice to meet you, Avery said, her dark hair making her blue eyes stand out like bright bulbs on a Christmas tree. Now that introductions are over... Colin said. What are you drinking, Alvarez? I'll have a glass of Pinot Grigio, I said, putting in my order and settling at the table with the most influential people in the room. Yet it felt like I was eating with the most casual people in the world. Where's Summer? Colin asked Alex. Don't tell me. Jim's got her working overtime. Quit. Jim eyed Alex. This dipshit. He bit his lower lip and glanced over at me. Sorry about the language. Oh, please don't apologize. I haven't been a priest for years. I teased. Hallelujah for that, Colin said as he raised his glass. Please continue. What happened? I asked curiously. Nothing more than me breaking things off with Jim's secretary. She then decided to quit her job, working for a great boss and getting paid way more than she deserved, if you ask me. Alex answered. She was, and you know it. I paid her what I thought she was worth. If she wants to walk away from that, so be it. There are plenty of people to promote into her position. Jim added nonchalantly. 
Jim warned you about screwing around with her and that he'd make you pay if she quit on him because you couldn't hold down your fake relationship, Jake added. Let's get off the topic. Alex smiled at me. Sophisticated adults shouldn't be gossiping about such trivial bullshit. Colin held on to the first part of the word, calling out his friend. That's exactly what I said and how I said it, Jake challenged. Let's talk about the wedding, shall we? Jim said, shooting Colin another mysterious glance. Have you told Elena about your bright idea? Wait, I said, laughing, watching these men poking at each other like grumpy bears. Colin and I have discussed this, and trust me, we're not getting married anytime soon. No, Jim said in a low voice with a laugh like he knew the best part of this conversation was yet to come. Colin has volunteered a beautiful young woman to stand at his side during mine and Avery's wedding. I'm sure he's brought this God in heaven, Mitch, Colin said, handing me my glass of wine. Just chug that one down. I have three more coming right behind it. I forgot to mention you'd be sitting at the table with a bunch of animals dressed in expensive suits. I sipped the wine and watched Jim smirk at Colin and then wink at me. You'll get used to us. In fact, he took a sip of his bourbon. We could be the reason you want nothing to do with Colin. So if you're looking for an out... Don't listen to these guys, Avery said before she eyed Jim. Why don't we switch it up a little and let all you boneheads sit and ruin each other's nights over on that side of the table? We girls can enjoy our peace with food and drinks while we watch you all act like buffoons. Sounds like a plan to me, Ash said. I glanced at Colin, closing his eyes in utter annoyance, and laughed. See? He looked at me helplessly. I can't even sit next to you at dinner because we all act like we're five. Sucks for you, Jake laughed. Tell me about your wedding, I said, smiling at Avery and smoothing my hand over Colin's leg and letting it rest there. After our fun trip here, the gang at the table seemingly fun and more to my taste than the room I was underdressed for, I was enjoying myself thoroughly. Things moved along smoothly as soon as the jokes started flying, and any regret I may have previously had about coming was erased. Chapter 15 Colin as I came to expect, Elena and I were separated for most of the evening. I watched her discreetly while I conversed with different colleagues. I wasn't shocked to find that Avery and Ash would, through Elena, become friends with most of this gala's attendees. Elena took them around the room, introducing them to different staff members as if she'd known them all for fifty years. There was something so charming about how people instantly warmed up to Elena and I loved that she made instantaneous friends with anyone near her, especially my best friend's ladies. It seemed to me that Avery and Ash were still trying to gain their bearings with the status and perks that came along with being partnered with a world-renowned cardiovascular surgeon and a CEO. Dealing with that on its own might have been easier if the two didn't also happen to be worth billions. The ladies didn't come from wealth the way the guys and I did and all I could say was that they navigated the challenges of excess and extravagance gracefully, and they helped keep us all grounded in the meantime. Avery liked to keep things real at all times, and whenever we went to her and Jim's place, Avery's little girl insisted on having Big Macs for dinner. So if that didn't constitute keeping us grounded, I don't know what would. Ash had a rough start at this life with Jake and it's a wonder she decided to stick around after some of the shit the nastier Rodeo Drive elitists put her through. Thank God for her resilience, because if she'd have run for the hills, something I wouldn't have blamed her for doing, we wouldn't have been blessed with their son last year. Now here I was, standing with my glass of Tanqueray, watching Elena fall right into place. I was beginning to wonder if some fairy godmother out there was granting wishes and was, one by one, delivering us our soulmates. I had to get this woman to let me into her life. I wasn't the only one besotted by the woman either. She was a beautiful, dancing flame, and we were all moths, flying wildly to it. With how nasty hospital gossip could get, People should have hated Elena with all the attention she garnered in the short amount of time she'd been at St. John's, but I saw none of that. 
Instead, I was watching Elena blend in with Ash and Avery and about four other women, laughing as if they were friends catching up at a high school reunion. No one could despise the woman even if they wanted to. Her heart, spirit, and vivacity made her one of the most beloved individuals at the hospital, and I wasn't the only one she'd captivated. She had good energy, and it was an energy that was like a breath of fresh air every time she was around. Which was why I wasn't surprised when the half-drunk doctors started making their way to her to ask her to dance. Now, I was fortunate to stand here in this boring conversation and watch her take that perfectly round ass of hers for a spin around the dance floor. I see you brought Elena tonight, one of the doctors next to me said. I took a sip of my gin and turned to face the group. And that makes me the luckiest man at the party. I raised my glass to one of my fellow neurologists. The older man smiled. She's an anomaly, a huge asset to the group. It's why she got the job, I answered. Though, Jake walked up next to me after being off somewhere, mingling with God knows who like he always did. Word has it that the only reason she got the job was that the douche chief neurosurgeon handed it to her. His obsession over the woman made that gossip hotline after, Okay, enough. I laughed at Jake's humored grin. You only wish you had her on your floor to work mental miracles with your patients. I smiled at Dr. Glenn. Turns out the neuro ward is quite blessed. That's the truth, Dr. Glenn agreed. In fact, I might have to steal her for another consult in a week or two. She worked some miracle on my patient who was recently diagnosed with Alzheimer's. In all my experience, I've never seen someone share a brighter way of accepting it. Wasn't that Mr. Stone? I asked. Recalling this diagnosis was quite tragic for this particular family, as Alzheimer's diagnoses always are. It's why Elena was first in line when she saw the distress on Dr. Glenn's face when he had to meet with them again. Yeah, Dr. Glenn shook his head. I don't know how she does it, but she took over when she saw them struggling as I listed statistics for the family. She has a sixth sense, it seems, for knowing what people need to hear. There's no easy way to break that to any family, much less the Stone family, I said. What did she say? Jake asked. In short, she reminded them not to let the disease define your life. Each day was a gift, and that Alzheimer's, though a devastating diagnosis, wasn't what defined Mr. Stone. Each of us has something that can take us and try and ruin us, but fighting for what we love the most is always worth it. He shrugged and looked out toward Elena, being spun around the dance floor. To live each day as if he was blessed to have a new day. It might not seem like the most earth-moving advice, but it was what they needed to hear. It's sort of the motto we all try to live by. Dr. Sharon added. But when you think about it, we don't. We all take life for granted. I confirmed that truth. Hell, all day I'm working with aneurysms, strokes, tumors, and shit that comes out of nowhere. You'd think I would personally wake up with that mentality. I know the science, the many complications our bodies can hand us at any given moment, and I still forget to appreciate my health and the fact that I fucking woke up this morning. All I know is that what she said got through to them, and a positive outlook means everything with such a diagnosis. She's exceptionally gifted to know just what to say, Dr. Glenn added. Miguel would definitely be proud, Dr. Sharon said, her beige painted lips smiling widely. His daughter seems to be more than just your average psych doctor. It seems Miguel instilled good values in his children. Jake said. He's done a lot of good, nearly sacrificing his health to make a difference for others. And what does he do? Fucking retires to his horse ranch. Now he's living the good life that his dance machine out there suggests we all do. Regardless of the rumors about his retirement, he didn't give up. He found a healthier and better way to live when most of us don't know how to let go. 
and he's been able to appreciate what his hard work gave him, Dr. Naroshi added. I miss the hell out of that know-it-all. He nudged me with a smile. Now we're stuck with this joker to consult and beg to attend our surgeries. Yeah, yeah, we all know there's no replacing Dr. Alvarez, I said. But I'll do my best to try to live up to his legacy. And yes, I've noticed Alvarez Part 2 out there on the dance floor. Let's all agree that one can't walk around upset without her somehow sensing it and consulting you to turn lemons into lemonade. So original, Jake laughed as the others began talking about something else. I seriously don't know how you managed your first brain surgery in the room with that woman, Jake added, as we slowly distanced ourselves from the rest, moving to where I could have a better view of her on the dance floor. Thank God I know how to compartmentalize shit, or we would have been in that room for twenty-four hours with me trying to focus on what I do best in craniotomies. That's what makes you the badass chief on your ward. The ultimate test was seeing if you could handle performing surgery while this woman that you're blindly in love with is in the same room. And I manage just fine. And how are you managing now with that weasel, Waters, dancing slowly with your soulmate pulled tightly against his scrawny body? It takes dumb fucks like him to make me look good, I smirked at Jake. Fuck, how did you pull any of this shit off with Ash? You mean me trying to date her after the press crawled up my ass and exposed my playboy and male slut lifestyle to her and the world? I nodded my head. Precisely. I don't even have my bullshit life experiences on blast, and the woman still keeps turning my sorry ass down. I looked at Jake's grin. What? Dude, you have her, and you fucking know it, he said. She's probably playing it smart and keeping your arrogant ass from hurting her. No. I narrowed my eyes at her, playfully laughing and dancing with the idiot who brought her onto the dance floor. I can sense she's not afraid of being hurt. She's made it perfectly clear that she doesn't worry about shit like that. Then I'm stumped. Maybe she really doesn't like you. Your fancy cars, cheeky grins, and expensive suits. He laughed and eyed me while sipping his scotch. Apparently your ugly looks haven't even helped you land this woman of your dreams. We're getting a Christmas tree together tomorrow. I pinched my lips together. Fuck, did I just say that out loud? Yes, Jake laughed. A fucking Christmas tree? Shit, you're well on your way to having her cancel all her new patients and pack it up to be in Jim and Avery's wedding. All so you can work your charms on her. Well, the tree will be a symbol of our love, I said, trying to defend my acting like this Christmas tree purchase was practically a diamond ring. You do know what the evergreen tree stands for, don't you? I had to make something up. I'd already blurted this shit out to Jake as if buying Elena's tree was something monumental in starting a relationship. Trust me, man, this is a sacred... Oh, spare me your bullshit call. Jake looked at me and shook his head with humor. You might want to let Elena drive you home tonight. You're drunk. I'm solid, and that the evergreen tree is the first thing we do together... Jesus Christ, you're lucky that Jim and Alex aren't around to hear this, Jake interrupted me. You know they'd never let you live it down. He wasn't wrong. I could be corny with Jake, but the other two would never let me hear the end of it. True, I smirked. They just wouldn't understand why this evergreen tree was symbolic of mine and Elena's relationship. I'm your best friend, who knows you're always full of shit and I don't even understand what the fuck you're trying to say. So what is it about the goddamn evergreen tree? What makes it symbolic to your relationship? It's symbolic because of what it represents. I bit my lip, wondering how long Jake would play this shit out with me. Ah, and what the hell does it represent? Immortality? Jake was humoring me, obviously, so if he was going to drag this out, I was going to impart some deep, ridiculous wisdom about these goddamn trees to shut him up. Life, I said, biting back my smile. 
and for that reason it must be our first purchase. The evergreen tree will officially represent our love and life together. I tried to remain serious. Our everlasting love will shine forth from the tree I buy her. And once again, Jake shook his head, you've enlightened me in ways no other can. I know, I said. So that's why I'm thrilled to have her pick out this monumental purchase tomorrow. All this talk about green Christmas trees has me thinking, Jake said as he eyed me. What if she picks out a brown and brittle one? What's that say about your everlasting and evergreen relationship then? I highly doubt the woman will pick out a brown fucking Christmas tree. I looked over at Jake as we both laughed. Hell, I've never even been to a Christmas tree lot before, but you and I both know she'll pick out a big-ass bright green one, like everyone else who goes to buy a fucking tree, and that will be the beginning of an everlasting relationship that was always intended to be, I said, laughing at my ability to come up with the stupidest shit sometimes. You're such a fucking idiot, Jake said with a laugh as I turned to leave. Where the hell are you going, everlasting lover man? To request a song and kick this relationship into another gear. I'm ready to leave, but Elena needs something to remember this party fondly. Another dance? Jake rolled his eyes. Didn't help the first time when you did that in Vegas with Dr. Alvarez, did it? It's because the song wasn't sexy enough. It's time to cut the bullshit out and get my lady's head in the game. Speaking of ladies, I think Ash and Avery are ready to get the hell out of here. Avery was promised milkshakes at some diner, and Ash was all about it if they survived the night of dress-up. You and Elena want to bond and enhance your everlasting relationship by sharing a strawberry milkshake? You guys enjoy your night. I'm going to enjoy my woman, I said with a smile. I plan on using the excuse of sleeping over at her place since I dragged her here, and I owe her my help to unpack boxes. You're going to go back to her place to unpack boxes? Jim asked, walking up to Jake and me. Oh, shit, Alex said, trailing his best friend. You do like this woman, right? Take her back to your place. I would if her place wasn't filled with the boxes that she's delayed unpacking on my account. I smiled. Unlike you selfish bastards, I am willing to help her move in. Jake's eyes closed in humor. Have fun unpacking, and don't get too addicted to popping bubbles in the bubble wrap. See you all later, I said, waving them off and moving toward the man who was in charge of this trendy pop culture music that I would have hated had I not seen Elena dancing so cheerfully to it. I had to think of a song to set the mood to let her know I wanted to stay with her tonight and I wanted more with this woman than friendly kisses on my fucking forehead. I made her a promise I'd outperform the car I drove her in tonight, and I planned on keeping that promise, if she'd let me. Chapter 16 Colin I managed to use the car ride home to convince Elena that if she didn't let me stay to help unpack a few boxes, then she was staying at my place in Malibu. I didn't have to do too much convincing, since she was holding on to the fact that she was behind on unpacking because I'd forced her to be my date tonight. Perhaps me stealing her away from her dance partner to dance was also part of why she agreed to let me stay. Thank you, Solomon Burke, for being the original artist to bring your heart and soul into the song Cry to Me, because Elena and I nailed that dance with sass, sexiness, and style. If anyone questioned our chemistry after our little dance to that song, they were blind. If Elena still questioned it, however, then I was royally screwed in trying to keep pulling things out of my ass to get her to see it, too. I walked into her condo, which was lovely. Still, with my proclivity for having things tidy and being somewhat of a perfectionist, part of me wanted to stay up and unpack these boxes that had been haphazardly stacked through her kitchen and living room. Maybe I'd get lucky, and her room would be in perfect order, and we'd close the door and forget about the rest until morning. Damn it! I heard Elena growl, 
as I started to straighten boxes into an orderly fashion in her living room where I waited. Everything okay? I asked from the wall away from her large living room window. These boxes are going to drive me insane, she said from her room, where she disappeared to change into something more comfortable. There went the bedroom idea, I thought. I couldn't help but smile when things went sideways for me when it came to Elena, which meant I was smiling a whole hell of a lot lately. Got a problem, Elena said, prompting me to slide the last box over with the others I'd stacked along her wall to make room for her to walk around her living room. Wow, she laughed as she walked into the room. I can see my couch and love seat, but we're still unpacking those boxes, just like you promised me. I eyed her with a grin of confusion. Why the hell are you leaning your head back like that? Elena's bronze eyes glistened as she laughed and said ow at the same time. My hair is caught on this stupid top button. You're going to have to help me because I'm not cutting it. How do you manage to pull this stunt off, I questioned, as I walked over to where she'd turned around, showing me that her hair was tangled around her dress's top button. As I pulled that clip out of my hair, I tripped over a box. Basically, you're looking at the result of all my clutter. Fuck. I was looking at the most beautiful tanned skin and a button that, once Elena's hair was free, I was sure would be mine to unfasten. I gently worked to free her hair from the button, and I was no longer in control of what the hell was happening. You smell so good, I said, as my hands came up and took the thin straps of her dress under my palms, while feeling the electric charge of her hot skin under my touch. She softly moaned, and it was over. I used the palms of my hands to roll the straps of her top off her shoulders and I couldn't resist tasting the skin of her silky smooth shoulder. Elena remained perfectly still while I bent to press my lips onto the top of her shoulders. A surge of energy, the energy of me, desiring more than I knew I could handle, took over and urged me on for more. Elena's head fell back against my chest as I continued to massage her shoulder with my lips, my hands guiding the top of her dress off by steadily running them down her arms. As I kissed over the top of her shoulder toward her neck, I unzipped her dress, allowing it to fall into a pile at her feet. Elena's moans and sighs and her hand coming up to run through my hair was the permission I needed to be granted to take this where I'd wanted it to go since the night I first met her. I wanted to see her eyes, but burying my face and lips into her neck was enough to pull me into a trance that I would never fight away. I was completely drunk on this woman's fragrance, tastes, moans, and everything I'd been tortured by in my dreams. They were finally my reality. My cock felt harder than it had ever been, and to feel Elena press her back against it was enough for me to explode immediately. Instead of worrying about losing my shit early with the woman groaning in response to feeling how hard I was, I let it heighten this moment I'd waited far too long for. I felt like I was sensationally high on this woman, and I loved how it made me feel. I slid my hand around and felt her nipples harden under my touch, compelling me to suck along her jawline and devour the woman I knew I was in love with. I wanted more. My other hand slid down her flat stomach and toward her pussy, her groaning and both arms reaching back to grip my hair as I ran my fingers over her clit was increasing my heart rate as if I'd never involved myself in this act before. God, she was perfect. I need more, she said in a lower voice than I'd ever heard her use. She arched her ass back against me while our lips finally met and I closed my eyes to keep from coming then and there. I was still locked up in this damn suit, and had the most beautiful woman in the world moving her pussy against my fingers as I massaged her clit. Her mouth fell open when I had to feel her, hot and wet and wanting more. You're so wet.
I said through an exhale. God, Elena, I want you more than you know. That's when she broke our electrically charged moment and the high that my mind never wanted to come down from. She turned, and like usual, the woman had read my mind. I should have been drinking in her naked body, but I was transfixed on her dazzling eyes that held me captive. She helped me out of my jacket while I pulled off my tie, and then her hands moved aggressively faster than I anticipated to unbutton my shirt. As I pulled off my undershirt, Elena already had my pants coming off, freeing my dick that was ready for her. Oh my! She softly laughed, her eyes meeting mine while I licked my parched lips in reaction to her gripping my cock and using my wet tip as a lubricant to start pumping up and down my shaft. I'm one lucky girl. I smiled and was able to hold my shit together with her teasing me. Is this the part where I finally get to call you Elena? I teased back only to catch a break to hold my comeback from prematurely ruining everything I wanted with this woman. Depends on if you can prove whether or not you can outperform that car. That shouldn't be a problem, I said, hoisting her into my arms and stepping around boxes on the way to her room. Oh shit, I forgot you don't have a bed. It looks like I'm fucking you against a wall. I said, as her mouth latched onto my jaw and moved down my neck. There's a mattress on the floor. Where? I asked with a laugh. Was this all part of whatever supernatural joke I'd been cursed with when it came to this black-haired beauty? Where in the Alvarez fort of boxes in this damn room? I tripped over a box, nearly sending Elena's and my naked bodies back against the door of her room. Elena's laugh smoothed over this entire catastrophe. This might not have been how I imagined our first time together going down, but she made everything seem perfect, potentially dangerous or not. We're not unpacking boxes, I said, finally seeing the mattress that was hiding behind two wardrobe boxes. I laid her laughing ass back, and her beautiful breasts transfixed me as they rose and fell to her contagious laugh her eyes sparkling radiantly with happiness. Kiss me, she said, becoming more serious than I'd ever seen the woman. I want you, and I want you now. Everything switched gears, as if we didn't practically climb Mount Everest naked to get to this point. I covered her body with mine and ran my hand over the top of her head as I settled in between her legs that fell open for me. I love you, Elena. I meant those words with every fiber of my being. I was lost in this woman, and the way my body and mind reacted to her was something I couldn't control. I love you too, Colin. She caressed the sides of my face. I've known that for a while. It feels good to say it to you finally. I smiled. And the whole Dr. Alvarez thing? I needed to know who I was taking to bed. It turned me on too much to hear you say my name the way you say it. My mouth fell open in total shock. Never in a fucking million years would I have guessed that shit. I knew it had something to do with your... I was silenced when she reached between us, captured my cock in her hands, and ran my tip over her slick entrance. My breath caught, and my entire body jolted internally as Elena brought me back to what we both had been waiting for. I took her hands into mine and gripped her wrists while I slowly brought my lips to take hers. I bit at her bottom lip while she moved beneath my body, her arms still caught by hands. She swept her tongue over my upper lip, and this slow-motion way of relishing in our first kiss was the last thing I expected, but goddamn, this was the hottest fucking thing in the world. I was usually more aggressive when I fucked a woman, but I felt the polar opposite with Elena. She was my treasure, my spark of sunshine, my woman, and she was finally letting me in. 
Every cell in my body knew this and understood to slow things down. The rhythm we'd fallen into was more erotic than I'd ever imagined it could be with a woman. She was delicious and perfect. This was what it felt like to be with the one who was meant for you. Finally. Chapter 17 Elena Colin's lips were so soft, firm, and sensually flawless as they purposefully claimed mine. He was perfect inside and out. That was confirmed moments before we decided to blaze a trail into my box-filled bedroom. Our near collision into the wall as I was growing hungrier to taste his kiss should have put a damper on things. Instead, it was Colin and me, and we laughed our way past that near catastrophe. I loved the fact that, after what felt like a lifetime of putting off this moment, we were now on my makeshift bed on the floor without a care in the world. Colin's tongue was as urgent and as possessive as mine, and I whimpered through this kiss as I slid my hand down his firm body, reaching for his hard cock. I was throbbing and aching to feel him inside me. He groaned into our kiss as I steadily ran my hand up and down his hard dick. He was huge, which added to the perfection of his taut and muscular body moving gently over mine. Without a care in the world, I lined Colin's cock up to my entrance and braced myself not only to feel a man inside me for the first time in too long, but to feel the one man I'd been lusting over for too long. Colin pulled away, inhaling smoothly and catching his breath as he gently pressed his cock inside of me. My hands went over his ass, and my legs widened, my body pleading for this. I kissed along the top of his hard pectoral muscles and whimpered as he stretched me wider than any man I'd ever been with before. Fuck. His hands reached for mine and locked them above my head as I went to grip his perfectly tight balls. Easy, baby, he said in a soft voice, before he captured my lips and thrust himself gently into me. Yes, I said in a bit of a screech. This felt painfully good. It's been too long. I loved how his hands grew tighter around my wrists with each movement he made deeper into me. You feel so fucking incredible. I was lost in erotic bliss. My eyes met Colin's glassy ones for a brief second before I felt my insides working up toward an orgasm without me using my hand or clit to conjure up any of these sensations. It was Colin filling me up and me maneuvering my hips as he slowly glided himself in and out of my soaking wet entrance. His hard tip would move right against my G-spot. That's it right there, isn't it? He said, still breathless while his lips sucked along the side of my neck. I was panting while my legs opened wider, my heels digging into the bed and pushing my body against his. Right there, Cole. I stopped when I felt it bubbling down with more force than I expected. Oh, God, I said, my chest moving up as I rolled with this formidable force pushing its way out of me and through Colin's dick that continued to press into my G-spot. Fuck, yes! That's right, baby. Ride it, Colin said, his eyes meeting mine as I smiled in absolute pleasure. Damn, I've walked through hell and back to see this in your eyes. Colin's mouth captured my breast. The man was perfect. He virtually memorized where my special spot was while I maneuvered myself beneath him fighting against him restraining my wrist above my head to guide his dick into it. Jesus Christ, I panted out while Colin rolled his tongue in circles and sucked on each of my nipples, hardly moving, but his hands locked tighter around my wrists than before. My body shuddered while the orgasm continued, and I clenched my pussy tight to bring in more sensations than ever. God fucking damn, Colin said, laying his head on my chest. The very last thing I expected him to do in reaction to me coming harder than the first just moments ago. Squeeze my cock. I smiled as I licked my lips. Kiss me, Cole. I begged. 
His eyes were wild with hunger, and I swallowed. Given the fact I was nearly drooling, and pulled harder into this sexual moment than I'd ever been with anyone else. I was fully waiting for Colin to fuck me into another frenzy, but he was doing the opposite. Everything seemed as though he were falling into the same sensual moment I was having. We were riding out this whole experience, slowly, and loving every charge of electricity. The angst and buildup were just the beginning— and that was after having two miracle G-spot orgasms without involving my swollen clit. Don't move, Colin said, his tongue gingerly sweeping into my mouth and his movements slower than ever. God, he blew out a breath, pulling his face away. Please don't move a muscle. I understood Colin was doing everything in his power to hold back. It didn't help his personal restraint, since my pussy was fully constricting around his cock in a constant orgasm and pulsating waves of ecstasy. It's okay if you come, baby, I said, his hands releasing my wrists and suddenly missing the pleasure of feeling him slightly rough with me like that. He pulled his face back and tucked his bottom lip between his teeth as his hands came up into my hair. I don't have a condom on, he said with a half laugh. As much as I'd love to trap you into a relationship by getting you pregnant. He closed his eyes. Fuck. Oh, shit. I laughed at how impulsive we were to forget a condom. That's all it took to screw Colin's self-control. Colin was coming inside me before I could react to help him ease out of me. One powerful thrust into me filled me deeper than he'd been since he entered me. I arched my stomach up into him in response to how amazing it felt to have such a large cock buried inside me. Jesus, this was beyond heavenly. Colin's hands fisted my hair as he pumped harder and deeper while groaning in pleasure in a low, husky voice that I found more than attractive. My body instantly joined the party, and I came as Colin shot his cum deep into me. There was no hating him for this, or even being pissed at this slip-up. We had it coming, and I think we both knew it. I reached for his shoulders, my eyes filling with tears due to the immense amount of pleasure that radiated through me on round three of my orgasms. His eyes dazzled with a hunger that I would never let leave my mind. I could never again look at him as just a hot piece of ass. Tonight, after dancing seductively with him, listening to his jokes, and him teasing me with the truth of this moment that we'd just uncovered, we were two souls that were destined to be together. I would never see this man as anything but my man, and a man who, even though he'd been holding back this entire time and I didn't know it, was the best fuck I'd ever had. I used the tip of my tongue to taste his delicious cologne as I ran it up the center of his neck and under his chin, and that's when our mouths fell into a deep and satisfying kiss. I locked my legs around his lower back, keeping him in place as I felt his tight muscles begin to relax. You're pretty extraordinary to hold back like that and not say a word, I said to him after he laid his head between my breasts, kissing against the flesh of one. I'm sorry, I wasn't even thinking. I knew I had that effect on you, Elena. He said my name with more humor than usual, prompting me to laugh now that he had the full rights and privileges of referring to me by my first name. His hand reached for my wrist, and he lifted his head to examine them while pressing his lips into them. Sorry about the whole holding you down thing. I had to have full control of everything with my dick feeling the inside of a woman for the first time and shit. He laughed. Getting laid for the first time in far too long— coupled with the fact I'd been envisioning this and impatiently waiting for you to come to your senses to share this moment, took extra concentration. My wrists are fine. I kissed his chin when he repositioned himself for our gazes to meet again. I'm shocked you didn't come all over my hand when I first touched your sexy dick. He grinned. That's because, as I just learned myself, I have more self-control than any individual on the planet. That you do, and I was so stupid to wait this long for you, I said, squeezing his cock and feeling him still inside me. Ah, you're going to work me into another round like this. 
I'm feeling nothing but the tight and wet pussy of my Elena. And I'm feeling a recovery period rapidly approaching. You got another round in you? I arched an eyebrow at him. I've got all night with you, my little fucking goddess. I like it pretty wild. I teased him with a bite to my lower lip. Is that so? Colin asked with curiosity in his eyes. I can go beyond wild and make this the best night of your life. We just had to get my little crippling moment of fucking without a condom on and past the fact that you forced me to wait too long for your tantalizing body. The night was wild and dangerously fun. The guy definitely knew how to take a woman to heaven, let her enjoy the experience, and bring her back down, only to repeat it all again. I made sure he knew I loved watching his biceps flex when his arms held me up against a wall, and he pounded his cock hard and fast into me. While we had sex, his expressions were enough for me to keep my hands off myself and allow for his cock to work my G-spot. This guy was hot without the sex, but add the sweat, all-night sex, the delicious taste of his kiss, and his salty, muscular skin while in the middle of a mind-blowing orgasm— and I never wanted the sun to rise. I never wanted our bodies to separate. Hell, I'd never been this addicted to sex before. Colin just became a drug that would keep me longing for more of his aggressive sex, his gorgeous eyes, and his stunning face as it twisted into a beautiful expression just before he came. It didn't take long before we both realized we were still human and needed some sleep if we were going to function tomorrow, unpacking boxes and making this place livable. The next morning, Colin took off to pick up some breakfast after taking a shower with me and changing into a pair of jeans, a simple shirt, and a black leather jacket. His hair was tousled in a messy and trendy way before he slapped on my favorite cologne of his. I shouldn't have been surprised when I spied that it was Tom Ford who'd captured the perfect fragrance of an exotic beach with the undertones of something crisp and light, instead of bold and musky. This cologne seemed to capture Colin's personality, and it was delicious to taste as he ravaged my body all night long as well. I heard my annoying cell phone alarm blaring from the kitchen, prompting me to leave the bathroom after I finished drying my hair. I pulled my favorite soft, red sweater over my tank top and walked out to shut off my damn phone. I had no idea how I'd accidentally set the alarm in the first place. What the hell? I thought, searching all over my kitchen for my phone that was nowhere to be found. The alarm went off again, and I laughed when I realized it was Colin's phone. And if he and I were going to survive this relationship, he was going to change his ringtone immediately. I couldn't have that ingrained panic reaction to an alarm every time his phone rang. I saw Jakey was calling in, and I figured I'd leave it for when Colin got back. Glad to see the guy wasn't in a full-blown relationship with his phone. And, like me, he could shut the stupid thing off and put it out of sight when he wasn't working. The stupid phone went off again. Jakey obviously needs to get a hold of Colin since he's blowing him up five times in a row. Just because you had the best sex of your life with Colin doesn't mean you're at the answering each other's phones stage of the relationship, I softly said to myself, pushing the phone off to the side. The phone instantly rang again. Fuck my life. What if something is wrong? Jesus Christ, Jake Mitchell, you're forcing me to do this, so this is your fault, I thought, before I mustered the courage to answer the phone. Something I never would have done if I didn't know the person on the other end of the line. Hello? Jake, it's Elena. I announced skeptically. Is everything okay? Elena, did you guys get married last night or something? Already taking his calls? He teased. Not quite. I laughed. He's out getting breakfast and he left the phone. I wouldn't have answered, but you were blowing it up and I didn't know if something was wrong. Not to mention the fact that his ringtone is the sound of my alarm. So I was psychologically abused for the last few minutes and it needed to stop. Speaking of psychological abuse, Jake said. You left your clutch at the gala last night. Ash got it, but Colin mentioned something about taking you out to get a Christmas tree today or some shit like that. Yeah, you guys want to meet up or something? Or we can come to get it. I can't believe I left that, and I didn't even notice. I sighed. Thanks so much to you both for grabbing that for me. We'll meet you guys wherever Colin is insisting on getting this tree. I have no idea where. 
it might be out of the way. Hey, Jake said, his tone a bit more humored as he cut me off. As Colin's best friend, it's my duty. To him, of course. Of course. I smiled at the way Jake was talking. Well, he takes his love for these everlasting trees seriously. You mean evergreen trees? Yes, exactly. And that's the problem. I'm telling this to you because I know that Colin would never dare put you in this position, being so young and in love with you. Okay, I said, going along with whatever the hell Jake was talking about. Well, this is the deal. And seriously, you know how the genius billionaires are always a little quirky, right? Right. Like how some of them like to hunt human beings for sport? That kind of quirky? I teased. Well, he's probably got a good five to ten years before he starts doing that. But we'll cross that bridge when we come to it, he said, laughing and continuing. As I was saying. Yes, please elaborate, I said. Okay, so it shouldn't come as a surprise to you when I tell you Colin is only ensuring you get an everlasting green tree because of love and shit like that. More importantly than even that, Colin has always felt sorry for the poor trees that were cut too soon because, I don't know, they might not make it to see Christmas. You're kidding me. Colin has a thing for cut evergreen trees? Has since we were kids. Finds it tragic when they turn brown and won't make it into a home for Christmas because of their ugliness. I pinched my lips together when Colin walked in the door. It's Jake. You left your phone here. I cringed. Put me on speaker, Jake said. I did. What's up, asshole? Colin said. You knew I'd be busy today, and now Elena is forced to become my secretary since I forgot my phone, and you were probably blowing the damn thing up. Yeah, well, I don't think Elena is complaining since you left her head spinning after that sexy tango last night, making her forget her handbag and phone on the table. Oh, shit. Colin looked at me, setting what smelled like a delicious Mexican breakfast on the table. Thanks for grabbing that. We'll head to your place and grab it after we get the tree. Or now? Colin looked at me. We're going to meet him at the Christmas tree farm. I smiled. Apparently picking out this tree is a pretty big deal for you at Christmas time. Hell yeah it is, he said, making Jake laugh. I was just mentioning to Elena the everlasting tree of love and how much it means to you, Jake said, as Colin rolled his eyes and unwrapped a burrito for him and one for me. Good, then she'll know exactly why this is our first shopping experience together. Absolutely. Jake said, while I was starting to wonder if Colin really did feel sorry for the trees going brown too early and not getting chosen to go to a house for Christmas. Both men had their serious doctor voices going too strong for me to discern if this was a joke or not. Elena gets to pick the tree, Colin insisted. I ensured she knew what it meant to your relationship, man, Jake said. You can thank me later. Great. We'll meet you at... Colin trailed off chewing on a bite he took from his burrito and searching up tree farms on his phone. Found a place, Jake said. There's one right in the middle of where we are in Malibu this weekend and where you two are in L.A. Where? Colin asked, while I worked to devour my burrito. No joke. This place is called Everlasting Holiday Trees. See you there. Send me the link, dummy, and we'll see you there. Colin rolled his eyes. What's with the whole Everlasting Tree stuff? I asked pouring salsa into the top of my burrito. Evergreens? He shrugged. They don't last forever, so it's sort of difficult to grab a good one before they toss the poor sucker into a chipper for turning brown. I covered my smile. I had no idea what the hell to think. Was I high on this man for the fantastic sex from last night, or was he charming me with his Christmas tree savior syndrome? One thing I knew for sure was that I was in love with the guy. Chapter 18 Elena Colin and I unpacked the kitchen in record time. This man was saying that I was his other half, and I couldn't have agreed more. He and I seemed to have this knack for things going in their proper places, and we worked in harmony, getting everything in its place as though we'd lived together forever and knew each other's preferences. The only thing we couldn't manage to figure out was where the extra shelf that belonged in the pantry had gone without skipping a beat, and in man-of-my-dreams, handyman fashion, Colin made a temporary replacement shelf from extra loose boards lying in the hall closet. 
it didn't take long for us to get distracted from unpacking and start getting sexy again. As we were washing dishes to put away, my lips were captured in one of Colin's delicious and intense kisses. I breathlessly pulled away and challenged him to a round on my island countertop, a safer bet than trying to navigate the boxes strewn around all the way to my bedroom. He planted my ass on the counter, pulled off my shirt, and his perfect lips lit the flesh of my shoulder on fire. While I ran my hands through his soft hair, his lips began working the miracles they had done throughout the night and moved up the side of my neck. My moans, his groaning, all of it had us well on our way to fucking on the counter, until he stopped abruptly. I was left panting, goosebumps still lingering on my skin, and looking at Colin, who snapped into a different mode as if his grandmother had walked in on us. I found the shelf. It's next to the fridge. He was so excited about his eureka moment that I couldn't help but laugh. He was adorable, and I loved everything about him. We inspected the missing shelf, and I helped him put it in place. Our sexy moment was gone almost as soon as it had surfaced, but I knew we'd have plenty of time later, and with a packed schedule, we needed to stay focused anyway. Let's get the bed put together, Colin said with determination. I glanced over at my phone. Not only did you miss the window to screw on my island, but we have to meet Jake in 30 minutes. Jake can wait. He's taking his little boy to pick out the tree for their beach house. He won't even know we're late. Colin leaned down and kissed me on my neck, instantly working me up again. I gently held his head and pulled my head off to the side and away from his lips. We have to go, you horny man. We've got shit to do, I teased. Colin sighed and gave me that look of determination that I loved. They won't know. Let me fix up your bed. We'll fuck. Then we'll leave. Colin nodded, his eyes glistening and vibrant. No, right now we're leaving, I said with a grin, grabbing my keys. My car can handle the tree on top better than yours, I think. When I bought my Land Rover in Miami, I insisted upon blacked-out, tinted windows, which wasn't exactly legal in California. I never thought the perk of no one being able to see inside my car would come in handy until Colin started unzipping my pants as I drove. Colin knew precisely what he was doing when he rerouted my GPS to take this alternate, two-lane route through the hills and back down into the city. He made me laugh at first because I thought there could be no way he could get me off while I drove, but he did. He was not only a miracle worker with his smooth and patient movements in surgery, but these hands were gifts for a multitude of other things as well. Fuck. I stretched out my arms while his fingers slid from my clit and found their way into my soaking wet pussy. That's it, Colin said with humor and huskiness, kissing me all along my neck. Let me have that spot, baby. Thank God for cruise control, guiding us at a solid 50 miles per hour. My eyes begged me to close them and enjoy this, but the adrenaline of having to focus while driving as my man got me off was heightened, making this daring adventure one for the books. I spread my legs and gripped the steering wheel tighter when Colin's fingers glided into my entrance without anything to slow them down. You're so fucking beautiful right now, he said, pulling hard against my G-spot with his fingers. Come hard on me. We're... I stopped, panting and feeling the sparks flying and the throbbing sensation pounding deep inside me. We're going to crash. Eyes on the road. Focus, he teased in a voice he made when he was turned on. Damn it. I breathed out hard while I started coming, and Colin's free hand took the wheel from me, his eyes on the road, while his other hand drove the intense orgasm. I'm coming, babe. I blew out another breath of ecstasy. Fuck yes, you are, he said, his thumb moving my clit in circles, while his fingers dipped in and out of me. My eyes recovered faster than my body, and my breathing slowed as I took the wheel back. Holy shit, I said, softly laughing in disbelief that we'd pulled this off. You look so hot, and I'm harder than a fucking rock, he said. You deserve that, I said, rearranging myself, checking the rearview mirror, 
and thanking God that my windows were pitch black from the outside. That was unbelievable. But we could have been pulled over, you horny goofball. Your windows are black as night, my sex goddess, he said. No way anyone saw that. No, I mean, we could get pulled over by a cop for those black as night tinted windows. I need to fix them before I get a ticket. But would it have been worth it? I glanced over at him as he relaxed into his seat. I hope you have that heart on all day, I teased. You realize people would judge us for how irresponsibly you just behaved. I wasn't hearing a whole lot of protesting a few minutes ago, and what I did was take care of my woman. And if we got into an accident? Not a chance, he confidently said. I was ready to take that wheel in case you drove over the line or off the side of the road in ecstasy. Brakes? The car brakes on its own, just like it accelerated with cruise control on its own. Any other reasons as to why you're going to try and fight me taking this same route home? He reached his hand over and rested it on the back of my neck. Because I'll be driving, he teased, leaning over and kissing my temple. Well, I have a rule against drinking and driving. I smirked at him. That includes bodily fluids from my boyfriend who thinks it's okay to screw around and drive while impaired on the road. Fucking finally, Colin said, throwing his hands in the air. Did I miss something? You have officially proclaimed that I'm your boyfriend, he said triumphantly, his thumb rubbing the side of my neck where his hand came to rest. It only took getting you off like this to make you speak the truth of what you've wanted this time. He looked at me with his usual Colin smugness. You're welcome. The fact that you got me off while driving to this Christmas song? I stopped and laughed, hearing Grandma got ran over by a reindeer playing in the background. Colin rested his right forearm on his right thigh. Of all the Christmas songs, what would Grandmother say, young lady? He feigned shock and laughed, pulling his ringing phone from his pocket. You're twisted. Stop ruining Christmas music, I said, unable to hold back my laughter. I'm not ruining Christmas music, I heard Colin say into the phone, not sure if he was defending himself to the person on the other line or me. It's Elena. She says my angelic voice is ruining Christmas music. I rolled my eyes. God only knew who he was bullshitting on the other line. Jake wants to know if we should allow me to sing Oh Christmas Tree after you pick out our everlasting love tree when we get to the tree farm. My eyebrows knit together in confusion. Why do you and Jake seem to be two men who appear to be top doctors, yet act like you're thirteen? Thirteen, Colin said with a laugh. At thirteen, I was hornier than fuck, and I surely wouldn't be talking shit like this to my best friend. He defended himself. Yeah, we're about two miles out. He paused. Hey, monster, he said in a playful voice. Oh? He seemed to be humoring Jake's one-year-old son. Okay, well, since I'm late, I'll sing O Christmas Tree to dedicate Elena's new tree to her. Hey, Johnny boy, Colin said. Did you pick your tree out with your mom yet? He paused. Ah, cute. Well, you look around some more and we'll be there in a few minutes. You will sing that song, I laughed. You owe me. Quite the contrary, Laney. He used my nickname and made me love it even more, hearing it come from his mouth. You owe me, he said, grabbing the wet wipes I always carried in my car, and he cleaned his dirty, sinful hands on them. I laughed. I pick our everlasting love tree, and you're singing the dedication for it. Might I ask who let you in on the Christmas tree being our everlasting love tree? He questioned as I pulled into the lot. I parked next to a black version of my Land Rover and leaned over to kiss Colin's lips. Doesn't matter. It sounds like something you'd come up with. Let's go find our tree. The Christmas tree farm kept the Christmas music loud and cheerful. Little houses were everywhere and crafted to give you the feeling of being at the North Pole, and each tree was adorned with a beautiful red bow on it. The white fencing was wrapped with red ribbons to create a candy cane effect, and I had to admit, the Christmas spirit was alive and well. Uncle Colin, I heard a toddler, a tiny clone of Jake, dressed in Levi's and a black hoodie, managed to say as he ran up to Colin. I watched in admiration as Colin crouched down, and the next thing I knew, 
The full force of the toddler's energy was transferred into Colin's arms as the man flipped him over and landed him on his shoulders. John laughed while Colin greeted Jake's smile. Sorry we're late, jam on the freeway. Hey, Jake held his hands out. Explain that to the one little boy who doesn't like the dude sitting in Santa's chair or the elves who are helping kids up to his lap. Colin reached up to where John squeezed his hair into fists. Are you afraid of Santa? He asked. We need to fix this immediately. He's grumpy, John said in a voice that was very well articulated for a one-year-old. So are the mean elves. A bad Santa? I asked when John's vivid blue eyes met mine. Should we get our tree from another place? We should save them, he said. Jake snapped his fingers and laughed. Save them it is, Jake smiled at me. Good to see you lively and well this morning, Elena. All rested and ready to rescue a tree for Christmas? They all dead, Daddy, John said. Wait, what? Colin pulled John from his shoulders and knelt in front of him. All right, you listen to your Uncle Colin because God only knows what your dad said about cut Christmas trees. I smiled at Jake's grin. I surely know your mother would never put it into your innocent mind that we're at a place of death. No, you goof. John gave Colin a small punch to his arm. They dead because they cut. I pinched my lips. Well, then we'll make sure we get a good one for its last Christmas. I watched when Jake winked at his son, who was looking back at him. That's right, and Uncle Colin will sing a song for the poor dead tree. Unless he's happy that it's dead, Jake said. Of course I'm not happy the trees are cut and dead, Colin said missing the glances I saw between father and son. What the hell was Jake up to? What if you helped me pick out a tree? I said to John, only to have Colin and Jake grin at each other in response. Yes, but no Santa, John agreed, tugging at my hand. I'll hang back and get your stuff from Jake's car, Colin said. With that, John and I set off to save the tree that Colin would want to give a happy send-off after being cut too early for Christmas. And after seeing Jake and John exchange those glances, I knew Jake was up to something. Colin was oblivious to it all, too, which made the adventure of finding a browning Christmas tree that much more fun. I should have gotten it the minute Jake tried to play me as a smitten fool on the phone this morning, too. Now I knew. Jake was trying to get Colin to sing Oh Christmas Tree to a brown reject tree. I wasn't sure why Jake would even give a damn, but Ash and Avery made it clear that all the boys loved pranking each other. So it was best to let this one play out, because I knew Colin's reaction would probably be priceless. Let's find a very sad tree and make it happy, I said. That's what Daddy told me to say to you, Lena. He chirped. I'm sure he did. I answered with a smile. Thank God for this little boy, dressed like a cute little SoCal surfer, because he found the one tree that was heading straight to the burn pile. Its needles were orange and falling off, and it was cast out with others that were starting to brown. This pathetic tree looked like it was dead before it was cut, and here were John and I, getting to rescue it as a declaration of mine and Colin's love. It's lighter than a feather, I said reaching in for it and picking it up. Has no water, John said, eyeing it like we were on a safari and rescuing an animal or something. It's dead, though. He shoved his hands into the pockets of his cuffed little jeans, looked at me, and shrugged. We gotta get it. Daddy says Uncle Colin saves them. I covered my smile. Your dad is a brilliant man. He is, he simply stated. Well, this was fast. You seem bummed. We can look for yours next. I won't get a brown one, he assured me. I won't let you. If Uncle Colin makes me, I knelt to the little stud of a cutie. We both know your Uncle Colin won't make you, but I tugged on his black hoodie. I think it would be fun to pick one for your dad. Mom won't like it very much. Not a ugly tree. Mom paints beautiful things. She said that to me last night. Why don't we see how it all goes? If we think Daddy needs a brown tree to match mine and Colin's, then I say... I paused. Hey, does Daddy have a favorite room that Mommy doesn't really go to? His office? His eyes widened. At home or the hospital? At home. 
Let's make Daddy get a matching tree for his office at home then. I'll get Daddy's tree too. He and Uncle Colin will be happy, he said. And I shook my head at how well this one-year-old spoke and ran around like he was five. After picking two dead trees, John and I walked back to where Colin and Jake were conversing about a patient, and they were debating about what was best for him. Would it be to have the open-heart surgery before or after Colin worked on the deadly brain tumor? It was buzzed through the hospital already, and I was curious about whether the two chief surgeons had come to any conclusions about how the patient's care would be handled. On Monday, we would all sit and consult with neuro teams and cardiac teams, and then in the afternoon, the two chiefs were expected to have decided how they would treat the patient and deliver the news to the family. Oh, Daddy, John said with excitement and a bit of mischief in his voice. Look what me and Lena got. I pinched my lips and prevented the smile that was the prelude to me bursting into laughter if I couldn't hold it back, but I held my own. The expressions on both pranksters' faces were priceless and a perfect way of seeing right through them. Colin owed my ass for catching on to Jake doing this to him, and I was playing along with John now. It was this little guy and me up against the two playful and witty doctors. Colin's face was riddled with confusion, while Jake's eyes went straight to mine, understanding I'd caught on. Well, well, Jake said, pulling his hands into his pockets. It looks like Uncle Colin will be wildly grateful that you rescued two trees for him today. And sing to dedicate them, I added with a wink to John. No, Daddy, he frowned. One is yours, one for Uncle Colin. Right, Jake grinned at me. Of course. What the hell is going on here? Colin asked. No bad words, John scowled at Colin's amused grin. We saved the trees for you and Daddy. Colin inhaled and bit his lower lip. I couldn't be more delighted that you and Lena, he arched an eyebrow at me, then looked at Jake, saved a couple of dead trees for Lena's first Christmas. Everlasting dead trees, of course, Jake challenged Colin with a grin. The interesting piece is one for Lena and one for your dad. Somehow I don't get one, Colin asked. Nope, John shrugged. Only two are brown. A shame, Colin said. And now I feel like my voice is too scratchy to sing and dedicate these two shameful trees. It's all they have, John said, and I was beginning to think this was getting to the poor little guy. You're traumatizing your son, Colin said to Jake. No, sitting my kid on Santa's lap was traumatizing my son. This is teaching my son that we appreciate all things ugly, like you, Uncle Colin. Jake grinned. Or alive and well, like me. You're weird, Daddy. It's time Colin sings, Jake widened his hand. Do you want me to hum a low G so you can find your key to sing in? I don't need any further help from you, my dearest friend. I watched Colin challenge Jake. Well, I said, pulling John by his shoulder, both of us holding onto our dead trees and facing Colin and Jake. We're waiting for the official tree song from Uncle Colin. I laughed at Colin's eyes darting around the crowd we'd caused merely by holding the orange and brittle pine trees. Then let's kick off this ceremony of tree dedication, Jake said. Wait, I said, still trying not to laugh. Is this something you guys always do? We do now, Colin smirked at Jake. It's a new tradition that John helped to start with you, Lena, he said, mimicking the voice John used when he came up with a cute way of saying my name. Every year, we come to get everlasting trees and rescue a brown one and dedicate one through song. Jake shook his head. You realize he's young enough to forget this, right? I heard him whisper to Colin. Not if I don't let him, and especially since you pulled my girl into your crazy schemes. Now, I'm pulling Ash in. But with honesty, unlike you, my friend. So when Ash learns the truth of what you pulled with Elena, Colin laughed. This will be a new tradition, and little John will be rescuing brown Christmas trees like Ricky Ranger until he grows out of it. Jake shook his head. We'll see, Frank Sinatra, he said. I believe the crowd that's gathered to figure out what we're doing with brown trees in an expensive Christmas tree farm is waiting on you to sing. He let out a breath. Use your high tenor voice, please. The one that, 
He waved his hand dramatically in the air. You know, sounds angelic. We're waiting, and it's obvious these trees do not have much longer in that department, I urged. With that, Colin busted out the funkiest and funniest version of O oh Christmas Tree I'd ever heard. He sang and danced around, and John giggled uncontrollably. Through Colin's fun way of singing the song, ensuring we were doing good for the poor trees, I was reasonably confident that this moment would stay with John well up until he was a teenager. Chapter 19 Colin After our Christmas tree farm experience, all the way up to the time we left to come home, Elena had gotten a good dose of mine and Jake's goofy, yet hilarious, if you ask me, brotherly friendship. The only one who'd missed out on today's shenanigans was Ash, who'd had to work at her gallery. If Ash knew I would serenade everyone at the Christmas lot with dedication songs for brown Christmas trees, however, I'm sure she would have closed up shop for the day. I have to admit that I never saw that one coming either. God knows what Jake had put in Elena's brain about me and trees, but I was nothing if not a man who always followed through on a gag. We've unpacked almost everything, Elena said, as she lay curled into my body on the couch. I have to say this was the most hilarious and productive day since I moved back to California. Except we forgot one thing. She paused and covered my hand that had been resting under her shirt and massaging along her stomach. Hmm, I said engrossed by some show she'd put on the television earlier. Dear God, she sat up and looked back at me. You're already a boring man. We just finished eating and decorating the tree. I smiled at her and cupped her chin between my hand. I brought her brilliant, smiling face down to mine and captured her lips in a slow kiss that woke up my cock and it was your idea to turn on this chick flick Christmas movie that I'm now addicted to. Elena threw her head back and laughed. Stay right here, she said, popping up and moving through her well-decorated condo. I loved the view from this place. She'd managed to land a second-floor condo in a perfect location, and it even offered her a view of the ocean. The place felt warm and comfortable and those feelings combined with unwinding on the couch without a care in the world and Elena in my arms. It was perfection. I'd imagined we'd be fucking all over the house until sunup, but instead we were watching some Christmas movie that was totally predictable, corny, and oddly addictive. Gotcha! she laughed. I sat up and moved the throw blanket off of me. What? I narrowed my eyes and smiled at her as she walked through the living room, holding up her phone. Are you FaceTiming or something? I snatched a few pics of the sexy doctor lying on my couch without his shirt on, staring intently at the Christmas tree. You've lost your mind, Laney, I teased with a laugh. You're not really. She nodded with her lips caught between her teeth. Videoing you for the hell of it. I got you on my live Instagram feed at the tree farm today, too. Her laugh escaped as she tried to remain serious, but I could tell she was thinking about my song for the brown trees and the shit I made up for John to hear the toddler squeal with delight. I sucked in the side of my cheek between my teeth. Baby, give me the camera. Or phone. Whatever the hell you're using to blackmail me with later. Nope. She teased with the smile that melted every defense I had about wanting not to be captured on film looking like a sap. You're not getting anything. This part is all mine. I narrowed my eyes at her. Okay, then, I said, humoring her and loving this woman more with each passing second. God only knows what will happen to this poor little rich girl on your show and the cowboy who runs the local feed store that her company is trying to shut down. Her eyes widened as I moved toward her. God only knows. Her eyebrows rose playfully. What if this lacy chick decides to take the side of the large firm she works for and closes down the entire town? Her name is Lucy. She arched her eyebrow at me. 
And I guess we'll never know if she's going to ruin her fling with Brian by siding with big business. I glanced over at the television, smirking when I saw the snow starting to fall in the movie, the characters distressed by the decision to be made by the classy businesswoman in the country town. I say she goes for it with love over money. Is that so? Elena laughed as we stood in somewhat of a silly standoff. But will he forgive her? For coming back into town, rekindling their childhood sweetheart love, and then having to choose between him and money? Yeah. Elena looked past me to the television. It sucks to suck sometimes. Speaking of sucking, I pulled her into my chest with a laugh. It's time to delete videos on social media and on that phone of yours. I can't be immortalized in such a pathetic way. Hell no. She popped up on her toes and kissed my chin. It's time for you and me to take a selfie with our new tree. A selfie? I felt like I was on another planet. I was a neuroscience geek who performed surgeries and took on insane challenges in the brain and spinal department. I was not a selfie-taking social media user. Oh my god, Elena laughed. We need to get you out of the hospital world and into the fun, real world. I have all my friends from Florida on Instagram, and I love sharing pictures of what I'm up to. I'm sure the entertainment was riveting today with my live performance of a dead tree dedication. Two dead trees, she chuckled. Come on, throw your shirt back on and put this on. She placed a white fur and red velvet Santa hat on my head. We're taking a Christmas picture with our tree. I exhaled. Where the hell did you get this, you sneaky magician? Pull it out of your ass along with these sudden new things I'm learning about you? You love it, and I know it. I see it in your face. I pulled on my navy blue long-sleeved shirt, not missing a second of acting fake annoyed. I'd never given a damn about the holiday season until now. These simple little things that brightened Elena's smile were things I'd never experienced. I grew up around massive Christmas parties, flooded with people of status, and houses that were decorated by interior designers. I'd never even decorated my house before, let alone hang personalized ornaments on a tree. All of those things were seemingly done automatically, in my experience. This was all new to me. Seeing Elena's excitement about the tree and her new house was worth everything to me, even if it was all going on her social media. Who gave a damn? It was somewhat flattering to know that the woman was bringing me into the private affairs that she shared with others. A significant step in the right direction, I'd say. I walked with Elena over to the tree that we'd covered in lights, hundreds of colorful glass bulbs, and hanging light icicles. Decorating the thing was fun, too. Elena and I were singing along to Christmas music the whole time, and I swear to God, I can honestly say that I've never been so fucking festive in all my life. Elena fiddled with her camera while I adjusted the Santa hat. Where did you find this thing? I asked. The drugstore where we bought the Christmas lights? You were distracted. She smiled at me. Now say hi to everyone. What? Are you videoing this again? It's not live, so chill. Oh, wait. She glanced back at our decorated tree. This isn't the tree I want our picture in front of. She laughed and looked over at her balcony. It's that tree that deserves the picture. The brown one? I furrowed my brows. Elena, are you on something? Let's go, she pulled my hand. I still think we should have decorated it. God knows your poor neighborhood will be reporting the crazy doctor in the condo with her dead and very brown tree on the porch. This goddamn thing is a fire hazard. That's why we're taking our first of many Christmases together with it. You've lost it, Laney. I glanced down at her phone. Are you still recording this shit? Oh! She pulled up her phone and giggled. Whoops! Hold up. I need to switch it to the camera. Please do, I humored her, as we walked outside to the brown tree I agreed to take home, so long as she picked a green one for the inside of her house. 
Only my best friend would manage to put it into my girl's head that I like to rescue brown fucking trees for Christmas. We stood in front of it and smiled for her selfie. Fucking weird as shit to do so, I might add. That's not going to work, she said, readjusting the white ball of fur on the end of the Santa hat. There. She pressed her finger into the cleft of my chin. Now, smile like you love our brown tree. I smiled and only thought of how I'd get Jake back for this. Nope, Colin, she said as she looked at me. You look like you have some evil smile on your face. Give me your Colin smile. My Colin smile? What the hell is that? Just smile like you love me. I gripped her waist, stood behind her, and kissed the one place I knew she loved, the bend of her neck. I had to end this nonsense. Elena came down off her Mrs. Claus North Pole High that second, turning and bringing her lips to mine. The woman was probably a pro at snapping pics, as I used my more skillful talents of ensuring this camera shoot would pay off when I took my woman and made her climb the ropes of pleasure as soon as this was over. She pulled away. Damn it, she laughed. My phone was recording that. Well, there's another one for your personal library. Perhaps the dead tree doesn't like cameras? I can't focus with you kissing me like that. My whole point, I smirked. Get over here and turn that thing for us to stare at ourselves and pull off a weird-ass smile. I squeezed her, and her smile was brilliant as I laughed. You realize it's weird to smile at yourself, correct? Then take a picture of it? Then look at me, she ordered. I'm getting this shot. Why don't we act like that chick flick and gaze lovingly into each other's eyes? Good idea she said, and held the phone out while we tried to pull off my idea. Elena laughed, I kissed her again, and as far as I could tell, she wasn't going to get shit for her Instagram account if she was trying to pull off some cute picture with a brown and brittle pine tree as the backdrop. That's good enough, she said, eyeing me. We need to get you used to this. Used to taking selfies? That'll be the day. I'm not one for social media. Well, I have fun with it. I get to see what my friends are up to and see their kids growing up. And it's all private, so you don't have anything to worry about. Is that thing shut off? I glanced down at my new enemy, Elena's phone. Yes. What do you say? She dragged out that last word mysteriously. We light my first fire in that gas insert and... Well... Her cheeks warmed to a beautiful pink. Fuck under the prettier tree, I suggested with a smile. Sounds like a plan. Elena and I had used last night to get more comfortable with our bodies, moving in ways that we knew would bring us pleasure and ride our intense orgasms that I didn't even know were possible. Hell, I even realized that having sex with a woman for her pleasure was more of a sensual experience than just fucking a chick because you're an asshole who feels he needs to get laid. I wasted zero time making sure we were both stripped to nothing, while Elena grabbed a blanket and a pillow for us to use at our tree. Having my brain controlled a bit better this time, I saved us both the trouble of forgetting a condom as I had throughout the entire night before. She was certainly worth the risk, but we didn't need to keep testing what could easily come of us screwing without protection. Elena's moans and sighs, and the way she worked my cock by squeezing it tightly while I was deep inside of her, had my cock swollen and throbbing for its release. I loved her full breasts, and the fact that she told me she loved when I massaged the most tender part of her ass with the wetness from her pussy, working circles around the one entrance I'd never before been tempted to fuck in my life. When I absently went with the technique of pressure and slow circles around her asshole, Elena became wilder and more aggressive in response. Even now, as I fucked her from behind, I cupped one of her breasts, positioning my body to move my cock in and out of her, while giving myself room to touch the other pressure point that made my woman give me her ass in ways I loved. Fuck, she said, 
moving with my hand and now my fingers daringly entering the hole that I'd always considered off-limits. I watched Elena grip the blanket and ball it up into a fist. You like that, baby? God, yes. It feels amazing. Fuck me harder, deeper, call. She pleaded, her voice filled with ecstasy. Elena reached back and gripped my balls as I groaned in response. Fuck. You have no idea how much I love you doing that, I said, as she gently rolled them in her hands. Harder, baby, she begged. I rolled her onto her stomach. I'm not being gentle. You made me wait all day for this. She arched her back and buried her face into her pillow. I need it deep. I gripped her pelvic bone and pounded the hell out of her, listening to her moans and watching every little movement she made to ensure this was what my girl wanted. Her cursing, begging, and nearly screaming out her orgasm told me this was another hard climax, and even if I didn't have that, I felt her clamping the hell out of my cock as I moved harder. We both came and practically collapsed under the wild, chasing lights of her Christmas tree. Jesus Christ, you're so amazing, I said, as I pulled her body in tightly to me. I may have to quit my job and pursue a full-time career in fucking you in ways that make you climb the walls in ecstasy. Elena laughed, her pussy clenching harder around my cock and almost forcing me out of her. We moved from our spot under the tree and into her shower. Shower sex was my favorite with this woman. We always used the excuse of soaping each other up, only for me to throw her sexy ass up against the wall, both of us riding the edge while we fucked hard and fast in the steam. Once we were done, I was starving and headed to get some leftovers from the fridge while Elena dried her hair. When she was done, my little spark plug walked out in her silk jammies, her nipples tempting my eyes more than the food I'd built up an appetite for. I have a question for you, you devious woman, I said, turning around and eating the leftover pasta while offering her a bite from across the counter. I'm sure I have an answer, she said with a grin. By the way, your ass looks hot in those sweats. That's the compliment I expected when you walked out here, I teased. You hungry? There's more, and I'll heat it up. We'll share. If we want more, we can reheat or order in. Might want to order a pizza, I said with a smile. I'm just warming up with you. What's your question? She took the fork I offered her to share the bowl of pasta as I grabbed one of my own. So I'm not one to pry, I arched my eyebrow at her. But as I was putting all your medical books on that shelf in your room today, I took another bite and swallowed. I noted a book that said Diary on it. Elena walked over to the fridge and pulled out two beers, twisting off the tops and handing me one. Did you read my deep and dark secrets? She teased. If I knew there was something in there about me, I'd be totally down for you to read me a bedtime story tonight. I took a drink of my beer. So, selfies, predictable chick flicks, and now a diary? You're a woman who's hard to keep up with. I don't think it's a mystery. She leaned her head back and chugged her beer like some sexy woman who could drink any man under the table. No? I just do what makes me happy, she smiled. For example, that diary? Yes, like those vampires? I heard about you making the doctor's lounge turn on that show, by the way. I had to know what all the hype was about between you and the patient. I'm hotter than that Damon guy, by the way. Debatable, she said with a laugh, twirling noodles around her fork and taking a large bite of pasta. Do you do the diary thing because the vampires do? Elena covered her mouth as she laughed. Oh my god, really? No. She shook her head and took a drink of her beer to wash down her bite of food. Journaling has been around a lot longer than the television show, I'll have you know, she said. I have a method for people who deal with head injuries and wild mood swings. You've probably heard of the technique before. I have them write what frustrates them, things that would have never bothered them before their head injury. Then I tell them to rip out the pages 
and do whatever it takes to destroy them so they can let all of their frustration die with the pages. Does that work? Some say it does, and some say it just makes it worse. We work together so I can help them the best way I know possible to move through the injury-related mood swings. I don't want to hear about why you make your patients have a diary. I want to know the reason you have your own diary, I insisted, as she grinned broadly. I have mine because I love to hold on to everything. I love sketching flowers, butterflies, and writing things down that I love and don't want to forget. We all forget the simple, fun things. We get caught up in our crazy lives and forget things that should be treasured. Each day comes with a different experience, a different gift. I like to document those gifts. So what you're trying to say is that book is pretty much filled with stories about me. I smiled at her. I know I might have to give you a larger book if this is what you do. I also take pictures, selfies, she gave me that look again, and I make videos like crazy, mostly for myself and some to share with friends. I just love keeping it all if I have time to write it down, film it, or get it in a picture. And our amazing sex? Sex tapes, she laughed. That scandal wouldn't be well received. Well, it's a good thing that we're so good together that you don't need to throw that in your little black book to remember it. You never know, she teased. All right, another question, I said, knowing this shit had to come up now or never. Since you're obviously addicted to me, and it just took me getting you into bed to make that happen, I grinned. I want to ask something crazy of you. I think you'll love videoing this shit and taking pictures, too. What are you up to? I want to invite you to come with me to Hawaii for Jim and Avery's wedding. It's two weeks and short notice, I know, but we can move things around or not stay as long. What? She laughed her fun laugh. I can't just leave. Jim already approved it, since Avery could use a beautiful bridesmaid anyway. I hardly know them, she said, her mind reeling behind her eyes. You hardly know me, and look at us. We're already acting like a married couple, dead tree adoptions and all. She eyed me and smiled. I will regret not going, won't I? Duh, that's a given. I'll help you move your schedule around. We'll do some crazy adrenaline shit while we're out there, too. What do you think? I think as long as we can move my schedule around and we don't stay for too long, I'm not one to turn down a fun time. I don't want to get my ass busted, though. I just started working here. She pursed her lips. Wait, was this what Jim was talking about last night? Yep, wanting to ensure I got you on board. She shook her head. We're insane, you and I. I know that. It's why I'm currently ordering pizza and planning on a fantastic night with the woman I'm madly in love with. It's a good thing I'm falling pretty hard for you too, eh? I knew you would eventually. Sucks for you that you just wasted a lot of lonely nights teasing my ass about it. Order your pizza. I promise I won't tell your best friend, the heart surgeon, about your horrible eating habits. I'm enjoying kicking off the holiday season. Jake can kiss my ass. You're going to end up like that poor brown tree if you keep up this ordering greasy food while you're around me. I'll make sure I order ice cream and cookie dough, I challenged. You do that, she said, taking the bowl of pasta with her. While you're in there, can you pop us some popcorn? I put it next to the fridge. We need to rewind this movie and figure out what happens in the end. And just like that. Elena and I had fallen in love, were traveling full speed ahead as if this were our everyday lives, and we finally were united after thirty-six long-ass years of me waiting for a woman like her. Helping her move in had me navigating the place as if we owned it together, and the strange part about that was that it didn't even seem to phase Elena. A few days ago, I expected a lot of nervous progress, and that was if I could even manage a kiss with her. I shouldn't have expected anything less than her and me, colliding as if the universe had been impatiently waiting for it to happen. Now it had.
and the full support of everything right in the world was on my side with the woman. She was worth the wait. Chapter 20 Colin After a weekend spent with Elena, I felt like a new man coming back to work. I was refreshed, and God, I couldn't possibly be any happier. Being with her through the weekend was enough to make me confident that this was the woman I could happily spend the rest of my life with. Sure, I'd practically shouted that shit from the rooftop before we'd shared alone time, but now it was a concrete fact. This woman was truly put on this earth to be mine, and I would make sure that she enjoyed every single second of being with me. Life just got that much more enjoyable for me, and I couldn't be more thrilled. Anyone could call me a sap, and I'd completely agree with them. I was the type of guy who would sit here and thought about how she'd cried out my name when she came, the way she practically pulled my hair out while I fucked her hard and deep. All of that. But I wasn't just caught up with how much I loved fucking the woman, because there were so many other things that made me wish the weekend would have never ended. The small things, Elena things. Like having that damn cell phone in my face. Half the time, I looked at her phone and still couldn't figure out how to pull off a sincere smile while I felt like I was smiling at myself. All of her pictures must have been of me, looking like a jackass with some weird-ass fake smile while she kissed my cheek. Who cared? I wasn't on social media, so I would never have to see this shit again. Thank God. Decorating Elena's place, my idea to help seal the deal in staying with her this weekend, turned out to help me enjoy all things merry and bright. Well all things except that damn brown tree that Jake had to pull his lame prank with, and now I still wondered if Elena thought I was some crazed lunatic who rescued trees every year, when in truth, this was the first year I'd ever set foot on a Christmas tree lot. I needed to clear that shit up with her. What the heck is Jake doing with a dead Christmas tree in his office? Dr. Chi asked, the cardio doc who was almost as talented as Jake, sitting across from me at our lunch table. It's brown. Did you pull another joke on him like you did with that life-size nutcracker last year? I laughed loudly at the memory. Oh, damn. That was so funny. That was the best, and you know it. And it was two nutcrackers that were placed on each side of his door. I smirked at the prank I'd pulled on Jake's ass last year. I forgot what they said when you walked in front of them, Dr. Chi said. They said, this nut's for you. It was perfect, I said, amused with myself all over again. So what's the whole brown tree about then? Another prank? He seriously has that thing in his office? I asked, shaking my head. Yeah, Dr. Chi said. Oh, well, that's all on him. I gulped down a drink of water. Turns out he screwed with the wrong man this weekend, insisting to Elena that I had this stupid thing for rescuing trees that were cut too soon. Don't ask, I said, looking at his confusion grow. I'm still trying to figure out how it went from me telling him I was buying Elena a Christmas tree this weekend to me becoming the dead Christmas tree whisperer. Though I'm pretty sure Jake can give you the details on the tree in his office once he gets out of surgery later. I grinned. I'm sure he has his own fantastic story as to why it's there. There was no way I was going to try and explain this to Chi. Hell, I still couldn't figure it out myself. Where are you headed? Chi asked, noting I was getting up before finishing my meal. Surgery. Waters has one at three. I arched an eyebrow at him. And I'm going to observe and assist if needed. Dr. Waters had previously been disciplined due to negligence with his patients. Unfortunately, everyone at the hospital knew it. Not exactly the kind of reputation any physician wanted. Dr. Alvarez was chief at the time, so he was the one who dealt with Waters' discipline. But now it was my responsibility as the new chief neurosurgeon to be aware of all surgeries this man performed. So I was doing precisely that, observing this surgery to ensure the doctor was performing his surgical duties properly. Waters was an impressive doctor, but the negligence on his record from sending his patients home too early, only to have them return with a brain bleed, was not something any doctor at St. John's took lightly. 
Even the non-surgical issue in his file of prescribing too high a dose of medication for a patient was enough to have the man called into question. I didn't tolerate anything less than perfection with all of my residents, and that was why I had to ensure that he would perform this surgery in the same skilled manner. Have a good day, Brooks, Dr. Chi said. With that, I took my exit, practically running into Elena as I walked through the doors, distracted by acknowledging two nurses on my way out. Shit, Elena giggled. Sorry I'm late. I had a... If it isn't my selfie, Queen, I said, as I gripped her shoulders, pressed my lips against hers, pulled away, and smiled. Listen, I spied an entire selfie crowd in the cafeteria that would love your expertise on how to take the perfect picture with an apple. I grinned at her as she rolled her eyes. Go grab lunch. I need to get up in Dr. Waters' observation room before he starts that surgery. Wait! She grabbed my arm and turned back to the group she'd walked in with. You girls go ahead. I'm going to sit in on this surgery with Dr. Brooks. She smiled at the two neurologists and my new resident neurosurgeon. Someone has to keep you quiet while the physician performs? Ladies, I acknowledged the group Elena walked in with. Enjoy your lunch, dinner, or breakfast, whatever time of day it is for you. I winked, knowing the group of doctors could be working on call or could have been here in regular office hours. Have you missed me that much? I asked readjusting my white lab coat as we walked out of the cafeteria. You'll starve to death if you keep skipping meals and following me around the hospital like this. I wrapped my arm around her for a quick kiss to the temple. Get over yourself, she laughed. Never, I smiled at the staff who passed us in the hall. Why are you going to surgery, she asked. Because I'm a surgeon, I responded playfully. Elena nudged my side. You're in your suit and lab coat. Aw, I sighed. It looks like you caught me following you around the hospital like a lost little puppy dog then. You know, since you're spending Mondays here and standing me up at lunch. It's been a crazy day, but I do like the idea of using Mondays to make rounds in the hospital. It sucks for me, though, I added. I have to sit in a lonely office and know my lady is up in the hospital, and the only time I see her would be at lunch? God, whatever shall I do? I feigned my dramatic response. Again, sorry about being late and missing lunch with you. I wrapped my arm around her, not giving a damn what any doctor, nurse, technician, or janitor thought about us. As I said to you before, never apologize to me unless you fuck up in my OR. Seriously, though. Why are you going into the observation room on Dr. Waters? Why aren't you just attending the surgery? I punched the button of the elevator to get us up to the surgical floor. I called and mentioned to Waters that I wanted to attend the surgery. I glanced around the elevator at some family that was taking the ride up with us. And let's just say he didn't need me in the room today. Elena looked at me in confusion. Hopefully she could deduce that I was overseeing this surgery because the guy already had a record, and that's the only reason I'd clear my Monday afternoon schedule for his craniotomy. I couldn't necessarily blurt out that he had been busted more than once due to negligence, and that shit wouldn't ever happen again so long as I could help it. It was my duty to ensure my resident surgeons were in their ORs, working for the patient's well-being. When a doctor waved off the chief surgeon asking to attend him, that raised a flag for me. Waters was pissed when he found out the board had selected me to take Elena's dad's position as the new chief, and his reaction came as no surprise to me. It's most likely the main reason he said I wasn't needed in surgery with him today. I could have pulled rank on his ass and demanded I be in there, but I wasn't that big of an arrogant dick, no matter what the rumors were. You should have gotten lunch with the ladies, I finally said. This might be the dullest surgery we've both had the privilege to attend. In fact, I'll probably have Junebug make me some coffee to keep me awake so I can observe the entire thing. Hilarious. I'll get a snack later, she said. Elena and I walked up into the room and sat down, watching the staff begin prepping the patient and the OR for Dr. Waters. 
Admit it, I whispered to her. You know you want me to come back to your place tonight. I'll admit that, she gave me a sly smile. But I don't keep surgeon hours, and I don't like to be kept up late at night on a Monday either. I smirked. Good thing I'm clear of surgeries until Thursday when I go on call this week. Then I guess you can sleep over. Waters walked in, and I watched the room come to life. Good damn thing, I teased. I was hoping this morning when I packed my entire closet that it would be worth my effort. You were planning on moving in? She chuckled while I studied the room. Yes, I affirmed, half in this conversation and half watching the group as they rolled in the patient on the gurney. What surgery is he doing on this patient? Elena asked. Craniotomy, I answered her, noting the patient was being prepped to remain asleep and leaning forward to observe the images, seeing the tumor located on the right side of the woman's brain. My attention was then brought to Waters when he walked in and went to work, locking the patient's head in the vise. I brought my folded hands to my chin and studied the images on the screens across the OR from the room I was in, and double-checked to ensure I did, in fact, see the tumor was on the right side of the patient's brain. So why the hell was Waters marking off the left side of the patient's head for him to make his cuts and then drill into the patient's skull for surgery? Did he request you to attend him? I absently asked Elena, after I stood, walked toward the glass, and folded my arms. Did he request someone to brain map this patient for him to remove the tumor? No. I have no idea why he's marking off the left side, either. Dr. Brooks, an intern said from behind me, as I was studying everything in front of me and discerning if Waters or another resident would stop the doctor from cutting into the wrong side of the patient's skull. Is he going to do surgery on the... Oh my God, three people said as I hit the button to communicate with the room. Dr. Waters, stop the surgery immediately, I said through the intercom that led him to the room. The fucker had his music blasting and couldn't hear me. This man's head was in the goddamn clouds. He was too busy showing off for the observation room instead of focusing, and he was about to perform surgery on the wrong side of his patient's brain. The only way to stop this and stop this fast was to bust into that OR before he could drill into the skull. I had to desterilize that fucking work environment, and that would force him to stop. With me not scrubbing in and entering the room, it would do just that. Dr. Brooks, I heard him say, startled and his mouth muffled from practically inhaling his mask after I rushed into the room. This, this is no longer a sterile environment, I practically growled. Put the shit down and pray to God that you didn't make a cut. This is my OR, and you're in violation of a sterile operating environment. You've lost your mind, Dr. Brooks. Turn off the goddamn music, I shouted, Waters and I screaming over it like we were both madmen. Have you made any cuts on this patient? I'd never been this pissed off before in my fucking life. He was really and truly about to operate on the wrong side of his patient's brain, and no one was paying attention except for the interns in the observation room and me? No incisions have been made. I was about to begin my surgery before you ruined my sterile... I looked at the anesthesia crew. Please carefully bring the patient out from under anesthesia. We won't be doing this surgery today. I looked at the residents. All of you are on administrative leave and will return in a week when you report to training. It is obvious you all did not see the massive mistake Dr. Waters has made. They left without arguing, though I did see the horror in their faces when they eyed the CT scans, MRIs, and computer model that showed the tumor wasn't on the side Dr. Waters was seconds away from cutting into. I looked to the rest of the staff in the room while Waters remained silent. I want this OR clear while the anesthesia team continues to wake the patient safely. Then I looked at Dr. Waters. You will wait for me in my office. You'd better have a damn good excuse as to why I saw a fucking brain tumor on the right side of the brain from that observation room and you were prepping to cut into this patient's left side. Dr. Brooks, I'll see you in my office after I've assured the family their member will be fine and the operation will be pushed out. 
After the chaos of ending a near-catastrophic event that could have caused crippling effects for the poor patient who was in the care of this surgeon, I left the room and went to speak with the patient's family. The patient was Betsy Kilmore. She was a female who was thirty-two years of age and the mother of three boys, ages four, two, and ten months. This patient was the wife of Luke Kilmore and the daughter of John and Peggy Johnson. I could go on and on with what I'd learned, speaking with her highly concerned family and informing them that we were forced to cancel surgery until further notice. These names ran through my mind, knowing they were so close to dealing with the worst nightmare a family or patient could suffer from. A botched fucking surgery. They would have sued the shit out of this hospital for malpractice, and when they won that case and were awarded shitloads of money, none of it would fix anything. If Dr. Waters had gone forward blindly and operated on the wrong side of the patient's brain, as he was intending on doing just moments ago, their lives would be changed forever. There wasn't any amount of money out there that could give Betsy back what this doctor would have taken away. When I walked into my office, I was calmer and more collected than I'd imagined I would be after what I'd witnessed close to an hour ago. Dr. Waters turned in the chair he'd been sitting in. Doctor, he started, but shut his mouth after he looked me in the eye. From the brain and from the brain only arise our pleasures, joys, laughter, and jests, as well as our sorrows, pains, griefs, and tears, I said slapping Dr. Waters' file on my desk and sitting in my seat. Hippocrates. It seems you know your Greek physicians, I answered Dr. Waters. It also appeared today as though you must admire the man so greatly that you would treat your O.R. as if you were living in the same barbaric, surgical times he was forced to live through. That's not what I was doing, and you know it, he mumbled. I'm not getting into what the hell you were doing, because what you were about to fucking do was ruin someone's life, I said, angrier than before after hearing the man defend himself. He should have been scared as fuck, completely shaken up, after what he'd almost done. Instead, I was listening to an asshole defend himself instead of concern himself with his patient's well-being first. Listen, he cleared his throat as he tried to sound more professional. It was a mistake. I'm glad you caught it. Glad. I stared at him with disgust, repeating that word flatly. I watched the man and then let out a breath. You know the old saying, there are some doctors that make mistakes, and then there are some doctors that are good at burying them? I said through gritted teeth, referring to doctors who've killed their patients, and those fucking mistakes went six feet underground. That's not how it was. I'm not one of those dirty and twisted doctors, and you know it. I know. It's obvious that you wouldn't have had the attention to detail that goes into being a serial killer. So, change my fucking mind. After knowing your record and then the shit I saw today, I would assume that you're a doctor who's good at burying mistakes. Or at least thinks he could be. And fuck you for that and everything this hospital should have gotten rid of you over five fuck-ups ago. But I'm sure those previous errors were all just mistakes. Watch your language. Excuse me, fucking mistakes. I exhaled. Better? Dr. Brooks. I ignored the pleading I sensed in his voice. Because of careless doctors like you, patients and anyone in general have a more heightened fear of surgery than they naturally would. Due to horror stories like what I almost witnessed today, they fear doctors. The good doctors who want to help end up having to go through hell and back to gain their trust. I narrowed my eyes at him. Your careless act is the exact reason I became a neurosurgeon and worked my ass off to get to where I'm at today. I relaxed my clenched fist. I ensured that when my patients go under my blade, my saw, my drill, even the fucking light in my OR, they are acutely aware that I understand how frightened they are. I know that they made a critical decision to place their delicate lives in my hands, and I don't take one single ounce of that for granted. I watched his knuckles turn white as he held his hands clasped together. Until now, I valued you as a member of this neuro division, 
You were a doctor who I believe was just as valuable to St. John's as any of the other greats who have come before us. Today, you've proven that you're an incompetent snake, and you need to be removed from practice. You will no longer work for St. John's, and I will ensure this goes directly into your permanent record. You can't take my license over an accident, he defended himself. I'm well aware of that, but after I'm done filing my report on the circus I witnessed, I don't think I'll need to worry about you having a license in the near future. You act like you're the be-all, end-all of surgeons, like you've never made a mistake in surgery. I folded my hands and leaned up on my desk. Do you know why I will not listen to music while I perform surgery, and I only turn it on when I've successfully finished? To celebrate, I don't fucking know. I prefer to hear my patient's heartbeat instead. Every time I hear that heartbeat, I'm in tune with the precious life that's in my care. I won't allow my mind to be distracted from each beat of their heart. It's a sacred thing for a patient to trust you with their life, Mike, I said. It's a dangerous thing when a doctor takes that for granted. Tell me something, how long have you been practicing? Almost twenty years. Same, I said, knowing it had almost been that long for me as well, yet I still treated each patient the same as I did the minute I'd received the honor and privilege to practice as a neurosurgeon. And in all your years, have you lost a patient? Of course I have. Really? Tell me, can you name any of the patients you've lost? Lost? As in deaths? Shit, Brooks, what kind of point are you trying to make? Answer the question, I demanded. I think I've lost maybe ten, he answered. I don't fixate on that stuff. You see, I've lost close to fifty in my years as a doctor in the ER and post-op. Mostly gunshot wounds, car accidents, or people placed on life support with the family praying to God that they came out of it. I know every single one of their names, but I won't bore you with that since you don't fixate on such things. You would admit to losing patience? Wow, never saw that in you. I think we have both seen things today we never saw in each other before, Waters. You know some surgeons won't tell their patients the odds and outcomes of surgery? They aren't honest with them, but I am. I know the odds in this profession, and every day that I recall those statistics, I'm a better surgeon for it. I eyed him as I leaned back in my chair and continued. Watching you today, even now, I see a doctor with a lack of consideration toward human life, given that you nearly destroyed one today and have the nerve to defend your actions. You've not asked about how her family feels with our pushing out the surgery. You've never once looked apologetic or fearful with the knowledge of what you almost did. You sit here and act like an asshole doctor who got fucking caught. And for the last time, let me assure you. I'll find another place to practice. When I write my letter to the state board about this, I'll see to it that you won't ever be bringing a surgical blade near a human life again. I said it was a fucking accident. I didn't realize I lost my bearings in there and was operating on the wrong side of the brain. There's no room for error. Perhaps Betsy Kilmore would have forgiven you if you explained the little mishap you had today as being an accident when she woke up paralyzed, I said in an unwavering tone. Fuck you! We have no room for negligence in our field. As neurosurgeons, we already have the mystery of the human brain to work with on its own. To walk to the wrong fucking side of a patient's skull to cut into their brain blindly? Would you forgive my mistake if I pulled that shit on you? Yes. Yeah, I'm sure you would, I said with disgust. As chief, I will be working on your suspension and calling for a comprehensive review of patients who've been in your care. This will be reported to the hospital board as soon as you leave my office. The state board will be given a descriptive letter penned by me to read and determine if you are a safe surgeon and it will be up to them if they decide you keep your license. I exhaled. After our interview, what I saw, and what the witnesses saw from the observation gallery, I highly doubt they'll have much faith in you. 
get the hell out of my office, pack your shit, and you'll be advised on where you stand while you're on administrative leave and investigations are complete. You're overreacting. All for the good of that patient, and any future patients that St. John's would have entrusted to you. I only pray to God that I'm overreacting, and the investigations don't uncover this sick feeling I have about you. The board will fire you for this. We'll let the board decide that, won't we? Get the hell out of my office. Dr. Waters was the type of man who made my blood boil. Just by looking into his soulless eyes, I could tell that we'd find negligence with minimal digging. He was one of the doctors who made the respectable doctors look corrupt. A greedy doctor who opted in for surgery, even when the patient didn't need it. I'd been around doctors long enough to separate the good from the bad. I wasn't a fool born into this profession yesterday, and I sure as hell wasn't the chief surgeon around here because I smiled a lot. You didn't fucking get to make these mistakes in our profession. If doctors gave themselves passes like that, who knows what the statistics of patient deaths and recoveries would look like? Hell no. Each life was sacred, and for us to gain a patient's trust, which sometimes was damn near impossible, it meant the world. There were too many noble doctors out there to be in the shadow of dicks like waters. Chapter 21 Elena It had been a long day, to say the least and it would have been exponentially longer if Colin hadn't stopped that surgery. He was quicker to act than the rest of us. He was out of the room and bursting into the OR before all of us observing in the gallery could fully grasp the gravity of what was happening. For the rest of the day, we all performed our duties as if nothing had happened in that OR. We tried to keep things business as usual, but gossip, of course, was flying. Little by little, whispers from the doctors, Interns and nurses started buzzing. The first rumor I'd heard was that Colin had gone above the hospital board's head and independently fired that asshole doctor. Then, the senior staff started killing those rumors as quickly as they started. It turned out that the doctor was suspended from performing any further surgeries and was placed on administrative leave pending an investigation. I expected Colin to be done with work by the end of the regular workday, but I saw that his office door was still closed, and Justine, his interim secretary, stated that he'd been on a conference call since he returned to his office. Can you let Dr. Brooks know I've gone home for the day? I asked Justine after pulling on my wool coat. She gave me the same smile everyone had been giving me since Colin made it perfectly clear we were dating now. Colin preferred to be open about our relationship instead of dealing with gossip that might come out of us spending the weekend together and future weekends together. And I trusted his judgment, even though it made for a few awkward situations. I could have avoided talking to Justine at all, but I didn't want to interrupt him with a text just to tell him to meet me at my place, if he was still in the mood to come over. Little did I know, I wouldn't have Colin over at all this week. And by Thursday night, when I learned he was out of his spinal surgery and sleeping in his office before he started his 72-hour on-call tonight, I had to check on the man. It's not like he was avoiding me. It was just a busy week. Our schedules didn't line us up to see each other, and Colin was spending his after-hours time going over what had happened with Dr. Waters with the board. I unlocked the back door, knowing that the staff all had left for the day, and turned on a light so Colin wouldn't think some creep was lurking in the office halls. Good God, where was he asleep? At his desk? I tapped on his door and then opened it, seeing his desk lamp was the only light on in his room. I glanced around. Colin? I said, wondering if he was hiding somewhere behind the two doors that led to other areas in his office. The one to my left opened, and he ran his hand through his messy hair. Hey, he said, where the hell have you been all week? He crossed the room in fresh scrubs and his million-dollar smile. Just walking around offices looking for where my boyfriend's been hiding? I teased as I wholeheartedly welcomed his delicious fragrance and hug that swallowed me up. God, I've missed you. Get in here, he said, pulling me into a room that blew my mind. What the hell is this? This is the reason I can live in Malibu on the beach, 
and not stay at a hotel to get some sleep before a long shift. You know, my place is only 20 minutes from the hospital. He brought me into an area that was practically a studio apartment. He had another desk along the wall to my left, a sofa under a window to my right, and a twin-sized bed across the other wall. The curtains were made of blackout material, and it was the perfect little hideout for any doctor if they were pulling long shifts. Well, I wouldn't have had time to run to your place, make up for not fucking my lady every night this week, and then get back in time for my damn phone to start blowing up with emergencies. I took his face in my hands. If the guy had a long week, which I knew he had, you would never know. You need to get some sleep. I'll see you on Sunday morning if you want to come crash at my place. I stopped. Wait, I won't be there. I promised Dad I'd head up to his place this weekend. So I'll have a key made. Seriously, unless I break up with you, just come stay at my place. He eyed me. This Sunday you'll be at the ranch in Malibu? My brother isn't helping worth a damn to organize the house. Is this what our relationship is now? He grinned, taking my hands from his face and kissing my fingers. You and me unpacking on the weekends? You're sleeping, I said. I know you're going to be busy as all neurosurgeons are when they're on call. I'm sleeping. He arched an eyebrow at me, then cupped my ass. With you. Listen up. I'm leaving now. I went up on my toes to touch my lips to his. I miss you like crazy, and we're going to make up for lost time later. This isn't going to work for me. Colin eyed me. Going one day without enjoying your sexy body was bad enough. Now God only knows what I'll do when I've got you to myself again. Selfish man, I teased. Get some rest. I'm sure you've eaten, but if not, I'll run out and... Colin's lips captured mine, cutting me off mid-sentence. How the hell could I have forgotten the savory taste of masculinity that I devoured when I kissed him? Why did I forget that Colin's kiss was nothing less than intense and always spoke right to the body parts that pleaded for this man to go further? His tongue was forceful and dominant as it met with mine in a way that made my knees buckle. His hands pressed against my lower back and over my butt to hoist me up into his arms. I moaned and gripped his perfect face as our heads shifted to deepen this sensual kiss. I pulled my lips from his and ran my lips in soft pecks all over his flawless face. I love you so much, I said, while I assaulted his face with kisses. I can't let you leave without giving you something to think about when you drift off to dream tonight, sunshine. Colin started in on that cute nickname as a joke on Sunday morning, and it had to have been my reaction to the way he said it, because he kept using it throughout the day whenever we found ourselves lost in each other like this. Damn, I've missed everything about him. It's always been a fantasy to have a hot doctor screw me in his scrubs, I said, pulling my face back and running my hands through his hair. I have to wear these damn things while we have sex? He eyed me with a curious look. That came out wrong. I laughed, my head spinning and my body aching now. Well, are we just going to stand in the middle of your secret office bedroom, or are we going to get busy? Colin arched an eyebrow at me. Your sweet ass is mine. It didn't take much for Colin and me to have our bodies reunited in hot sex, rekindling the fire of ecstasy we'd shared all day on Sunday before work pulled us away from each other this week. I loved that I could come hard and fast with him while he managed to hold back and keep going for longer, but I always had an aching need that was about more than my own orgasms. It was seeing his facial expressions and feeling his body react when he came. I watched Colin's face contort into that serious look he always had right before he finally let it go. His hands went up into my hair and gripped it tightly as he thrust deeper and faster. His vivid blue eyes were wild and hypnotic as they fell into the trance that I had been in since he laid me back on this small bed and kissed my body as if memorizing it. I loved feeling his strong hands holding me firmly in place while I arched into him, selfishly trying to work his cock into my sensitive spot that was deep inside. He made me crawl out of my skin when his cock brought my deep spot to life, and I came so hard that my body always shivered in aftershocks when I slowly came off my sex with Colin high. 
I watched him lick his lips and clenched my pussy tightly around him, forcing Colin to purse his lips while fucking me harder. I loved the power behind the way he worked my body over. I watched his eyebrows knit together while I reached for his hair, gripping it and holding on for dear life as my man slammed deep inside of me. Harder, baby, I begged. God, I've missed you. This? I trailed off, absorbing every part of our sex. Fuck, your pussy is so goddamn good, he said in his low growl. Colin and I were both vocal and breathless as we rode this wave of pleasure together. Having nothing left in me after I rode out my orgasm with Colin's, I melted beneath his rigid body. I wished we could do this all night, but I already knew that I was lucky enough to have him want to slide this in before he went on call tonight in the first place. It's been too long, he said, kissing under my chin and down my neck. He licked each of my hard nipples as he slowly moved in and out of me. I tried to fix his hair that I'd pulled between my fingers in the height of my ecstasy. Thank God your hairstyle is a natural, just-got-fucked look, or we'd both be busted. I kissed the top of his head that smelled as delicious as his cologne, thanks to his hair products. Colin shifted to where he could lay behind me and pulled my ass into his softening cock. Can you just stay here and let me selfishly fuck you after I come back from emergency calls all night? Who knows, maybe I never get called up to the hospital at all. His thumb grazed over my ribs from where his hand rested against my stomach. God knows I deserve a break after this hellish week. I rubbed his forearm. We haven't had a chance to talk at all this week. Are you doing okay after that whole incident with Dr. Waters? I'm doing fine. I felt his lips press against my hair. I've just been in meetings in between seeing my patients. At least the hospital terminated that asshole after this final offense. Thank God he's out of here. I twisted in his arms to face him. You did an amazing job stopping that surgery as quickly as you did. I just did my job, baby. He kissed my nose. I traced the sharp lines that defined the features of his face. So, you're okay? I asked him shocked at how well he composed himself through any situation. Yes, my little neuro shrink. He smiled. I'm okay. You haven't asked yourself anything like, what if you weren't there to stop it? If I let the crippling words of what if haunt me, then I would be stuck in the past and completely fucked over by what could have happened that day. That's a good and healthy way to process it all. I smiled. How do you manage to keep such a positive frame of mind? especially with something like that. I narrowed my eyes at him. Are you cheating on me with another psychiatrist? He laughed. I am. She's due in this room any second, so you should probably go. He slid his fingertips along my back. In truth, I learned to not focus on negative shit from the one and only Dr. Miguel Alvarez. My dad? I laughed. I guess that sounds like something he would do. Yes. He taught me that you learn and you move forward. Everything is something to learn from. The scariest shit stuff that has people freaking out at the possibilities of tragic outcomes. Well, you can't dwell on that. He shrugged. They're all lessons, and there are reasons that we're placed in situations at the right place at the right time, or the wrong place and the wrong time. It's all how you process it. If I were to dwell on the what ifs, then I couldn't have helped anyone this week. I wouldn't have finished the rest of that day with patient consultations. It's simple. I was there, I handled the situation, and I learned from it. New and stricter protocols are now being implemented in all surgeries. I will never have this kind of fuck-up happen again in my ward. We're better than this. Waters was already in trouble with a few issues on his record, and that's the main reason I went up to observe him. Well, Dr. Colin Brooks, you're a damn fine chief surgeon. He smirked. To hear that come from your mouth? He rolled me onto my back. Means we're going another round. His eyes widened in that fun, mischievous Colin look. Can you handle another round with me, my little ray of sunshine? I can and would, but you need to rest before you go on tonight. I will, he assured me, then decided to win this argument by bringing my hand to his hard cock.
but I think I'd rather fuck my girl again. You win. He smiled my favorite smile that highlighted his entire face and creased his forehead. I always win, my little sex goddess. We all say we're in love at one point or another. Then we fall in love with the right person later on in life. I had no explanation for the way Colin made me feel. My thoughts were always with him. Catching a glimpse of his tall and commanding frame while he walked the hospital floors made my heart jump in my chest. His smile made me feel like I was the most important woman in his entire world, and I knew there was no replacing him. Chapter 22 Colin Last night, I'd finalized our flight to Oahu next week for Jim and Avery's wedding, and I was glad that shit was out of my way. Everyone else in the wedding party was planning to take the private jet, which would have been nice, but Elena could only do so much to move patients around for this to happen. I didn't mind flying commercial if it meant I got to escort my Cuban goddess to a tropical paradise. As much as I looked forward to attending Jim and Avery's wedding, my real motivation for wanting to take this trip was to spend uninterrupted time with Elena. I couldn't get enough of her, and work had gotten in the way too many times lately. Today was Christmas morning, and we woke up together at Elena's condo. I laughed at this whole notion of us not wanting to be separated whenever we were fortunate to have time off, and I was grateful she felt the same way I did. Merry Christmas! Elena shouted as she walked out to where I waited for her in the living room. You ready to do this? First of all, you look smoking fucking hot, I said, planting my hand on her counter. And second of all, no. Why don't we stay at my place in Malibu and spend the day unwrapping each other and taking fuck selfies? You know, shit like that. Fuck selfies? Her eyebrows rose in humor. That's a new one. What can I say? I come up with good shit. And trust me, fuck selfies are a must. You're full of shit, she played back. Let's just stay at my house. I cringed at the idea of heading to my mom's house for Christmas dinner. No matter how much I loved the woman, it was not something I wanted to do. We can go to your dad's place, and then we can spend the rest of our holiday at my place on the beach. Her eyes narrowed funnily. You made it perfectly clear that not only did Jake prank me about you saving brown trees for Christmas, but you've also never even decorated your place before. She smiled, her black strapless dress pushing her cleavage to perfection. What are you not telling me? Ring, ring, ring. I checked my phone. It was Mom. Well, if it isn't my ever-loving mother calling to make sure I show up to her festive activities tonight. You know, Elena doesn't want to go, I announced when I answered my phone, making Elena's eyes nearly bulge out of her head. Oh, no, my mom responded. She knew I was always full of shit, but she probably believed me anyway. I know, it's so disappointing, I sighed. She said it's all too much too fast. You having all of those elite people over there, she's the odd man out. She hasn't stopped going on and on about this for hours. Colin Michael, stop teasing your mother. My mom laughed, knowing I got most of my crazy personality from her. For heaven's sake, I hope she knows what she's getting herself into with you. Oh, she knows all right. I held my hand up knowing Elena had enough personality to rip the phone from my lying hands and set this record straight. Listen, honey, she said. Carrie and Max surprised me late last night by showing up unannounced with my three precious grandbabies. No kidding, I said with a smile. Glad I was notified about all of this. I'm notifying you now, you impossible son of mine. That I am. How long are they going to be there? That's the thing. Not very long, and since the kids woke up to Santa Claus this morning at the house, we're not making the extravagant dinner tonight. I already informed Jim and Jake. They found out about this before I did? I eyed the beautiful, onyx-haired woman who had the most adorable yet perplexed look on her face. Why am I not surprised? Okay, so what's the plan, then? 
Are you and Elena okay with going out to celebrate Christmas night at that adorable village with all of the lit Christmas trees and Santa's village? As much as I love my nieces and nephew, trust me when I say I've had my share of outdoor Christmas tree extravaganzas this year. Why don't we just figure out lunch or something? Elena's phone had rung, and she was seemingly having the same conversation with her dad. There's been a change. Do you think your dad will be cool with us swinging by tonight? I asked in a soft voice, hearing that she might be getting news of a Christmas change on her end as well. This is why the holidays were so damn complicated sometimes. Why couldn't we stay back at my place? Hell, I should have swept Elena's ass out of here, and then we wouldn't have had to deal with parents and their confusing plan changes. Elena seemed to thrive on last-minute shit, though, putting us on opposite ends of the spectrum with our personalities. She nodded and gave me a thumbs-up in response to my question. All right, a thumbs-up from Elena says we're a go for Christmas lunch with my sister, mom, and kiddos. And Max. Max is a douche, I teased. I can't wait to see you, mom laughed. I've missed my boy. You too, mom. I said, and then I hung up. I thought about all of the things I wanted to do with Elena in this strapless dress as she giggled and laughed on the phone. If I could get away with it, which I might. Colin! Elena batted my hands away from running up the sides of her thighs as I kissed along her shoulder. Don't! she whispered. Like her teasing laugh was going to kill my heart on and the desire to fuck my girl right here and now. Unfortunately, it just pushed Elena to pop off the phone much faster and turn back to me. Her eyes looked like the devil, the bad kind, hidden behind some bad joke she was about to deliver. I'll go first. My sister and brother-in-law flew in last night with the kids, I say slowly, wary of what the hell Elena was about to tell me. And so I'm glad you agreed to Christmas lunch, since my mother canceled her usual dinner party where a bunch of assholes get drunk and... I stopped. What the hell is it? Your expression is making me nervous. She bit her bottom lip. You're only allowed to give me that look when you want me to fuck you senseless, I said. Well, the good news is this. Both of our families made us switch our times of visiting them, and so that part works out perfectly. Let me quickly emphasize that I'm not a good news, bad news kind of guy. And God help your patience if this is how you deliver news to them. What's the bad news? You're going to meet my older sister, Lydia, but that's not all. She stopped, and I knew an Elena giggle was on its way to bubble out of her merry little heart. There's nothing wrong with being prematurely judged, I challenged. Then this next part won't be so bad after all. Spit. It. Out. Lydia has arranged this big ordeal, apparently, and all of our friends will be there. She's planned to throw Dad a housewarming party and Christmas party all in one night at the ranch. Caterers and everything. She realizes that he moved out there to get away from the madness, right? She can be quite the bitch, and that's putting it nicely. That's putting it quite harshly, coming from the sweetest woman I've ever met. Should I be concerned about this woman? No. She laughed and grabbed my hand. Turns out we both have sisters who wanted to surprise our parents this Christmas. Well, my sister has made my life easier. I smiled and nuzzled my lips against her neck. Your sister found a way to complicate it again. She sort of goes all out. So much so that I've been known to leave these parties, which are typically reserved for New Year's Eve, and no one noticed my absence. That's shocking in and of itself. However, I'm glad about that. This way, they won't notice us slipping out when the night escalates into drunken people gossiping about their cheating spouses over champagne. Oh, shit! She covered her laugh. How do you know that? Have you been spying on these parties my whole life? I shook my head. I grew up with these same lushes, overindulging at parties since I was old enough to remember. I smiled. That's it. All of our cars have suddenly broken down at my house. Elena danced around the Malibu place with a cheerfulness I should have expected from her, 
and I loved the fact that she approved of the place. We were about fifteen minutes down the road from Jake and Ash's house, so we stopped there to give our Christmas wishes and John's gift before going to my mom's place. Elena and Carrie instantly hit it off, but again, it was Elena, and I would have been shocked if my family disapproved. I knew my dad would have loved this woman without a shadow of a doubt, too. The whole day was moving at light speed, and I even got a speeding ticket in my car to prove that theory. Dad designed every last detail of our hidden Hollywood Hills place, and when we pulled up to it, Elena was in awe. The place was more of a show house than a proper home. However, it was still my childhood home, and I had tons of memories from the hidden passageways to riding our horses with professional trainers when we were young. We had lunch in the garden room, and without having time for tours of the 50,000-square-foot mansion, I was stuck explaining how we always congregated in one wing of the house. I could see the confusion on Elena's face when she looked around at this massive place and wondering how my mother could live here alone. Now, here we were after the entire day had flown past us, and I was enjoying a beer with Miguel. We talked about Waters, and I elaborated more on his being dismissed from the hospital after Elena had explained what had happened that week. It validated me immensely when Miguel agreed with how I went about handling the idiot doctor. So, Miguel said, as we hid from the party guests, moving out to the patio with beers in our hands. Everything seems to be going well with you and my Laney, huh? I smirked at him. I couldn't agree more. She's completely taken by you, Brooks, he said. I don't say that lightly, either. He glanced back through the large windows that showed the guests we ditched, celebrating over eggnog and ham. I never thought I'd see Laney smile and laugh more than she already did. He looked back at me. I grew speechless when I saw her moving through the room with a vibrant smile and not a care in the world. Damn, I was speechless. Literally. You look at her the way I've seen her look at you, he chuckled. Better hope she doesn't break your heart. His forehead wrinkled the same way Elena's did when she was wholeheartedly humored. No kidding. We walked back into the house and the woman I deemed the Ice Queen, Elena's sister, Lydia, stopped me. I swear, I think Elena must have stolen all of the family genetics of cheerfulness, I said, when the slender woman with black hair, red lips, and glowing green eyes met me as Miguel left me to fend for myself. Now, is that a thing to say to someone you hardly know? Gee, I exhaled. I was wondering the same when you insulted my best friend and me by mentioning you were pleased your sister brought one of SoCal's most eligible male sluts to your family party. Didn't seem to bother Elena. She arched that sharp brow at me. Tell me, Colin, does Elena know about your past with women? I'm sure she watched whatever it appears you watched in that documentary. And if she hasn't? I did a little googling. You're certainly no saint with your little billionaire's club joke of a life, and even if my dad thinks you're a good neurosurgeon, it doesn't mean you're good for my sister. I think Elena and I have figured out that we're both good for each other, I said with a smile. In fact, we're in love. I thought I'd taunt the probing older sister who I'd seen talk down to almost everyone tonight. In love? She scoffed. Something tells me you don't know the meaning of the word. Listen, Mr. Brooks, I love my sister dearly, and I will not stand for her to be played by you. Then I'll save you the trouble, because I have no plans of playing her. We'll see. If you knew what was best for my Laney, you'd turn her loose to fall for a man who won't hurt her like my dad hurt our mom. Aside from that, I do know Laney comes from money, so it's quite obvious why you, being in that billionaire's club, would feel safe using her for yourself. I don't think there's anything you can say that would change my mind about you. That caught me off guard. I won't respond to that. I will tell you this. Elena is the love of my life, and I will not hurt her. I'm sure you won't. She fake smiled as soon as Elena linked her arm into mine. 
Good evening and Merry Christmas, Dr. Brooks. I looked at Elena's brilliant smile and was tossed with emotions of anger toward her sister for even considering that I'd hurt this beautiful soul, who'd made this past month of being with her feel like it had been years together. What's wrong? Laney frowned. It's good. I was numb because what if that woman was right? Fuck no. She wasn't right. She was a goddamn witch or something and got into my head. Elena pulled me out of the room and into her father's downstairs study. Colin, what the hell did she say to you? You look like you've seen a ghost. I smirked. You know about my past. You know I was a complete asshole who dated chicks for my own selfish reasons. You know I am not that man with you, right? Elena looked angry and humored all at once. I know you're the best man I've ever met. Lanny, I'm serious. Your sister made some great points, and I've been so caught up in making sure I had you for the rest of my life that she brought some things to my attention that I need you to know are not even close to being fucking true. Avery and Ash. She readjusted my tie. Well, let's just say we girls talk. I know all about that silly name that your drunk and sexy butt got you and those three guys labeled with. I know there's something more between us. I feel it more and more every time I'm with you. Sheesh, she laughed. Don't let Lydia into your head with her big shot lawyer stuff. I need you to understand. You're the love of my life. Your sister seems to have other plans, though, and I don't want to drive a wedge between you two either. The woman hates my sorry ass. Elena got that mischievous look on her face and walked over to her father's desk, cut some string, and walked back to me. Give me a kiss. I didn't hesitate to rejuvenate my mind and soul with feeling the softness of her lips. Much better. Good. She smiled. Now, are you ready for something wild and fun? Are we leaving? I practically begged. No, chicken, we're not. We're proving a point. Come on. I walked with a smile plastered on my face, and the comfort of Elena's fingers intertwined with mine as we met with the party guests again. Here, down this shot. Elena laughed as she walked me over to the bar. She clicked her shot glass with mine, widened her eyes, and smiled. What the hell are you doing? Can I have everyone's attention, please? Elena said. She hardly needed to announce herself because the woman grabbed the attention of the entire room without even having to say a word. There. She smiled at me. As you all are well aware, Colin and I have been dating for, what, a month? Three weeks, I chuckled. Right. She smiled at the room that softly laughed. We'll round up since it's Christmas. She laughed and then looked back at me. Babe. She smiled and fiddled with my hand in hers. Babe, I repeated. What the hell are you doing? A month of being with you, and I'll never forget you telling me how much time I wasted by not admitting that we were meant for each other. You were right. Her radiant bronze eyes peered up at me through thick lashes. I can't go another day without telling you that you're the man of my dreams. You're the man I will, she gave me a playful smile, spend the rest of my life with. So I have to know something. Will you make me the happiest woman in the world by completing what we started and making sure that I'll always be the one you'll love? No other women, just me and you. The room disappeared, and it was just me and this beautiful ball of Christmas cheer. Laney, you know there will never be anyone but you for me. I'm in love with you. I even serenaded a damn brown tree and brought the stupid thing to my beach house just to see that smile on your face and hear the laugh that sparks more to my heart than anything else has in the world. You're my fucking treasure and my heart, I said, when I saw a tear slip from the corner of her eye. 
Marry me, Dr. Colin Brooks. Make me the luckiest woman in the world. Laney, I said, biting my lip. Don't you dare tease me with a prank like this. You've been spending too much time with Jake and me. I glanced up to find my eyes trapped by the beautiful ice queen who hated my guts and would probably put a hit out on my ass after this. I shook off the woman's evil green eyes and looked back to the safety of my stunning Elena. You know I'd get your brother a marriage license online in a flash and have his ass marry us. I winked over at Stevie, who was thrown Elena's phone and had been laughing and videoing this whole episode. I would marry you here and now if I knew. Elena's hands framed my face, and she kissed me in front of God and everyone. I pulled her in tightly, and with a nip to her lips, I smiled. You've lost your mind, I said. Let's go home. We'll call your dad and apologize for... Marry me. I don't ever see us living a day apart again for the rest of our lives. She smiled brilliantly. You promised me already that I had met my future husband the first night we danced together. I didn't believe you until recently, but you were right. When the heart wants, it wants. You, Elena Alvarez, are asking me to marry you? And you're dead serious, with a bunch of drunk people, I eyed her sister, and an ice queen as your witness that you want to spend the rest of your life with me as your husband? She did that nod and biting her bottom lip thing that made me want her up against the wall and crying out my name in ecstasy, but God, this was sincere. I think. I sighed. Well, I don't have the ring I was hoping for because I didn't realize today would be the day my girl asks me to marry her. Elena took out that slender piece of rope string and wrapped it a few times. You told me once that you don't live in a world of what-ifs, and I'm not about to wonder what if I never asked him, she said, before tying it in a knot around my left finger. There, we tied the knot and everything. What if I said no? I winked at her playful smile. I'd call your bluff with a long, tasty kiss, and then you'd say yes. I laughed and held her close. You'll never stop amazing me with your crazy antics, I said. I love you, and I love my string ring even more. So yes, my little ray of constant sunshine, I'll marry you, and without a second thought. I wiggled my fingers for her to observe the ring she made, and one that I inwardly swore to myself that I would never take off. This crafty little ring will stay right here she announced to her sister's arched brow of judgment. You can take it off when we both tattoo our real rings on our fingers. That way, you'll be married to me for eternity. Her laugh after that was the only thing that helped me survive the chaos of congratulations. Watching the Ice Queen melt when the attention of her big shindig had turned into a celebration for her younger sister, the happiest and most beautiful woman in the room, that was just a bonus. Still, we found a way to give the woman back her night when we left after the guests consumed more alcohol and Elena's brother hit the DJ scene. All of that just to prove a point to your sister, I asked, as we flew down the road to get onto the Pacific Coast Highway. Jesus Christ, I can't imagine how your father handled you two as you grew up. I've never done anything in my life to try and prove a point to her. I actually proved a point to myself, she said taking my hand to her lips and kissing it. I wasn't joking. I sincerely want to spend the rest of my life with you. I hope you know I wasn't kidding around. I just hope you're not drunk, and you'll remember this when I hold you to it tomorrow. That and your brother was videoing the thing, so good luck backing out now. I know. I handed Stevie my phone. She laughed. No, I'm not drunk. I don't get drunk around strangers, especially in my dad's house. I'm dead serious. I want you to marry me. The proposal was probably goofy, but it was fun and livened up a boring party. I braced the back of her neck and pulled her over to kiss her. Baby, 
You're the best thing to ever happen to me. Your sister is probably going to kill me in my sleep, but at least I'd die a happy man, knowing my lady loves me enough to spend the rest of her life with me. And for that, I smiled at her. Yes, I will marry you. And after we get past this next upcoming wedding ceremony that's now in my way, we'll work on me finding the words to honor you and properly propose to you. Hey, my words were perfect. She playfully punched my arm. So, you don't want the ring? I winked at her. No, I want the tattoo rings, she laughed. But for now, let's enjoy the last of this Christmas together by going home, getting some Chinese food, and watching Scrooged. I laughed. I was going to say turn on some good music and go home and have some crazy sex, but now I'm going to have to go with this method of celebrating a pop engagement that my little spark plug sprung on me. I brought the back of her hand to my lips. I was right. That first night we met, you were dancing with your future husband. It just took me longer to realize you were right about that, too. You need to understand that I'm right about a lot of things when it comes to you and me. I licked my lips and shook my head. We're insane, too. And that's why I love us. Merry Christmas, baby. Chapter 23 Elena on our flight, I took the opportunity to tell Colin that I'd lived in Hawaii for a short time after I graduated high school because of a summer fling. It was an impulsive decision that almost made my parents croak, but it was one of my fonder life memories. Fortunately for my folks, living with a Polynesian fire dancer didn't make for a sustainable life at 18 years old, so it didn't take long before moving to the mainland again. The only reason I'd gone into such detail was that Koi, my ex, was still a great friend of mine. And, well, since Colin was now my fiancé, he was getting the download of my life history. As I expected, Colin was amused by my admission, and I think, more than anything, he tried his hardest not to make fun of my ex's name. From the moment we landed in Oahu, the welcoming spirit of aloha was alive and well, and wrapping itself around all of us with its different meanings of kindness, compassion, and love, and we'd been enjoying it non-stop for the last two days. Ash and Avery had set up cabanas at the beach, with the perfect vantage point to watch the guys in the water with the kids. Listening to the waves crashing as I felt the warm sun on my skin— was the perfect way to spend the week after Christmas. This sun feels amazing, Ash said. The kids love the fact that they can be out with the guys and surfing in warm water, too. The kids are the cutest. Addison is crushing it out there, too, I said, holding my hand up like a visor and looking out at the guys as they surfed on longboards with the kids. She's almost got this sport down to where she doesn't need Jim on that board with her. Avery's daughter might have been one of the cutest little girls I'd ever seen. It was so sweet to watch her with Jim also. Jim and Avery's story was as sweet as it was remarkable. They'd met on a flight to London and then wound up at Jim's estate in England. One thing led to another, and Avery's vacation to London turned into an extraordinary romantic affair. Now, here we were, ramping up to a wedding ceremony for the two. And after spending more time with the group for the past two days, I could easily see the softer and less stiff side of the handsome, soon-to-be groom. If you'd met Avery and Jim and never heard about their history, you would believe Addison was Jim's biological daughter. I was sad for Addie to hear that her dad was a complete fuck-up of a drug addict, but Jim made up for whatever shortcomings Avery's ex may have had. And it sounded to me like there were a lot of them. Addie has been begging to stand up on the front of the board finally. Avery laughed and smiled over at me. Jim is as bad as Addison sometimes. He's been up my butt about it since he got her out on a board with him a year ago. It still surprises me sometimes to see how much Jim has loosened up by having you both in his life. You and Addie really are the best things to ever happen to that guy, Ash said. And how exciting that you've got another on the way, I said. Your wedding night is going to be phenomenal. 
especially when you tell him about the baby. I can't believe the two of you are both pregnant and you've managed to hide it from your men for so long. I laughed. Tell me about it. It seems like Jim is always offering me a beer these days, and I have to come up with some dumb excuse as to why I don't want to have a drink, Avery said with a laugh. I have to say that I feel bloated or something. I'm beginning to wonder if he does know and just isn't saying anything. A whole month of trying to hide this from him hasn't been easy, but it'll be worth it in the end. Do you think he might know? I asked, hoping he didn't, because this was Avery's special gift for him on their wedding night. Well, I know for certain that if Jake had figured out I am six weeks along, Colin would know. She looked at me and smiled. And I'm quite confident Colin would have blurted something out to you about it. I haven't heard a word, I said. But then again, Colin and I have only been together for a little over a month now. God, you both are so cute together, and you're so much fun. I can't imagine him without you anymore. Is that weird? I can't. It's like you've always been there, Avery said. It's not weird. I totally agree with you, Ash added. I never thought I'd see the day when Colin met his match. She pulled her sunglasses down and smiled. But you are seriously that man's other half. Your proposal? Knowing Colin and knowing you better now? I'm not even surprised it happened, Avery added. Ash laughed and nodded along. When you two decide to get married, I'll make sure Jake doesn't throw in his two cents and offer up our rowboat as your escape vehicle, or whatever in the hell you'd call leaving your wedding in a rowboat. I was smiling so widely that my cheeks were burning. I loved hearing these two affirming what I already knew. Colin and I were meant for each other. Jake's already offered to get a minister's license to marry us. I bit my bottom lip, trying not to laugh when Avery and Ash lost it over that idea. Guess you two haven't heard about that one? Those two, Ash said. Then she looked at me. I promise I won't let him go through with that. Good God, those two are too much. Back to the wedding at hand, I said. Mine and Colin's isn't happening for a while. I didn't even want to bring it up because this is your wedding week, Avery. I told Colin to keep it to himself. But I guess that was a tall order for that guy. I arched my eyebrow, sat up in my lounge chair, and turned to face Avery and Ash. So let's get down to the real business here. Your wedding details. Avery nodded and sat up more in her lounge chair. Well, we're just doing the beach thing. I searched up a neat gift of Polynesian dancers to do a show for all of us, and then a Hawaiian woman to do the bridal dance, or whatever that's called, for Jim to see. I'd done my fair share of entertainment with my ex to keep the money coming in so I could spend my entire summer in Hawaii, so I knew that this dance was beautiful and romantic, to say the very least. Okay, I told you guys how I used to do the hula shows for that hotel, right? Yes! Avery's eyes brightened. Oh my god, you should do the dance. Have you done it before? Yeah, I have, I said with a laugh. It's the easiest thing to learn. So what if I teach you the moves and you dance the dance for your husband? You guys are going to get seriously wild in that room when you learn the dance and reveal that he's about to be a father again, all on the happiest day of his life. Ash laughed. Thank God he rented out that mansion place with the private beach for you two. I can't even imagine the screams and shrills of ecstasy. She trailed off while we all laughed together. What do you think? It's super easy, I said, hoping she'd take me up on my offer. I'll help you. Really, you have to do it. I can't dance worth a damn, Avery laughed. It's your dance for him. All he's going to see is your hips swaying seductively and your body calling to him. I smirked. Ave, Ash said. I think this is a badass idea. At least it adds to my value as your drop-in bridesmaid. You're most certainly not a drop-in, Avery insisted. In fact, here you are being super romantic, and I've meant to ask you for a different kind of favor. Since we've heard all about your adrenaline junkie adventures, I was hoping you could help me arrange a little payback for the groom and his groomsmen. Payback? I asked. It's all in good fun, Avery said with a smile. But Ash and I can't do jack shit because we're pregnant. Pretty impressive how you both pulled that off at the same time, by the way, I added. That certainly wasn't in the plan, Ash laughed. 
I was planning to give it another year before we tried again. It turns out that fate always has another idea when it comes to the two of us. Regardless, both brothers knocked their girls up at the same time, and both are completely oblivious. Well, I have to know why our future bride wants some form of revenge on her groom and the groomsmen, I said. The kayak thing yesterday? She tucked her bottom lip between her teeth. Oh, I laughed. The whole, this is boring as hell, and then the guys starting some battleship kayak war with the paddles? Jake and I were the first to get dunked and rolled thanks to Jake and Colin locking oars, Ash said. I have no idea how that didn't knock Colin and me out of the damn kayak, I answered with a laugh. But Colin managed to right the ship, all while we looked like insane adults around families who kayaked like normal people. We should have sat that trip out, Avery said. We barely survived Alex and Summer's assaults. She grinned mischievously. So I remember that you mentioned something about you kayaking on some rapids when you lived here on the big island. Is there any way you can get the guys over to where you lived and did stuff like that tomorrow? I think it would be a fun gift of payback. And if you do it, you have to record it. Isn't tomorrow their bachelor day? Ash laughed. What better way to celebrate that by kicking it off with a gift from us gals? Okay, I started. I've done some pretty crazy shit in my life and kayaking Wailuku River might be one of the craziest. There's Rainbow Falls, and we went over that while navigating through the rapids. I don't want to get the guys killed or anything. This is on the island of Hawaii, right? Ash asked. Yeah, that's where my ex lives now. He does the tours on that river. But I think Colin will kill me if you two want me to put them in their place in front of Koi. Colin prides himself on his confidence, Avery smirked, especially when it comes to you and him. Her eyebrow arched. I think the men deserve a fun kayaking adventure, don't you? Wait, what are we talking about? I heard Summer, Jim's former secretary and Alex's on-and-off girlfriend, say from behind my lounge chair. I wasn't the judgy type, but something seemed a bit off about Summer. The girl was insecure about her relationship with Alex. Even a person who wasn't trained in psychology, watching behaviors and mannerisms, could determine that. I mean, she was a knockout, but it was plain to see that Alex struggled to settle down with her. I would have dumped Alex's sorry ass by now if it were me. This girl was arm candy for him, and I wished that she had more self-worth to see that she should kick any man who treated her that way to the curb. Don't get me wrong, Alex was a great guy with a stellar personality, but some people were tougher to crack in the romance department. All I know is that if Colin were using my ass the way Alex seemed to be using Summer, there would be no Colin and Elena. What the hell did I know, though? Alex was wealthy, like the rest of these billionaires, and his looks added to all of that. Maybe she was the one who was using him. Elena's going to lead the guys out on a more adventurous kayaking trip tomorrow, Avery said with a smile. It's what they get for the kayak wars they pulled on all of us yesterday. You sure they'll be okay with that? Summer asked. If not, they can back out, I answered with a shrug and smile to her confused expression. Well, I planned to get a massage with Alex before the wedding, she said. If Alex wants to get a massage, then he doesn't have to go, Avery answered with a smile, but I could tell Summer's tone annoyed her. Well, I need some sun. They all look so happy out there, Summer said eyeing the men with the kids on their surfboards. Yeah, ten minutes says sunblock needs to be reapplied on these kids, or my dad and Carmen are going to hate us when they babysit, Ash said. So what do you say? Avery asked me. I know Jim will love this. It's the best gift I can think to give him and the guys. So long as you let me sneak in a few dance lessons, and you dance for your husband on your wedding night. It's a deal, Avery smiled.
to be reapplied on these kids, or my dad and Carmen are going to hate us when they babysit, Ash said. So what do you say? Avery asked me. I know Jim will love this. It's the best gift I can think to give him and the guys. So long as you let me sneak in a few dance lessons, and you dance for your husband on your wedding night. It's a deal. Avery smiled. That evening, we all sat around an open fire pit that had been arranged for the wedding party, most likely because Jim had some nice cash on hand to ensure everything was perfect for his bride's big day that was only two days away. So, Colin said, his arm around me while he lazily stretched his long legs out toward where the group sat all around us. What are you ladies going to do while we boys go and show Jim what he's going to miss after he's married? I nudged Colin in his side while Jim laughed, his emerald eyes vibrant while he held Addison. The fun and wild little spark of bouncing energy had just fallen asleep on Jim in the cutest way. She was halfway through telling all of us about singing in her Christmas program when she leaned back into Jim's chest, turned her head to the side, and fell asleep mid-sentence. Avery laughed as she brushed Addie's hair out of her face so Jim could readjust her to a more comfortable position to sleep, and then Avery leaned into her man's side. I'd spent the afternoon teaching Avery the beautiful moves of the song she'd dance for Jim on their wedding day, and I will say, the girl could move her hips. Even Ash played along. But Summer? God help that poor, miserable soul. Sadly, I didn't think Summer wanted to be here at all. I didn't have enough information to make an informed estimation of her situation, but things were not running smoothly. That much was blatantly obvious. I watched as she tried to talk business with Jim, saying anything she subtly could to convince her former boss to rehire her, but that was not happening. Every time she spoke to him, Jim's face became stone cold. It was just plain awkward and the poor girl continued to make things uncomfortable for herself more and more. Even now, while Alex and Jake were in some silly conversation, she sat stiffly by Alex's side when it was apparent that he'd given up on enjoying her company an hour ago. Mommy, I want Uncle Carl, John grumbled, fighting off falling asleep. John, I'll take you back to the room and you'll go to bed there, Ash said sternly while Jake turned to try and pull his grumpy son into his arms. Get over here, stooge, Colin said, sitting up on the outdoor sofa he and I shared across the fire. I smiled when John was turned loose, glared at his parents, and then walked over to where Colin's arms were stretched out. Why are you such a little monster tonight? Colin asked, bringing John into his arms. John melted against Colin's chest, and I chuckled when he laid his head on Colin's shoulder, and Colin leaned back casually. John smiled at me, and I ran my finger over his little nose. Are you fighting off Mr. Sandman? I asked. His heavy lids opened and closed slowly. No, he wrinkled his nose. Yeah, you are, Colin said, crossing his legs out in front of him and relaxing back, shifting John into his left arm, and draping his right arm around me again. And you're going to win that fight, aren't you? Mr. Sandman doesn't stand a chance against that boy, Jake said with a laugh. You still want to play with your papa and Tita? Colin asked, referring to Ash's dad and stepmom, who had gone to a hotel in Maui for the night, enjoying the night off from the kids, the adult ones and the toddlers. I heard they want to take you to the zoo to pet the dolphins, Avery said with a smile. Addie fell asleep so that tomorrow would come faster for her to go. You hear that, champ? Colin asked. Then he lowered his voice when John grumbled something, so exhausted that no one could discern his response. Just act like you're asleep, bud. Uncle Colin won't tell anyone. Jake rolled his eyes. Fake sleep? He looked at Ash. I'll take him up if no one's taking this boy. Colin interjected with a smile. He's perfectly comfortable. Now, what the heck were we talking about? Summer? Colin said, and I shook my head, knowing Colin was antagonizing the miserable woman. Huh? She said, pulling her face from her phone. I have no idea. She glared at Alex as if it were his fault that she had to sit out here with all of us, 
even though we'd all tried plenty of times to include her. Her misery was self-induced. We were talking about the plan Avery has for the four of you tomorrow, I said, saving Summer and Alex the trouble of Colin poking at her. Remember I told you that I lived here? Yeah, with that goldfish dude. He smirked at me. Coy, I played back with a smile. Stop calling him that. He's actually going to help Avery by doing this for all of you. I'll be there too. I arched an eyebrow at him. To video, I added with wide eyes. Colin chuckled. This sounds like more of a scheme with ex-boyfriends than a gift. He looked over at Avery. What are you ladies up to? And is this the reason you three took off today after lunch? Part of it, Avery answered. It's an awesome plan. She looked at Jim's questioning expression. We need you to get a hold of your luxury helicopter company or rent a helicopter to get to the big island. She smiled back at me while Alex and Jake's eyes darted around the group. You four turned our peaceful kayak tour into some water war because you were bored. Ash teased Jake's curious expression. So, Ave arranged for Elena's friend to give you a more advanced and exciting kayak tour. Colin shifted some to look at me. So, is this coy friend of yours going to show us what's up when it comes to kayaking? Trust me, us four have done some crazy advanced shit while riding rivers in kayaks. That's why I'm Avery's designated videotaking bridesmaid. I teased him. Hell yes, Avery said. Thanks again for helping me out by asking Elena to be in my wedding. God, Alex said, rubbing his forehead. You all know we're getting our asses kicked by a local tomorrow, right? You're not going to that. Summer snapped out of her phone and eyed Alex. We're getting massages. She batted her eyes at him while I felt Colin silently laughing at my side. We're getting massages? Alex repeated, looking at her as if she'd lost her mind. No shit, Colin said while Jim eyed his former secretary as if she'd been smoking crack. Jake was pinching his lips and fighting back a laugh when his eyes met Colin's after my man decided to poke this bear again. Couples massages? You and Alex are pretty heavy these days. I don't even think Jim and Avery have opted in for the romance massage package this week. Alex exhaled, and the sharp features of his handsome face hardened. I don't recall us planning anything aside from me being here to support my best friend before his wedding. I hate to disappoint, but I didn't plan on that. You said we'd enjoy our stay here. She snapped like a spoiled brat. I think we can talk about it later, Alex said. Summer rose and glared down at Alex. This was our final chance. If you want this to work, you'll stop putting me last all the time. Holy shit. Colin muttered to where I could only hear, as Alex stood. I eyed everyone's response, trying not to be appalled at the scene that was unfolding before all of us. Jim was stoic. Avery and Ash both looked more than a little surprised, and it appeared that Jake and Colin found it somewhat amusing. Jesus, Summer, Jim finally said. If you take issue with Alex being part of my wedding and doing things with his best friend, you might want to rethink a relationship with the man in the first place. I warned you about my best friend a long time ago, and you never listened. I'm sorry, Jim, she said pathetically. I don't want to ruin the wedding, but I just don't understand why Alex treats me like this. Jim's eyes grew dark, and I was starting to wonder why the man ever trusted the woman as his former personal secretary, given her maturity level. You're acting like Jim's a goddamn therapist. This is between you and me. Let's get out of here before you embarrass yourself more than you already have. Alex snapped. She folded her arms in protest of Alex's words. I couldn't believe I was watching a 20-something-year-old act like this. I would estimate that a person would have to possess at least an ounce of shame to avoid this exact scenario. And Summer was making it clear that she had none. No shame whatsoever. This is damn fine entertainment. She was your fucking secretary? Jake said to Jim with a laugh after Jake's laughter caused the woman to storm off, with Alex following reluctantly behind. She morphed into that after Alex crushed her the first time. She quit, and then I really don't know what the hell happened to her.
She's acting like a bridezilla, Colin laughed. Poor Alex, man. He put himself back in this position, Jake added. Good God, sex with that woman better be worth it. Ash nudged Jake in his side. Really? She said flatly. It's the reason the man is with her, Colin added. Good Lord, I said, looking at Colin. Thankful Addie and John were snoring to show us they were sleeping through the guy talk about Alex and Summer's dire situation. Let's get back on topic. I'm fairly certain Alex won't be having a couple's massage tomorrow, and that he'll get to work out all of his frustration while going over Rainbow Falls on our kayak run tomorrow. And poor Ave and Ash are stuck back here with Bridezilla. No thanks to Alex, Colin returned. Perhaps we all sit out this wild idea. You afraid? Avery asked, the group instantly refocusing and falling into casual conversation again. Is the bride of my best friend challenging us? Colin shot back. I know she is. Jim smirked. Well, this should be highly entertaining. Jake laughed. Wow, Jim, thanks to our fucking around in the kayaks yesterday, your bride has us riding the white in some kayaks while an ex-boyfriend helps. Jake eyed me. Guide the way. Yeah, we're so fucked, Colin said. I'll be going too, dumbass, I said with a laugh. Videoing, Jim added while the girls laughed. Perhaps next time we all don't act like we're teenagers with the ladies. It'll be fun, Avery smiled at Jim. Do you think you can get the chopper? That's going to be a tough one. They're set to bring back Ash's parents tomorrow. He leaned over and kissed her nose. It looks like your little scheming won't happen now. Bullshit. You own the company, Ash said. Call them because Coy said he's got all of you prepped to go on an advanced course at eight in the morning. Colin took the beer he'd been nursing and sipped it, then looked at me. All right, he eyed me. We're down for this. And don't think for a second that if this backfires on us, we won't pay you back, Jake added. It's all in good fun. Are you boys afraid of an adrenaline high? I used to race down this river and ride the line all the time, I said. So long as Elena believes we'll survive my future wife's gift for all of us, then I'll call the pilot and arrange for a helicopter to bring us to the big island. He leaned over and kissed Avery. Thank you, he said, then whispered something in her ear that made her laugh and blush all at once. Well then, Colin eyed me. I hope this coy guy can handle the fact that I'm pretty damn good looking, and he sighed dramatically. I, the man you proposed to spend the rest of your life with, will most likely kick his ass while kayaking in his local river tomorrow. Getting a little jealous? Ash teased. This really will be entertaining, Jake chuckled. And why aren't you and Avery joining us? If you didn't notice in your guy's stupid little kayak water war yesterday, Avery and I were barely figuring out how to paddle on calm water, Ash said. Elena's the one who's done this before, and we want it on video, so that's why she's going. That, and she knows a local who can make such an exciting kayaking tour happen. Aren't we so lucky, Colin said. God, sometimes I'm more afraid of these women planning shit with ex-boyfriends behind our backs than I am you and your pranks, Jake. Nothing to worry about, I said. We'll have killer footage for everyone to enjoy after we get back. Careful. Jim added, if it looks like it's too much fun, then Addie might want to try it too. Nice try, Avery said, then started laughing. You guys are terrified, aren't you? It's easy to see we pissed off you beautiful ladies, Colin assured us with a smile. We know how this story ends, Ave. The story ends when we reach the end of the 28-mile run of thrills, navigation, and excitement. Awesome. Jake said. Now, all eyes were on me, but I didn't care. These guys were a blast. And so long as Koi made sure they were advanced enough through questioning them and giving a quick crash course on safety, I knew they'd love it. They seemed to be aching to do something wild. And Avery coming up with this idea was perfect. Hopefully, Alex and Summer...